We will be beginning our inaugural session shortly. Our esteemed guests have arrived. I request all our participants to kindly applaud when they arrive. Testing, mic testing. It is with great pleasure and honor that I extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you to the inaugural function of Quisitio, the International Conference on Sustainable Development for a Better Future, hosted by St. Stephen's College, Uruguay. As we gather here today, we embark on a journey towards exploring innovative solutions and fostering meaningful dialogue on sustainable development. This conference serves as a platform for scholars, practitioners, and stakeholders from around the globe to exchange ideas, share insights, and collaborate towards building a more sustainable future for generations to come. Let us begin today's auspicious event by seeking the praise of the Almighty to be our hope, light, strength, and comfort. I would like to call upon Ms. Ligia Moltangachin, Head of the Department of English, for the prayer song, and I request all the participants to kindly rise from their seats. Pularil virim sumam Sandhil purim drudam Shrinigamingilumanupamam Aragilavayurukidam Paramatnana me deva me Kaivanangi nami punya Pularil Sumam Sandhil Kurium Drudam Shrinigamingilumanopam Aragilavayurukidam Paramatnana me deva me Kaivanangi Nami Punya. Thank you. It is with extreme privilege that I welcome Dr. Casey Thomas, the Vice Principal of St. Stephen's College, as well as the coordinator of today's international conference, whose unwavering commitment has laid the foundation for this remarkable gathering. Sir, I invite you to welcome the gathering. Good morning to each and everyone. Respected President of the session, Dr. Stephen Matthew, the Principal of the College, Honorable Chief Guest, Sri Shamchand IFS, 
protector of immigrants ministry of external affairs respected keynote speaker professor dr mohammad hatha from kochin university of science and technology our dear barsar aran father jins delicatel research cell convener dr jisha george other invited speakers faculty and research scholars from other institutions my dear colleagues and my dear students it's a great honor for me to extend a warm welcome to each and every one to this qsisio 24 the international conference on the sustainable development for a better future being conducted under the auspices of the research cell and the iqac in association with the mahatma gandhi university kottayam these days the term sustainability and sustainable development is being popularly used discussions on the conflict between man and nature climate change energy crisis food insecurity etc are growing everywhere as a father as the father of our nation says earth provides enough for uh, each one but not every one every man's uh, every man's need but not any man's greed the selfish behavior of each one of us actually led to the present depletion and pollution of the environment as lord buddha said desire is the root cause of all evils these indian philosophies actually underline the exact meaning of sustainable development meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising with the needs of the future the term sustainable development was first used in the britland commission's report our common future in 1968 the term tragedy of commons was first used by garrett hardin in a science magazine which warned the reckless use of environment that leads to uh, depletion and pollution the 1972 united nations conference on human development in stockholm was first the first world conference to mark the environment as a major concern thereafter a number of international conferences and earth summits were held under the auspices of un like rio earth summit cancun conference kyoto protocol copenhagen conference paris treaty and the recent cop 28 un climate change conference in dubai ua the 2030 agenda for sustainable development with its 17 sdgs adopted by un member states in 2015 emphasized a holistic progress in this context qsisio 24 gathers scholars researchers and practitioners to explore innovative solutions for sustainability it fosters interdisciplinary dialogues and collaborations towards a more equitable world now it's a great opportunity for me to welcome the distinguished academics gathered here first let me welcome the honorable president of the meeting dr stephen matthew to this inaugural function welcome sir it's time to welcome our chief guest sri shamchand if he is an officer of the 2015 batch indian foreign service presently acting as protector of emigrants in trivandrum sir we are pleased to have your presence on this occasion as the conference addresses an issue which has an inter uh, which has a international dimension moreover your presence motivates the young minds gathered here to strive for the prestigious indian civil service on behalf of the participants of the conference and the organizing committee i extend our heartfelt welcome to you sir now we have another eminent scholar among us professor dr mohammad hatha who will be delivering the keynote address on this occasion he is an academician who received the fulbright scholarship and serving a number of posts as professor and head of the department of marine biology microbiology and biochemistry director school of marine sciences and director of center for polar sciences at qsat dear sir your expertise in the field of environment and sustainability will enrich our knowledge and inquisitiveness on behalf of the participants and organizing committee i extend a warm welcome to you sir
Now, we have a vibrant and young motivating personality among us. None other than our dear Bursa, Reverend Father Jins Nellikatil. He is always with us, who proved his dedication and love towards this institution since 2020. I welcome dear Father to this function. The conference is conducted under the auspicious banner of the research cell of the college, which is convened by Dr. Jisha George. She has been working day and night for the successful completion of this conference. On behalf of the participants, I welcome you, dear Dr. Jisha. Now we have eminent invited speakers from various parts of the world. I extend a warm welcome to you all to this conference. We have scholars and faculty members from various institutions, including St. Stephen's College. I welcome you all to this function. <laughs> Last, but not the least, the student community, who can question today and shape tomorrow, will be the most beneficial community from this conference. We are organizing this program mainly focusing on the student community so I extend a warm welcome to these young minds. May the next two days be filled with fruitful discussions, insightful exchanges, and thought-provoking insights. Let us strive for a better future, wishing everyone productive and enriching days ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casey Thomas, uh, for your warm welcome. Now, it is my pleasure to invite Father Jins Nellikatil, the esteemed buser of our college, whose tireless efforts have supported and motivated St. Stephen's College to reach new heights. Let me welcome you, Father, to share the introductory remarks. Respected Chair of the Section, our dear Principal, Dr. Stephen Matthew, our distinguished Chief Guest, Sri Shamchan C. IFS, Dr. Professor Muhammad Hatta, dear teachers and my dear friends, a very good morning to all. It is both an honor and privilege to stand before you today to address the vital topic of sustainable development for a better future. In a world facing unprecedented environmental challenges and socio-economic disparities, the concept of sustainable development has emerged as a beacon of hope and a pathway towards a future where prosperity is not at the expense of our planet or its people. Sustainable development at its core embodies the harmonious integration of environmental preservation, social equity, and economic progress. It recognizes the interconnectedness of these pillars and acknowledges that true progress cannot be achieved without addressing each aspect holistically. The imperative of sustainable development is clear. Our planet is under immense strain, facing threats such as climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and resource depletion. Concurrently, millions around the globe continue to grapple with poverty, hunger, inequality, and lack of access to necessities such as clean water, education, and health care. Yet, Amidst these challenges lie opportunities for transformation and renewal. Sustainable development offers a roadmap, a roadmap that champions innovation, collaboration, and collective action. It calls upon us to rethink our relationship with nature, to embrace more equitable economic models, and to prioritize the well-being of both present and future generation. We have seen glimpses of progress, communities transitioning to renewable energy sources, business adopting circular economic principles, governments implementing policies to protect ecosystem 
and promote social inclusion. But we cannot afford complacency. The urgency of the moment demands that we accelerate our efforts and scale up solutions. As we gather here today, let us recommit ourselves to the pursuit of sustainable development. Let us be catalysts for change in our communities, workplaces, and beyond. Let us seize this opportunity to shape a future where prosperity is truly sustainable, where every individual has the opportunity to thrive, and where our planet flourishes for generations to come. Together, we have the power to create a better world, one built on the principles of sustainability, equity, and resilience. Let us embark on this journey with determination, compassion, and shared vision for a brighter tomorrow. Nani introductory speech, Avasana Pig and the Mumba Dandi Garden Road Suji Pigua. Number sustainability, which some Sadikimbo, Namada Manasa Lepurum were another Pragurdim Pragurdi Sambrachan Okean. Urigarin Pertega Mai to the Mada Manasula Kanam Manishine Marano Gondola, Pragurdi Sambrachanathanum Yadu to Prasakil. Meaning on the Rathri, Pala Townicode, Nali Katu Vandigal Erangiodi. Pala im Uruvur in the Miller. Man is the crown of the creation. Srishti yuda magudam manishina. Manishine marandagundolla. Yadaru sustainability kim better future nundu namuka parayana ito patilla. Adavund manishine sender aki kondolla or sustainable development in avanam. Governmentum. Academic level lola. Policiesum. Patanangalum. Okka nadakandal. Tandamathe regarium. Number two value crisis migration. Value the crisis on a migration under Valia Nata Namukondirum, the barter system iron, the Kudukal Wangal Samvidanam, a migration at Ondirum Karanam, Namuda youth in a Namuda Videsha Rajing like Kudukumbo, our Rajing like an Allah ideas, innovative idol ideas a good to know, Nere Tiriche, Kerala Tene, Bharda Tene. Uru Sampatiga Shroda Suru financial source iron number migration. Uru barter system, Uru Kudikal Wangal, ideas of Kudukumbo, or financial support background, Namakutan on diron. Inate migration of Allah Kudikal Matra white Maririkuya Wangalilla Pogunavarum, Tirishuvarinilla. A rendu valley a crisis, Namla Kerala Samoham narrative under Rikinan. Priapeta. Shamchant, IFS in the present sila, here under guarding alum, Tirchi item, Adurubad, Vilapata guarding alan, immigration department illa, but each foreign affairs, Kaigaran Chiena, Urunado Diogos and Namada Gode or Lapa. Namada Nard and Eden, a tomb value of crisis item, e migration maricund Rikuyan. Upon Adanuru, Uru, Uru, Uru solution, and then you look at practical solutions of Gudakan, Namada International Conference, Tarana Maya, Urubad, Prayojanapadu. Terci item, nama de Sri Shamchand IFS, atau boleh Kusad University nolla Sri Dr Professor Muhammad Hatta, berdua dua berdua ini perasan sini, anggih item, senosha tode, abhimana tode, orang kuno, adine ador lopna nene, ini international conference sini, wajibnya nai itu perwarti cya, perayaan cium deh dikenna, nama de research selim, ini de coordination committee kip, tuh mana berdua principal de, ni duduk dulu, Thomas Casey sah de coordinator ayik onde. Jishamis Research Hill in Dayum, Thomas Matthews Arum Bindumisum, within the coordination joint coordinator site, Valara Valley of Hurtan, within the Tundi Gune, the remainder than the Penil Athwanigana, Elavare, Etum, Atmathamai, Athwanichu, Abhinun the Chunda, Nalla, or academic revolution, or academic Viplavam, here under the Vasute International Conference Road, Nadagata and Asham Situnda, Nartunu. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jens, for sharing your thoughts and perceptions. Next, I would like to extend an invitation to Dr. Stephen Matthew, our college principal and president of this conference, for the presidential address.
most respected chief guest sri shyamchand cifs dr professor mohammad khata our bersar reverend father jins nellikattil various dignitaries in the dais dear colleagues and the participants a warm good morning to one one and all <clears throat> allow me to commence this address with a profound quotation that encapsulated the essence of our gathering today research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought these words by albert saint georgioi echo the fundamental ethos of our pursuit here at the international conference cusegio 24 as we convene for this interdisciplinary seminar brimming with invited talks from esteemed personalities and the engaging paper presentations we embark on a journey to push the boundaries of knowledge to delve into uncharted territories of inquiry and to foster collaboration across diverse fields research in its essence knows no boundaries it is not confined to the realms of a single discipline but flourishes at the intersection of various fields of study it is the interdisciplinary approach that propels innovations sparks creativity and unravel solutions to the most complex challenges of our time in an era where global issues demand multifaceted solutions the significance of interdisciplinary research cannot be overstated it is through this synthesis of diverse perspectives that we unearth novel insights and pave the way for progress as we gather here at our esteemed institution st stephen's college odavur let us take a moment to reflect in its rich legacy established in 1964 our college has been a beacon of academic excellence nurturing generations of scholars and visionaries from its humble beginning st stephen's college has been recognized for its efficiency by the nac with an a plus grade with a cgp of 3.39 this accolade is a testament to the unwavering commitment of our college faculty staff and students towards advancing knowledge and fostering academic excellence ever since this institution is striving to evolve into a hub of intellectual inquiry with a research at its core i feel immensely honored to welcome and to put on record our gratitude to our esteemed resource persons notably shyamchand c ifs the protector of immigration who will inaugurate this academic endeavor and dr mohammad khata the head of department in marine biology at ecosat who will deliver the keynote address mr chance illustrious career and expertise in his field serve as an inspiration to us all his insight into the complexities of immigration and the border security are invaluable as we navigate the global landscape dr hatha's ground breaking research in marine biology underscores the importance of preserving our oceans and marine ecosystems His address promises to enlighten and inspire us to safeguard our natural resources for future generations. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the management, the Arc Park of Kottayam, and our dedicated Barsa Reverend Father Jens Nellikattil for their unwavering support and commitment to our institution's progress, and also our coordinator, Dr. Thomas Casey. and join coordinators it is through their vision and leadership that we continue to thrive and excel i must also commend our faculty and staff for their tireless efforts in guiding 
and uh, mentoring our students. Their dedication to academic excellence ensures that our students receive the best possible education and are equipped to make meaningful contributions to society. And to our students, I upload your achievements and your unwavering dedication to academic excellence. You are the pride of our college and I have no doubt that you will continue to excel in your chosen fields and make us proud. As we embark on this two-day journey of knowledge exchange and collaboration, let us remember that our collective efforts have the power to shape the future of humanity. May this conference serve as the catalyst for progress and development and may all the participants find fulfillment in their endeavors. I extend my best wishes to all the participants for a fruitful and enriching experience. May your presentations be effective, your discussions insightful and your contributions invaluable. In the words of Mahatma Gandhi, the future depends on what you do today. As we conclude this gathering, let us remember that the seeds of progress we plant today will blossom into a brighter future for generations to come. With a dedication, collaboration and a commitment to excellence, we can chart a course towards a world enriched by knowledge and understanding. May the insights gained and the connections forged during this conference propel us towards a future where innovation knows no bounds and where the pursuit of truth reigns supreme. Together, let us strive towards a future where knowledge knows no bounds and where our collective pursuit of truth leads to the brighter tomorrow. Thank you all and may our collective endeavors lead us to new horizons of discovery and growth. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, sir. John Quincy Adams, the sixth US president once said, if your action inspires others to dream more, learn more and do more and become more, you're a leader. In that regard, it is our absolute honor to have among us today a true leader of our generation. We have Sri Shamchand CIFS, Protector of Emigrants, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India today as our chief guest. To introduce our honorable guest, let me welcome Dr. Navita Elizabeth Jose of the Department of English. A very good morning to one and all. It is with great honor and privilege that I introduce our esteemed chief guest for the inaugural session of this international conference, Sri Shyam Chansi IFS. Wished career diplomat, he embodies the ideals of service, integrity, and commitment to excellence. He embarked on his journey in the Indian Foreign Service in 2015. And since then, he has left an indelible mark on every assignment he undertook. His dedication to his duties was evident from his initial postings where he served in himself in the vibrant culture of Egypt. His subsequent posting in Italy saw him at the fore. Hailing from Kochi, his journey to excellence began with his education at various schools in his hometown. His academic prowess led him to pursue a degree in engineering from the esteemed Government College of Engineering Trivandrum, followed by an MBA from IIFM Bhopal. Before joining the Indian Foreign Service, he honed his skills in the banking and insurance sectors, demonstrating his versatile genius and adaptability in his career path. In his current role as the protector of emigrants, he shoulders the immense responsibility of safeguarding the rights and dignity of emigrants from Kerala. 
His authority under the Immigration Act empowers him to ensure compliance and enforce regulations, thereby ensuring the well-being of migrant Furthermore, he oversees the granting of immigration clearance and licenses for overseas employment recruitment agencies, playing a pivotal role in facilitating safe and ethical migration. Beyond his professional achievements, he finds solace and support in his family with his wife, Dr. Sheetal G. Nair, a senior doctor at Kim's Hospital, Trivandrum, and their loving son. As we gather here today, we are privileged, sir, to have you grace us with your presence. Your exemplary career and unwavering commitment to service serves as an inspiration to us all, sir. Dear audience, join me in extending a very warm welcome to our dear guest, Sri Sham Chan C. IFS, as we embark on this journey of knowledge and collaboration. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Respected Principal Dr. Stephen Matthew, esteemed Reverend Father James Nelikatil, Coordinator Dr. Thomas Casey, Distinguished Guest Dr. Professor Mohammad Hada, Convener Dr. Jisha George, dear teachers, students, and other dignitaries who are present here and also who are joined through online for this program. <coughs> First of all, I would like to thank the management of St. Stephen's College for inviting me as the chief guest for this wonderful occasion. So before I talk something about the sustainable development, let me speak something about the road. So this place has a special place in the hearts of Indian diplomats and Indian diplomacy. It's none other than Dr. K. R. Narayan's birthplace, former diplomat, one of the best diplomats, and the Honorable President of India. So, thanks to Father Jins for inviting me to the legendary son's place. It's a honor for me to be here with all of you. Now, coming to the, the session, Kweshio 2024. I asked Father why you have chosen this topic. So he told me that it is like linking all the disciplines. Yeah. <laughs> so sustainable development. Like it has a multi-dimensional approach, multidisciplinary approach. So let us begin. Now I actually want this to be a I don't want this to be a monotonous, like interactive session. So since I assume that there is no non-Malayalis here. I will be switching over to Malayalam because many often people ask me with my name, Sir Malayali Ano. 
So in order to avoid that, I will be switching between these things. Sustainable development day, Malayala Wakanda. Very good. So I just take this thing. Why this topic is important for you? Chumma faculty is one topic. You have to do this with your faculty. 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 So, I am not going to talk about sustainable development. I mean, I am not going to talk about it. There are many brilliant academics guys who are coming after me to give a lecture on these things. So I will tell you what. What is government going doing for sustainable development? What we have to do as a society and how it is going to impact our lives. That is the most important thing we should know. What is the need for that? It's the social justice for the future generation. Namada Havi Talamuraki Vendi, Ola Uru, Uru Vision Gudiana, sustainable development. Pasha, there are some pros and cons for these things. Namada sustainable development chamber, the name, we should also take into consideration what factors guide us. Namada Rajitan requirement and the how is that going to impact you and the people outside this auditorium? Well, it's a multi-faced implications in the Parayangarnam. This is environment, human health, environment health, human health, climate change. Now, we are affected by temperature. We are witnessing a sudden surge in temperature in Kerala. It's because the climate pattern is changing. Why? We are emitting more greenhouse gases. And because of that, global warming and related things are affecting us. So, in our context, this topic is very important for us. And academic-wise also. One of the streams of courses, you take like science, economics, law, everything has some kind of application for this sustainable development. Also, diplomacy. So, I will be talking about what how diplomacy and sustainable levels are linked at the last part. <clears throat> so, why we have to take sustainable development as a serious thing? Before that, you should understand the requirement of our country. We are soon going to become the third largest economy in the planet. Currently, we are the fifth largest economy by nominal GDP. By 2027, we are estimated to become the third largest economy, only behind United States and China. So we have to grow and we have to grow sustainably. That's the difference. We have to grow. That is the main thing. Uh, we need to create jobs. Jobs create, you have to invest the industry's manufacturing sector. Industries of manufacturing in Vernongi, you need to have more energy. So, power one. Power on the gil matrame, you have more manufacturing sectors. You know that Namada Kulam Alkar farming sectors around India total population. If you want to become a developed country, you have to push these people out of that sector towards the manufacturing or service. Usually, with developed economy profile, they start from the agriculture sector, they move towards the manufacturing sector, finally they end up in service. But in their context, I mean, I mean, like from the agriculture, we shifted towards the IT. So that's directly to the service. But I don't know, only highly educated people will be getting employment for the IT sectors. Factory workers, like diplomas, like plus two, they are not getting any qualified or regular income stream jobs. We should be pushing for more manufacturing. 
So manufacturing jobs were no longer. You need to have more energy, infrastructure, and other related uh, <coughs> facilities. Energy is the most important thing. You take China, like 1979, where it was one of the poorest countries on the planet. Now it's the second largest economy on earth. How come? Because it shifted from the agrarian sector to the manufacturing sector. They opened up their economy. So as they opened up the economy, companies started pouring in. Foreign direct investments came. It became the manufacturing hub. Al chumma companies of another la. How they came? They regulated their sectors. I mean, government controlled at the time. Like what did in 1991? Abam Indo Prashan Vatiya. For that, they need more energy. Abam they started constructing thermal power plants, gas guzzling. Stations and everything, coal imported into them. Angane, so of course they prosper. Pashe, they were not following the sustainable development path. Our ah energy demand to any they started using more and more uh, coal fueled power stations, gas thermal stations. So what happened? In effect, China is now the largest polluter on the earth. Upon You need to ask this question. Ningada jenengale prosperity ano nengka avisham, ado environment ka concerno. This is what all politicians, bureaucrats, diplomats brains like stuck there. Like, what should we do? There should be an equilibrium system. Ningala, we should have that. Like, we need development. But we also need to take care of the environment. So, that is our sustainable path. Namak ko wonder na. Abo, otherwise you will have an effect. If climate change um baaki orla da ko irunda na enda baaga. So, idine pal issues wonder. Karam varna if we don't develop also, namle pa sustainability maathar kongi irunda thun gari ila. Because our is a poor country. Like nooti naapa the gori jenengal wonder. We don't have enough jobs for these guys. Migration, just like father mentioned. Why? Because you have jobs, but not for meeting the requirement of the youngsters like you people who are here. Upon otherwise, normal grow chedilingi and the question is, there is a term called middle income trap in economics. Countries like Brazil, they were developing at a much faster pace, and Philippines and other countries. അവർ ഒരു സമയത്ത് ആ ഡെവലപ്മെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഹേസ് ജസ്റ്റ് സ്റ്റക്ക് ആയപ്പോഴത്തേക്ക് ദേ കുഡിൻ ബിക്കം ദാറ്റ് ഡെവലപ് ആ ഡെവലപ്പിംഗ് ഇന്ന് ഡെവലപ്മെന്റോട്ടുള്ള ട്രാൻസിഷൻ ദാറ്റ്സ് ഒരു ടൈം കൺസ്യൂമിംഗ് മാത്രമല്ല ഇറ്റ്സ് എനർജി ഇൻറ്റൻസീവ് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ടേക്സ് ലോട്ട്സ് ഓഫ് എഫേർട്ട് അപ്പം ആ ഡെവലപ് കൺട്രീസിൻ്റെ ആ നിങ്ങളുടെ ആ ഡെമോഗ്രാഫി ഡിവിഡൻറ്റ് ഇപ്പം നമ്മുടെ രാജ്യത്തിൻ്റെ ഏറ്റവും വലിയ പൊട്ടൻഷ്യൽ എന്ന ഡെമോഗ്രാഫി ഡിവിഡൻ്റ് യു ഹാവ് വർക്കിംഗ് ഏജ് പോപ്പുലേഷൻ you can use them like for manufacturing service at the it science technology everything okay. aged economy la avumbedeku they have some limitations appo india la cheyina prashna nanna ipo la generation like medium age if you take it is like around 28 29 something like for india china la avumbedeku it's like 30s baaki ella countries la is like 40s and 50s like for late 30s thottu varum നമ്മുടെ ലക്ഷ്യം എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ ബിഫോർ അവർ സൊസൈറ്റി ഗെറ്റ് ഏജ്ഡ് വി ഹാവ് ടു ബിക്കം എ ഡെവലപ്ഡ് കൺട്രി അതർവൈസ് വിൽ ബി സ്റ്റക്ക് ഇൻ ദി മിഡിൽ ഇൻകം ട്രാപ്പ് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് ദി ഇഷ്യൂ അപ്പം അതുകൊണ്ട് വി ഹാവ് ടു ഗ്രോ സോ ദ മോഡൽ വിച്ച് വി ആർ ഫോക്കസിംഗ് നൗ ഏസ് ഡേസ് ഈസ് ഗ്രീൻ എക്കോണമി ലൈക്ക് ലോ കാർബൺ എമിഷൻ യൂസ് ഓഫ് ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾ യൂസ് റീസൈക്കിൾ മെറ്റീരിയൽസ് നൗ നോട്ട് യൂസിംഗ് ഓർ ലിമിറ്റിംഗ് ദ യൂസ് ഓഫ് പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക്സ് നിങ്ങൾക്കറിയാം ഇപ്പം ഒരു ട്രെൻഡ് ആയിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുകയാണ് ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾസ് ടെസ്ല എത്ര പേര് കേട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് ടെസ്ല ടെസ്ലയെ കുറിച്ച് ഓക്കെ ഹൂ ഈസ് ദ സി ഓഫ് ടെസ്ല ഓക്കെ സോ ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ഇന്നോവേറ്റീവ് ഐഡിയാസ് ഒരു ഐഡിയയിൽ കൂടെ കൊണ്ടുവന്ന ഒരു കമ്പനിയാണ് ദിസ് തിങ്സ് ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾസ് കൊണ്ട് മാത്രം നമുക്ക് പൊല്യൂഷൻ നിർത്താൻ പറ്റില്ല വൈ ബിക്കോസ് ടു റൺ ദാറ്റ് കാർ യു നീഡ് ഇലക്ട്രിസിറ്റി it is equally important to know how that electricity is generated ningal or coal fired or thermal station la electricity use cheyidu run cheyidu kenya it spoils the 
ഇംപ്ലിക്കേഷൻ നിങ്ങളുടെ ആ ഒരു എന്തിനു വേണ്ടിയാണ് നിങ്ങൾ ഉദ്ദേശിച്ചത് ആ കാര്യത്തിൽ എത്തത്തില്ല സോ വി ഹാവ് ടു ഫോക്കസ് എ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് വി നീഡ് എനർജി ആ എനർജി എങ്ങനെ ആയിരിക്കും സോളാർ പവർ റിന്യൂബിൾ സോഴ്സസ് അതിൽ നിന്ന് കിട്ടുന്ന അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഗ്രീൻ ഹൈഡ്രജൻ ഇതിൽ നിന്ന് യൂസ് ചെയ്തിട്ട് വേണമെന്നുള്ള എനർജി വെച്ചിട്ട് വേണം നമുക്ക് നെക്സ്റ്റ് ഒരു ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയൽ റവല്യൂഷൻ ആപ്പൻ ചെയ്യണം ആൻഡ് ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞു ഈ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് ഒരു പ്രശ്നം എന്താ പറഞ്ഞാൽ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഫോർ എസ്പെഷ്യലി ഫോർ ഇന്ത്യ നമുക്ക് അങ്ങനെ ഫുള്ളി സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ആയിട്ട് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുമോ ഈസ് ദർ ഇൻ സം റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻസ് ഓൺ ഇന്ത്യ ഫോർ ഡൂയിങ് ദോസ് തിങ്സ് നമ്മുടെ ഇഷ്യൂസ് എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ വി ആർ എ ഗ്രോയിങ് എക്കോണമി ആൻഡ് ഫോർ ഗ്രോയിങ് വി നീഡ് എനർജി നമുക്ക് ഓയിൽ ഇല്ല ഗ്യാസ് ഇല്ല വി ആർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടിങ് ദീസ് തിങ്സ് ഓൺലി വി ഹാവ് ദീസ് പൊലൂട്ടിങ് കോൾ സോ കോൾ ഈസ് എ പൊലൂട്ടിങ് ഫ്യൂവൽ ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൾസോ എമിൻസ് ഗ്രീൻ ഹൗസ് ഗ്യാസസ് ആൻഡ് ഓൾ ദോസ് തിങ്സ് അപ്പോൾ ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് എൻ ഇഷ്യൂ വി ആർ എ എനർജി ഇമ്പോർട്ടിങ് കൺട്രി അതിൻ ഒരു കൺസ്ട്രെയിൻ്റ് ആണ് ബിക്കോസ് വി ഹാവ് ടു ഗ്രോ സോ വി ഹാവ് ടു ടേക്ക് ഇൻ ടു കൺസിഡറേഷൻ ദോസ് തിങ്സ് പിന്നെ ഈ പൊല്യൂഷൻ്റെ ഇഷ്യൂസ് ഉണ്ട് നിങ്ങൾക്കറിയാം ഡൽഹിയിലെ പൊല്യൂഷൻസിൻ്റെ ഒക്കെ ഇമ്പാക്റ്റ് എന്താണ് ഇറ്റ് വിൽ അഫക്റ്റ് ദ ഹ്യൂമൻ ഹെൽത്ത് ഹെൽത്ത് ദെൻ ക്ലൈമറ്റ് ലിങ്കേജ് ഈ ക്ലൈമറ്റ് ചേഞ്ച് കാരണം ഇന്ത്യയിലും നിങ്ങൾ ഉത്തരാഖണ്ഡിലെ ഫ്ലൈറ്റ്സ് ഒക്കെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഓർമ്മയില്ലേ വാട്ട്സ് ഹാപ്പനിങ് ദ ഇസ് ഓൾ റിലേറ്റഡ് സോ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് വി ഹാവ് ടു ഫോക്കസ് ഓൺ ദോസ് തിങ്സ് ആൻഡ് നൗ ഇറ്റ്സ് ടൈം ദാറ്റ് വി ഹാവ് ടു ആക്ട് നൗ ലെറ്റ് മീ ടെൽ യു അന തിങ് ഹാവ് യു എവർ വണ്ടർ വെദർ ദർ ഇസ് എനി കണക്ഷൻ ബിറ്റ്വീൻ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഫോറിൻ പോളിസി ഓഫ് എനി കൺട്രി ഹാവ് യു തോട്ട് അബൌട്ട് ദീസ് തിങ്സ് ഡിപ്ലോമസി ആൻഡ് സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് ആർ ബോത്ത് ഇൻ്റർലിങ്ക്ഡ് സി വി നീഡ് എനർജി ടു സസ്റ്റൈൻ അവർ ഗ്രോത്ത് ആൻഡ് ദർ ആർ മെനി മൾട്ടിപ്പിൾ ഫോറിൻ ഫാക്ടേഴ്സ് വിച്ച് അഫക്ട് ദാറ്റ് ലൈക്ക് you know the reason ukraine war which is happening so there was this pressure from the western countries led by us that india shouldn't import russian oil so we told fine then give us cheap oil It's because russia was willing to offer us cheap oil and we need oil so what we do as government of india officials is that we do what is best suited for our country and our citizens we can't afford to buy oil for 100 dollars per barrel we need to sustain our economy at a 60 dollars or 65 dollars if russia is willing to provide us for that 65 dollars we are going to buy from that and it's not only that imagine that if you are not purchasing from russia what will happen to the international market russia's oil get stored just within their territory and you have to go to the gulf countries so automatically the price will increase it's not only for india even for the european countries so they also need to pay higher amount so we told the our european guys see it's even better for you guys because if you if we also stop purchasing from russia the international price will rise so you guys also need to pay much for the oil which you are purchasing and we are not like anti west or pro west country we we are non west like my boss dr jay shankar sir says like we are a non west country but we are not anti west and we are no pro us or pro russia we are pro india for diplomats so as an ifs officer the first thing that comes to me is like india if any policies we do it's india matters and everything else is secondary so now coming to that tricky questions why you think this sustainable development is linked with foreign policy many often when we negotiate in, in the international forums like un and other places now you have recently seen other like cop 26 we all knew that this emission problem is there and climate change is affecting all of us so you we have to reduce this thing so these european countries and western countries like us and other countries are putting pressure on us like india can't emit this much uh, em pollutions or gases outside this is not only affecting you this is impacting their society also so we told wait a second you guys have developed you guys have developed through this industrial revolution by emitting more gases in fact us was the biggest polluter until recently when china overtook us so they got developed they used 
all the ga calls and gases all they already emitted all pollutions everything and they have become a developed country now they are lecturing us that hey guys you now it's time for us to save the planet so you shouldn't use this uh, fossil fuels uh, for emitting uh, producing this thing we told that of okay fine we are willing to restrict those things but you guys should give us the technology the clean energy technology for creating green uh, green powers for that but that also most of the developed countries are unwilling to give why they tell, they say that is patent regime these technologies have been developed with intense research millions of dollars have been going into these things so we can't give this technology to india and other developing countries sorry that you have to pay for that so we told that is not fair there should be some justification or justice if we have to achieve this target that we have to bring down the emission below the uh, level which we have decided in the cop 26 meeting so negotiations are still going on so we told that as a committed society a coming country a, a respected country which we believe that uh, will have a huge impact on other countries and societies of the world we by 2070 we are planning to become a net zero emitter of uh, emitting country but we also need technology so it's a tricky thing we have to negotiate with the western countries we also need to tell them that see we need to also grow we need to also become a developed country we have a huge population so that energy is very required and if you guys are telling that we are polluting better give us the technology so the negotiations are still going on and uh, what suits best for india india government takes the decision accordingly and so it's a basically west westerns double standards that see we have developed now when we are going to develop they are talking about pollution where was this pollution when 50 years back okay at that time they burned the gases everything they have done oil spills over many places us was single most country which has i mean single handedly responsible for creating all kind of emissions the climate change which you are currently facing is because of those greenhouse gases which have been emitted for the past 50 60 years india and china have started emitting only for the last 20 years or so of course but there is increase in that emission but we are taking more concerned effort to restrict those things now i don't know whether how many of you are aware that european union has come up with a new policy called carbon border adjustment mechanism and this thing will kick start in 2026 so you know what is this thing they told that they are very concerned about their environment their society so even those products which are exported to europe they should have low carbon emission but the catch is that we are energy intensive industry based country most of you know like 70 percentage of india's power come from thermal power so the products like steel aluminum and other uh, automotive equipments these are high energy consuming things so obviously they will emit carbon so after 2026 i mean starting january 1st 2026 when we start exporting these things like for example steel from tata or sail or some then the european union will put some taxes on these thing telling that this is high carbon content so india has lodged a strong protest against these things in wto and also with the european union in fact my colleagues was negotiating with them a few we few weeks back and uh, they told that uh, we categorically told them see how how come these countries become developed like europe japan korea united states its base is because of the export driven economy they they exported a lot and once your export starts increasing it's related reflected in your gdp growth rate just it is what's happening in china china became the second largest economy just because their exports boomed dramatically and they are now the biggest exporter in the world so 
it's proved that only export driven and 90% of the chances that export driven countries are the ones who have been able to prosper and give a meaningful dignity life to the their citizens so we have to also export so if the european union put come up with some restrictions saying that see this is against the sustainable development part uh, you can't do this but we have to counter these things of course we are also concerned about these things but let then we tell them that you give you need to give us technology so that we can adapt and we have like we cut the emissions for this steel manufacturing or this aluminum or other manufacturing processes so india's this energy intensive and trade export industries will have a consequence if we didn't deal with these things so that's why i'm telling you that sustainable develop development and diplomacy will go in hand in hand we have to grow in a meaningful manner but without causing any harm to the developments now uh, how many of you follow india's foreign policy please etra varku interest undo foreign policy il one one guy is there two three kai pokkan madi aano adu okay so ministry of external affairs adu nammada videshaarya mandralayam sustainable development ayittu korchu linkages undu how etra varu international solar alliance ne kurichu kettundu ISA International Solar Alliance adu indiyade oru projects aanu adu solar energy nu namaku its like mea aanu one of the main ministries which is actually handling these things we have partnered with many countries and through that like uh, solar panels and solar energy based industries like a system generate you know. so through that we are cutting the carbon emission and we also have another thing called cdri coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure e climate change karanam namukku ariya pala accidents um incidents um happen cheyunnu flood varunnundu sea erosion varunnundu app adine resist cheyuna oru infrastructure nammade countries il koravana developed developing countries il app mea oru initiative aanu ee parana cdri um uh international solar alliance pinne nammada prime minister launch cheyundu one sun one world one grid project adayathu ningalku ariya sun is the 24 hours but nammada bhoomiyada oru bhagathu sun kaanungi matra bhagathu kaanathilla so when sun shines in one part it's like if you can connect the international to a solar grid po oru salathu sun kittuna aa energy vechane internationally will be getting these things so 24 hours 7 days 365 days a year you will be getting this power so that's a concept which mea also has put forth namukku pala alliances undu countries undu france aitundu egypt aitundu uae aitundu ee international solar alliances um adu pole thane cdr green grid initiatives so these this is what government do government of india is actually very concerned about the, our society and our environment so as part of these things even the uh, last g20 summit which happened in delhi a uh, prime minister was very keen to push these things and he even told that that uh, sustainable development will be one of the big agendas in the coming years in india's foreign policy and also domestic policy so that's how it matters your life and everything and uh, diplomacy foreign i mean uh, foreign policy sustainable development that or link ningalku ipo korachengil idea kittikanallo how it matters and uh, any anyone has any doubt you can ask me that's not an issue there any doubt undo okay so i don't want to take much time so i think we are running out of time so this is what government do and you should what you should keep in your mind enda nammada requirement ee namaku grow cheyanam namaku developed country avanam nammada industries progress cheyanam there should be more manufacturing and we want people to be in india instead of moving out 
So we want more companies and uh, uh, other service sectors to be located in India so that we do want energy. Upon other through a sustainable way we have to manage. So that's what we all need to strive for. And in that event, Koshio 24, stepping stone on a very good and Ningala Pavil, Ningala to an government in him, Samuhatin him contributed Chaitan and Asham Siginu. I once again thanks Father for inviting me and on this, of course, the Sense Defense College Management. I wish you may conduct other relevant topics in future and this college and this student reaches further height. May God bless you and thank you. So I invite you for the lamp lighting ceremony. Thank you, sir. It was indeed an honor to hear from you the practical aspects of sustainability in the context of governance and geopolitics. We have among us today an exceptional academician, a Fulbright scholar and a researcher who has left an indelible mark in the world of academia. To introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, who is Professor A. A. Mohammed Hatha, Professor and Head of the Department of Marine Biology and Microbiology and Biochemistry at Cochin University of Science and Technology. I welcome Dr. Thomas Matthew, the Head of the Department of Physics. Esteemed guests, delegates and participants. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you a distinguished figure in the field of environmental microbiology, Professor Mohammed Hatha. He is currently the, currently the professor and head of Department of Marine Biology, Microbiology and Biochemistry at Kusat, Kerala. Dr. Mohammed Hatha took his master's degree in marine biology from uh, Marine Biology from Kusat and PhD in environmental microbiology from Bharatiya University. He started his career in industry as the head of quality assurance division of a leading seafood and processor 
Sri Food Processor and Exporter Company. He was instrumental in getting the US FDA A listing for the company. Later, he shifted to uh, teaching and research and taught in various universities in India and abroad. Uh, in 2012, he was awarded with Fulbright Scholarship and worked as Fulbright visitor, Visiting Scholar at Michigan State University, USA, and gave a series of lectures at different universities and research institutions in the USA. He has more than 190 research publications to his credit. We welcome you, sir, to deliver the keynote address. Good morning, everyone. Honorable uh, President Dr. Stephen Matthew, Barsar uh, Reverend Father uh, Jins Nelikatil, uh, esteemed uh, Chief Guest Sri Shyam Chand IFS, uh, Protector of Immigrants, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, uh, Dr. Thomas Casey, uh, Dr. Jisha George, and my dear. Uh, Friend, uh, Cincy, uh, she is from our department. She took a PhD from our department. I'm extremely happy to be here uh, today uh, addressing you about uh, you know, sustainable uh, development. Uh, in fact, you know, it's a very, 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 very key thing. Uh, we can only go sustainably, otherwise we'll crash. There's no doubt about it. And I'm very happy to be in this hall. This almost looks like... Uh, uh, multiplex uh, stuff. I never been to that kind of uh, seminar hall till now, and this is my first visit to uh, Uyavur Saint Stephen's College. Uh, fantastic ambience. I love it. In fact, uh, I never expected that even university we don't have. We have bigger halls, but you know this is a very compact uh, kind of. I have seen something in Iser uh, Trivandrum, which is pretty good. They have four different ones with 50, then 250, then 500 plus. Uh, great setup there. Uh, you know, so the ambience is great. So I'll try to deliver something uh, about uh, sustainable development. First of all, you know, sustainability or what we need to understand is everything is connected. He was just talking about how foreign policy is connected to sustainability, how we are, uh, why we are buying, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> the Russian oil why we are looking at, you know, asking or developing or looking for transfer of technologies from foreign countries, clean energy mechanisms, many, many things. We are, in fact, a leader in many, many ways. We are more people. That means more hands to work and more brains to think. And we have a fantastic creativity between your ears, which most people use it. And, you know, like, uh, there's no doubt, next 10, 15 years, India, I don't really see any competitor. China is basically not going to be there because of their political connections with their countries are not that great as India. So everybody is oriented towards an India-centric kind of approach and which will be definitely good for us. There's no doubt about it. I'll be talking more about science part of it. And I personally practice some of the things, so I'll also give a glimpses of some of the things. I mean, it's all possible. It's all very, very easily possible. But you do your bit. And that makes a difference. The problem here is most people think what I do is just one person, what, you know, you know, it is, it matters very much. For that, we need to have an understanding about uh, what is sustainability, how we can achieve, what kind of uh, technologies we can uh, practice, what kind of simple uh, progress in life we can do, many, many ways you can do it. So we will come back to that. So uh, can I have my presentation here on this? I just shared my presentation, please. Uh, that would be better. I can talk otherwise, but still, this will be a little more to the point. Yeah, I'll also like to, I, I'm more interested to move around and talk uh, than uh, staying stationary, which is really not, uh, uh, it's okay, I can manage, but still this is a little more comfortable. And uh, I, yeah, sustainability, a practicable option, you know, like it's quite possible uh, to do these things. Yeah, maybe 
Uh, it's coming. Yeah. You have, an, you will move the slides, yeah. So you can move to the next slide. Yeah, just tap on to the next. Yeah, it is, you know, the first understanding is that maybe you can switch off these slides so that, you know, the visibility will be a little more. So we are basically living uh, on a planet with the finite resources. We are not bringing anything from, you know, the moon or maybe we bring some samples to analyze some microbes, some what is the kind of minerals there, uh, those kind of things. But planet Earth is, you know, like it has limited resources. And so when you have limited resources and the resources are required for everyone, then we need to preserve the resource or we need to utilize the resources judiciously so that it is kept for the generations to come. So you can actually just have a look at some of the stuff. Like you can see there are two kinds of resources. You can see renewable and non-renewable. Renewable earth infinite. I mean, as he was saying, you know, worldwide grid, where absolutely no problem if you can come to that idea. I mean, India's, you know, India has already achieved the target for solar power generation. We actually just upscaled our projections. Are we Because we are a country in the tropical belt, so we have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of sun energy which coming free, infinite. You only need to have the technologies. Plants are using it. Plants are using it very effectively and, you know, we are just trying to copy the plants and we have a kind of cells, photovoltaic cells, which is converting sun's energy to power. So we have wind energy, which is again, so Sloan is a leading, uh, leading uh, wind power, uh, wind power turbine manufacturer in the world. Leading, I'm not just joking, so Sloan is a leading company in the world, uh, you know. Then uh, these are all infinite because you always have sunshine, you always have wind. Because if there is a, there is a variation pressure, the, the air starts moving. Then you have another things like forest. You can actually grow forest. You can cut them, use them, judiciously use it. You can regrow them. So it's a renewable kind of thing. You have fish, you have soil, fish in the ocean. If you, if you practice sustainable capture, you can maintain the fish there always. The thing is that you are capturing small fish also. Those no, not have reached the size of reproductive age. You are capturing them. You are uh, non-selectively, you are targeting them. You are resorting to, you know, kind of uh, destructive fishing practices. So you have shortage of fish. Otherwise, you have a lot of fish. Fish will continue to grow because ocean is two-thirds ocean. A lot of water body there. This lot of water body can sustain the fish, but we are actually as the, and some of, or the initial speakers, they said, the greed will crash. Everything is there. You know, when there is exam, what, what, what level you require and what level you harness from the, from the natural thing, that matters. Then you have agriculture, you're actually producing. We are actually leading in many of the agriculture production scenarios. We are producing, we are producing many of the, you know, food stuff for the world. We are leaders. We have a lot of cattle. We have a lot of agriculture. We are basically agriculture-based country. The monsoon is the biggest thing in India. If monsoon is good, economy is good, stock markets are up, everything is fantastic. Because India is primarily an agri-driven country, agri-economy. So that is the thing. And you know, when you come to non-renewable, this is where the problem lies. You have non-renewable because fossil fuels, which are actually coming from organic material, buried in the, in the, under the, ocean or under the sediments, you take them out, you, you burn, because it's a very convenient form of energy. So you still use it, but emits a lot of CO2, which has its own problems. And you have non-renewable finite resources like iron ore, bauxite, diamonds, gold, uranium. If you look at India, India is actually acquiring aluminum and other uh, lithium uh, no, fields in Argentina. In Latin America, many places in Latin America, because our require, projected requirement is very high. We have limited resources. We are big. We are going to Australia. We are going to Latin America. We are going to many parts of the world seeking for material. Oh, no, I mean, we are, you know, leasing or we are actually acquiring many, many fields across the globe. Projecting, uh, that's what I said, because 
we have the numbers. We are 1.42 billion, and that 1.42 billion is a big number. So the requirement is very high. The development is going to be very high. There's no doubt about it. We are going to do that path. Next slide. And you can see, you know, the sustainable development. There is a sustainable development conundrum, you can say. It's not possible easy. Whenever there is a development, whenever you grow, there is a, there is a generation of waste. It, be it fossil fuel waste, be it human waste, be it other kind of uh, waste, industrial waste. Whenever there is development, there is a generation of waste. So sustainable development is definitely a development and sustainability is always in contradiction. So there is a great uh, difficulty to achieve that. But it is achievable to a great extent. may not be in a 100% perfect scenario. And perfect basically it never exists. Perfection is a kind of you know, theory. Because once you then reach perfect, then you're dead. You're not thinking anything further. So it's just a, just a kind of finish we are saying about perfection. It is not, you know, a kind of static a point. So here, so environmental, you need to have sustainable development. You need to have social progress. If you, our people are poor, you tell them don't cut mangroves. If they don't have firewood, what they will do? They'll cut. You tell them there is don't capture small fish. They have nothing. They just go to the water and capture it. Definitely, you can't stop it. So social progress is mandatory. Economic development is mandatory. It's equitable economic development. Equitable. Everybody is getting, everybody getting the fruits of economic development of India. That's very, very important. That's what we are trying. I mean, no, we are actually two days back. I mean, yesterday's newspaper, business line I have seen, Indian poverty, ultra poverty has come down to 3%, from 4.2% to 3%. It's a big number. It's a big number, actually. So we are trying to achieve that. And, you know, then environmental protection and enhancement. You, you live in harmony with nature. You can definitely, I mean, father was telling about, you know, like uh, the man is the superior. That's very true. Man is the only species which is having the creativity almost equal to God or maybe God has created him with that kind of creativity and, you know, that kind of imagination. So he manages things. But the thing is that it is, it is not a kind of right kind of understanding going into people. You know, even Madhav Gadgil was telling, there is no harm. You kill the wild boar, you eat it. It is a fantastic meat. It's a fantastic protein supplement. What's the harm? Because the population need to be adjusted. Population need to be balanced by itself. When that balance goes, there's a crash. In human case also, we can actually anticipate some crash at some point of time if we go like this, but many countries stopped growing. Many countries, as he said, Europe, US, Canada, most places either stagnating or they're all dying population. India or Southeast Asia, growing population. So naturally, their old age people increasing. Naturally, the growth is not going to take place. And we will be growing. And also, we now we have 25, 40, maybe the maximum number in our population. But, you know, that also will change after maybe some 15, 20 years. Then there's a change. Because many people don't want to marry. Many people are not interested in having children. They uh, see children as a liability. All those things are nice. Maybe an advantage at some point of time. But it's not going to be an advantage forever. Things will change. So here, all these things happen together. Then you have what? Sustainable development, which is not really a very easy thing. It is definitely going to be a tough thing. Going next slide. So actually, a UN or United Nations, you said the big body. They see there is development. There is, because everything, our constant aspiration is to develop. There's no doubt about it. We want to develop. We want to become a developed country. Many countries become developed and they used, as you said, rightly said, they use a lot of Gas gasoline, you know, vehicles, uh, I mean, uh, coal powered uh, things, many things. Even per capita carbon emission is very high in US. There's no doubt. Only thing collectively, India and China is putting more carbon. But per capita, I am putting only this much. Uh, or an Indian is putting only this much. But a US person is putting almost this much. But their numbers are much, much less. So when, you, when it comes to numbers, I said the number matters always, right? So there, uh, UN has got sustainable goals, sustainable development goals, in which these are all connected. You look at no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, 
Everything is, you know, connecting from one point to another. And you have clean air and sanitation, affordable clean energy. This is what we are, you know, we are developing in a big way. Decent uh, work and economic growth. Industry, in, this is again, we are actually one of the best startup innovation, I mean, startup ecosystem is in Kerala. That's what Swedish-based people were telling. India, Kerala has got a better uh, startup ecosystem. We are actually, and innovation, I, I kept some other slides, in, not in this presentation, maybe they are in my system. Bill Gates was there with a the chaiwala, day before yesterday. And Bill Gates was with another person. You know, like, we have creating a kind of, uh, a kind of, uh, just a box. That box carries everything for in case of a landslide, in case of flood, in case of a natural calamity. It has got, you know, medical kit. It has got other protective wear. It has got, uh, you know, a lot of stuff detectable, you know, on the spot detection uh, kits, many things. And he was saying, in India, innovation is everywhere, from Chaiwala to the other end. Everywhere. You know, people, you know, very creative people. We do that. Actually, we are doing so many things, right? Only thing we have a lot of people, but you know that people will be our democratic dividend. The people are the major, major resource for us. We are the human resource capital of the world. So all these things, we are working in uh, life below water, life on land and many things, right? And partnership to achieve the goals, international partnerships. Next slide. So you can actually, six transformations to achieve sustainable development. If you look at one is education, gender, and inequality. You have to target that. Very, very important. Educated people can go somewhere, do something, live. And, you know, basically, the gender equality, Kerala, it is pretty good, but it is not so in many other places. And, you know, those things. And health, well-being, and demography. This is another thing we have to, that we are, we have a challenging, I mean, even central government is not really funding as much. Maybe Kerala is doing better. Kerala's uh, human development index is almost as good as the best of the Western Europe. But if you look at, uh, I mean, uh, last budget I felt in education and health sector, the, the, the percentage is actually slightly less. So I really have some concerns on that. Energy decarbonization, sustaining in industry. We have uh, EVs coming up. You know, Tata Motors is a leading EV and there are several tech, I mean, Mahindra, so many people coming into EV market and they are uh, producing a lot of fantastic vehicles, cutting down uh, fossil fuel and you have, uh, as I said, solar power, we have already achieved target. Wind power, with this time a lot of thrust on wind power, we will achieve that. We have a uh, background on that. And sustainable food, land, water and ocean, this is very, very important thing. We'll come back to that later. Sustainable cities and communities where you need, you know, urban centric uh, transport, non-polluting transport systems, mass transport systems like Metro, like BRTS, bus rapid transit systems, all those things, you know, transferring people peacefully, large number of people peacefully with low carbon emission to uh, their destinations. And then digital revolution, we are doing fantastic. Digital revolution, you see, you see, you are uh, getting an email. At the end of the email, they say, don't print if you don't require a copy. You think before you take a print. You are sending so much media. Everything is digitalized. You are doing a lot of transactions. Earlier days, you will go to a bank, give the, you know, slip to get the money, not doing anything. You are transferring money here, there, everything. You do a lot of online commerce. Everything is digitalized. Material consumption is basically reduced a great extent by digitalization in many, many ways. I'm just citing a few examples. Go to the next slide. So you can, this is the same thing only where I have given the text there. Uh, this is a uh, image, education, gender inequality, health, well-being and demography, energy decarbonization. This is uh, uh, wind power, solar, you can see. And this is uh, transformation of sustainable food, land, water and oceans. This is sustainable cities and digital uh, innovations. Go to the next slide. See. Components of nature, this is, we have, see, living, non-living. The, no, the, the point where we miss as a people is we are very intimately connected to the non-living. See, if there is no air in this room or if the air is sucked out, all that. If the air pollution, air is polluted, so much effect. I mean, Delhi, you know how many occasions they shut down. Airport shut down, industry shut down, school shut down, 
people are not going anywhere. It is, we are talking about air, we are not seeing it even. I'm, I have a lot of air on, in front of me. I'm not seeing it, but I can feel it by just doing this. If that air is not good, there's a problem. Water. If it is polluted water, you have a lot of issues with your health. If you are pumping so much pesticides and fertilizers into the soil, they come back to you with much more venom through your food chain. But people are not realizing it. People are just dumping many, many things into the, into the oceans, into the backwaters, into the places. They feel that the nature is not telling them anything and it will come back to them with much more venom. The issue here is we are just part of nature. Though we are intelligent, we are creative. We need to understand that we are just part of nature. We cannot grow beyond the hall. The hall is all encompassing everything. We cannot grow, overgrow that one. How can I overgrow my hand alone? It is not possible. It will be a big, big problem. Right? I am a whole person. I, my growth should be organic, normal. If I just put a lot of muscles on my left hand, it will be a, a kind of imbalance is there. Right? So we are intimately connected to this. Our well-being is closely associated with the health of the environment. According to WHO, 24% of deaths worldwide are linked to avoidable environmental factors. We need clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and toxin-free places to live. This is where sustainability or sustainable development comes into picture. We grow, we develop, mandatory growth happens then. How you grow? How you grow without polluting these non-living entities? Or minimizing the pollution to the non-living entities, then you live better. Next slide. So man is, you know, man is a product of nature, a part of the universe. The universe is operated under exact natural roles. You are not doing anything. And I will also tell you one thing. The nature, we are all saying that See, Pragirdi is a local, cut local. I am not a native Malayalam. But when I transact science, I, just, I, I would like to transact in English. That is the only issue. Uh, I can very well go to Malayalam. That is my mother tongue. I learned in Malayalam medium. But we are not going to do anything about Pragirdi. We are not going to do anything about Pragirdi. We are not going to do anything about Pragirdi. We are not going to do anything about Pragirdi. No concern. Whether a human being is there or not, it's not a concern. Whether human beings are suffering or not, it's not a concern. Because all connected existence. So if you want to live better, you want to live in harmony with nature, you want to use the resources judiciously, so you feel good. You definitely feel good, right? We'll see that later. So here, man is a product of millions of years of evolution. And the last one, they can all get on low, man. There are a lot of uh, people then. He adapts himself to the laws of nature or he perish. That's all. Nature doesn't care. He has to adapt to the laws of nature, then happily exist or else. That's it. Finish. Next slide. Yeah, here, seven environmental, uh, you know, sustainability examples I have put. This involves conservation of land, freshwater, oceans, forests, and air, sustainable forestry, water management, sustainable agriculture, efficient lighting, right? Then sustainable uh, construction, you heard about green buildings, uh, renewable energy, a lot of uh, sunlight, uh, I mean, uh, tidal energy, wind energy, so many stuff is there. Zero waste, right? Zero, see, I'll tell you, this is a big thing. This is what the country as a whole trying to evolve. We wanted to become zero waste or circular economy circular economy means waste from one industry goes to another industry as a resource from there whatever waste comes to another industry because nature if you look at nature nature offers solutions for everything if you look at nature if you don't interfere there is nothing called waste one organism's waste is another organism's nutrient everything is recycled perfectly the only issue is when we bring in a lot of artificial stuff into it, where nature doesn't have the capability to do it, that, that gets accumulated. There is the problem. Otherwise, so zero I mean, uh, waste and circular economy are the key things which government of India or any government, any, any developed country or developing country 
is trying to imitate or trying to emerge. Next slide. So, you know, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. No way. Actually, we borrow it from our children because we need to keep it with minimum damage. You can keep it without damage. Perfect. You are just borrowing. You know, once it is borrowed, if you have that feeling, then you tend to care. If you feel that the other feeling, like mother, my father gave it, okay, I plunder and I go. I don't care. Right. But if I feel, okay, this is, I, bo I borrowed from my, from my children, I have to give it back. They have to live and their children have to live. So that should be the attitude. No? Yeah, we go to the next slide. So the benefits of, you know, environmental health, as I said, we are intimately connected to the non-living. Cleaner air quality, cleaner water, reduce the hazardous waste, increase access to healthy foods, safer outdoor environments for adults and children. You feel good. I mean, this place is pretty good. This place is pretty good. I mean, like, you know, like a rural setting with lots of uh, plants and other things where uh, you feel really good. When I was driving from Ernakulam to this route, it was completely a rural setting. Now I'll go. But Kerala, of course, everywhere, anywhere, you know, you peacefully go, then you can enjoy. You peacefully go, you stop and you look at the trees, you breathe the fresh air, you look at the canal, just blessing, right? You feel blessed. I improved population health, safer outdoor environments and improved health quality. We go to the next slide. Yeah. Sustainable farming practices are required to manage our farms. So this is, I'll, show, I'll tell you some of the things, you know, you like many places, they will, they will use the groundwater level. I, I mean, there is a very worrying uh, situation. Maybe Shamchan knows very well. I mean, these uh, dams, less than 50%, most of the dams, less than 50% capacity. Some of them are less than 20%. If this rains are delayed, I'm actually a little concerned about it. If there is water, is not there. It's a big, big issue. I've been to, you know, I, 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 of course, I've been to both the poles, both Arctic and Antarctic. During my Antarctic, I was in uh, South Africa, Cape Town for some time. You open the tap. No water, nothing. It will be just bursting sound. Just like a spray. It is like a mist coming onto your hand. Nothing. No, no running water. That is the first city to go dry. You just have some mist onto your hand. Then you take a towel and wipe it. That's it. There is no running water. Absolutely no running water in the hotels, in the taps. And they put boards everywhere like you have to, you know, get permission before, before you use the groundwater. Very, I mean, we will, people, but you know, like misuse it. Water need to be conserved so much. So you can see some of these uh, things which are, you know, like increased pesticide usage. So we have reached, one thing is that we have reached the maximum we can achieve with pesticide and fertilizer usage. Now our growth is by very little every year. We are actually pushing it a little bit. Now we need to go to transgenic technology. We need to have transgenic plants which can fix their own nitrogen, which can kill their own pest which can live in environmental extremes like high saline soils and dry conditions, high temperature conditions. There are you know, a lot of research going on and uh, I'm sure next series of crop plants are definitely going to be transgenics. And those transgenics will definitely, again, as I said, human have the capacity. So the transgenics will avoid dependence on fertilizer, uh, pesticides to a great extent. So you will have foods which are definitely uh, pro I mean, produced with a minimum impact. Go to next slide. See, this is what, you know, digital, the technology revolution. See, I can sit here using IoT. I can water my plants at home. I can set sensors there. I can operate many. I can operate my farm. I can monitor what is going on in my farms. I can use drones to pay pesticides. I can use uh, what kind of uh, soil issues there by using sensors there and getting the information through satellite and to my mobile phone. Sit there, sit here, I can do that, right? So many kind of things, advancements are coming. Next slide. And, you know, sustainable forests are major contributors to the health of the ecosystems. Unfortunately, we are seeing like this, which is again uh, issues. Microbial issues also there, maybe cutting the thing from the deep forest where human never have exposure, may have microbial pathogens or other things which are coming into urban settings or human dwellings through this stuff and probably get uh, affected. People get, getting... No, uh, new, new diseases and all that. Next slide. And this is sustainable construction practices. Just putting white, you know, yesterday I was, I used to listen to uh, this uh, Karshigarangam always radio because I live from my office around 6.45. That time this is on. 
or maybe at times uh, this yesterday it was in uh, some other discussion what they said just painting the top of the terrace by white cement takes at least it is he's saying after the sun you know that is at mid noon or maybe around evening it will be around 50 plus degrees if you put your uh, 58 to 60 degree if you just paint white cement it is almost coming down by 15 degrees and you have the ceiling fans there which is basically pushing the heat from the, the terrace to down here so you have the kind of thing or you keep plants or you can have solar panels if you have sufficient and government getting light i'll show you my stuff then here you know those kind of things uh, and uh, white buildings there are green buildings you put lot of aeration you see air to pass freely and many many ways you know you can have there are green building council is there are a lot of things where architects Uh, score points go to next slide and this is metro urban mobility options non polluting mass transit systems next slide uh, this is what we all you know we all uh, try to you know you like make use reuse remake recycle make use so no, there's no waste nothing this is a circular economy is also like that circular economy has a fantastic principle of this where uh, we wanted to do that uh, go to next slide and we have this this is renewable only but slow but adoption of solar power i mean kerala is leading uh, nationally kerala rooftop solar see i put my rooftop solar as soon as in my village when it came mine was the second connection i i was not interested in battery operated i was always interested i'm i'm collecting my water i'll show you all those things then uh, you know i didn't uh, i put it maybe 5 years now 5 years plus my bill comes around it was almost nil but 200 rupees is just that uh, fixed charges otherwise there is nothing and uh, rooftop uh, adoption is now we have to increase the grid capacity to include more people into that because many places the grid cannot take the load now that is the issue now in adavanagar in my village where i am saying they are not giving anything more because more people already put it the capacity now the current grid cannot take anything more so now definitely the grid uh, will <laughs> get bigger and uh, more people will go into that and go to next slide geothermal you know if you look uh, if you go to uh, last slide we go to place like iceland where i recommend it is almost more than 60% just geothermal energy because they have uh, the volcanic and lot of geothermal uh, sources there and all this uh, renewable energy sources go to next slide so role of the society in sustainability the single most important factor that is why we are talking to students the students are the most powerful instruments of change the most powerful people who are going to change the future of the country or a play wherever you are that doesn't matter wherever you are so you need to be educated you need to be you know given the right kind of uh, you know ideas or right kind of perception about development right kind of perception about uh, consumption right kind of perception about our personal living or personal usage of resources all those things so they are the most important uh, factor single most important factor and as i said you need to do this you need to see you know global warming is a, is a phenomenon global phenomenon but why if i put if i make my car ev i am using my bit i am doing my bit many people doing that see the atmospheric systems are all connected the air you are getting maybe not just produced in urur it is you know coming from different different places and the water uh, in the oceans is always on the move very dynamic we are not getting the same water which is this short static static systems there like pond and lakes otherwise no so this is uh, you know the most important factor you think globally and act locally you do your bit don't worry whether others are doing or not you do your bit go to next and the societal action uh, required for sustainable industrialization internal uh, international cooperation very very important where uh, mea and uh, shamchan's group is coming very active and, and very very key role because we we actually after modi we see the doc, is dr jay shankar or what dr jay shankar he is the very prominent figure always you know discussing in various forums india's uh, i i i was interested i put my hand only but half because i thought you meant the students i used to track indian uh, foreign policy which is very important and international foreign policy i read mostly bbc i don't read much local because bbc gives me a lot of insight into what is happening 
I just read for five, ten minutes. I have three papers at home, but I read hardly Hindu is there, but still I read less. Uh, but I, on digital, I mean, internet, I track BBC. Every day morning, I start looking at that, get five minutes reading into BBC, gives me a picture of what is going on across the globe, which is very, very standard, very high quality, reliable news you get. So waste recycling, wastewater treatment and reuse, many countries and you know, and now Singapore may be not having wastewater, everything is almost portable quality water because they are a very small country, just 25 kilometers and they have no <laughs> water, fresh water, all gray and other stuff is converted into fresh, almost like drinkable quality. What next slide? Sustainable living, what we can achieve, certain things, reduce CO2, you can use EV, use a cloth line, run full loads when you run the washing machine because you get optimized. You optimize. Whatever you use, you optimize so that you are not putting it a second time. You optimize whatever, wherever you can. Then it makes a big difference. Reusable drink containers like, you know, I as in School of Marine Science, Department of Marine Biology, we have 200, 300 glasses, stainless steel glasses. Immediately I took as a chore, I just started buying. I said, no, nothing like that. You just take this and serve it. And you wash it. Even if you give 200 rupees to a person to wash and clean, it is good. No problem. He will get something. But you will stop throwing at least 200, 250 after each event. Right. Uh, recycle and reuse. Use less energy. Uh, this is quite possible by being nature friendly. I'll show you. Reusable stopping, shopping bags, shorter showers. Even becoming vegetarian is a good idea to reduce CO2 emission. Because if you want to eat meat, the animal has to eat grass at the first place and only 10% conversion. You need 1000 kg grass to have 100 kg meat. But 1000 kg grass is, you know, straight away you are getting. And if you wanted to go higher up in the food chain, again it is next level, only 10% conversion. So you need a big base there. And growing such amount of plants is indeed a lot of water, a lot of energy, a lot of fertilizer, a lot of stuff. So being vegetarian is definitely a good idea. Uh, I'm non-vegetarian, omnivorous. Uh, but, you know, I love vegetarian, but I eat a lot of fish. Meat, uh, I prefer uh, mutton sometimes. Uh, chicken, almost no. I don't like chicken somehow. I, I don't like it because it's a very bland kind of meat, nothing else. Uh, even beef is better to me. Okay. Then you go to the next slide. So here, you know, pro-environment activities. What we can do becoming a pro-environment person, you know? See, go light on plastic, especially single-use plastic. This is, this is the biggest problem. Plastic is a fantastic man. I'm never against plastic. Plastic is a great stuff. Without plastic, we cannot live. If you completely face out plastic, no trees will be there, nothing will be there. Plastic, you see in this room, maybe more than 60-70% plastic only. It is highly, very good, durable, recyclable, long-lasting, no rust, nothing. But if you all carry one small bag, you know, carry bag, single-use, that is a problem. It will clog waterways, it will pollute soil, it will pollute everywhere. It's a big, big problem. So always carry a reusable bag. There are many varieties. This is a Sangeeta bag. They have thousands of designs. Uh, so you have given a jute bag for the conference. I noticed it. That's good. Uh, sort uh, plastic and dispose of carefully. Never mix organic waste, kitchen waste with plastic carry bags. That is a big problem. People put it inside and then throw. And it will not even get mixed with the soil. It just ferment inside, giving a lot of smell. You cannot just go nearby. Next slide. Yeah, bag it. Jute bag, cloth bag, whichever you want. Right? Next yeah, carrying capacity is there. I mean, any system has got a, got a capacity beyond which it will crush. So that we need to know. Next slide, which is determined by availability of food, water, and other things. And these are the major uh, threats to biodiversity. All people know this. We'll go to the next slide. I'll just quickly finish now. Yeah, I just wanted to come to my personal experience. Uh, some of I said I'll share some of my personal things. I, I don't want to boast anything. Just sharing some simple ideas, which is, if you are interested, you can practice. Uh, there is, it's uh, always, your action should be the product of your conclusion. Never, you know, be a good listener, not be, you know, a slave to anybody. You just listen, you just imbibe ideas, 
you assimilate in your brain and then you take action, right? So this is myself and my teacher. I mean, since he's uh, PhD boss, since he, since he's busy with WhatsApp. See, this is, <laughs> this is, this is your teacher, Saramamis. And myself and uh, Saramamis in Lakshadiv. I used to take the students to Lakshadiv, which is almost a near pristine environment where they can see the coral reefs and other things. So pure nature is most refreshing. We go to, you know, Munar, we go to other rainforests, this, that, so many places. Go to next slide. I'll just show you some of the places. Yeah, this is myself and my master students, maybe three, four years back. Some of them are doing PhD there. I'm here somewhere, right? And the others are my students. Now spread across different parts, maybe some three, four years back. Uh, next slide. This is again the same group only. Uh, many of them are doing researching. I don't know whether he has become a civil servant, he was actively trying. Uh, many others are uh, in research, some in UK, some here itself, in Kerala, Central University, Kerala University. So next slide. Yeah, best things in life comes free. Just click. Like, you know, sunshine, moonshine and gentle breeze. You don't need to pay anything. Best things in life comes free. Absolutely no doubt. It's always there. You only need to have the mind to enjoy it, right? A uh, nice sunshine, moonshine, moonshine is why I really enjoyed this uh, power cuts. You know, long, till my children were in 10th class, I never put a, a UPS or this, what do you call? Ah, uh, inverter. I said, no, I don't want. If the sunshine, I mean, you, you can see when there's a power cut, it's absolute silence. Lot of background noise is there all the time. When only in the power cut time, you know that it is, that lot of background noise was there. And you cut everything and you just pull your chair uh, into the yard and just look at the sky. You try to experience it is a great feeling, right? You see so many things. So these are all coming free. And next slide. Yeah. First lesson in nature conservation or, you know, experience nature. You go walk. You go into the rain. You go to the beach. You go to, you know, any place where you can experience. See, the experience is the only thing authentic. That is personally your experience. All other things are stories. Whatever I am telling, you know, stories to you. Maybe some of you might have experienced. But once you try to experience, then it becomes your authentic, real self experience. That is very much required. So you need to experience nature to, first of all, how is this nature? What is this stuff? You go, you wet your hands in the, in the water, you get drenched in rain, everything then you feel, you know, it's actually a blissful experience. Go to the next slide. And this is my student. We are actually going to Bangaram. Uh, next slide. This is myself, uh, you know, my first snow storm in, uh, this is long year been just 79 degree north, just next to, this is the northernmost township in the world. It is at 79 degree north, some 2,000, 2,500 people. Long year been is that place. Go to next slide. This is my student, he is now a faculty in, uh, he is taking samples in, uh, he was my student that time, so I sent him to Arctic, I sent him thrice. So he is now in uh, a faculty there, so he is just collecting some samples in the Arctic ice samples. Go to next slide. This is myself uh, in the Arabian Sea around 2000 meter depth station. I am just trying to shoot one equipment to collect, maybe since he knows, since he might have gone and experienced this thing. And she knows how difficult it is in the sea to stay at least for five minutes. You will be thrown out. You know, it's like very, once you stop, then difficult. You keep moving, no issue. Stop means this is what. Then you start <laughs> vomiting. Next slide. And this is myself in the Arctic. Of oh, pure nature, you know, just, uh, you know, next slide. Yeah. What is the nature of nature is abundance. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said. Nature provides everyone's need, but not even a single person's greed. Because the nature of nature is simple abundance. You see, this mango tree, if it species basic nature is species wants to propagate. Their next line, further generation. So suppose if you look at this mango tree, it needs only maybe this many mangoes to propagate its species. But it gives you thousands of mangoes. Just giving it. Right. You go to the next slide. Next slide you see. Two eight thousands of jackfruit. You get you know seeds there. 
plenty stuff, abundance. You see this? Coconut, you see mangoes, you see passion fruit. You, when it sunshines, plentiful sunshine. When it rains, plentiful water. When it breezes, beautiful, you feel blissful, right? It's just the nature of nature is simply abundance, nothing else. Go to the next slide. This is my place. This is a lot of water at home. So my wife and my brother and all, Ika, 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 they can come in summer also. I'm not going to drain anything, but I know the value of water. The water will remain here. I can, I enjoy water on my yard. These are my two PhD students. So one is in UK now. She's, I mean, she's in NHS. She's postdoc. She also got a Humboldt Fellowship. The other one is running her own uh, online coaching, this thing, and she's doing fantastic. Go to next slide. And this is, you know, my recruit. You got to come alone and just you trap water. It, it will simply go there. I put so many mercury in my bag. I have only 20 plus 10, 30 cents. But I put so many. Some of them I now converted to fish ponds, keeping fish, growing tilapia for just fun of it and eating sometimes. Right. <laughs> Go to next slide. See, leaf litter. I'll get it. lines and leaf litter. Never do that. Leaf litter is a fantastic. It is a blanket on soil. You just keep that there. I'm going to be in we are in the side lower cherry or set up and I can't know the side of it will simply stay there it just get converted into a kind of a compost then it is very nice right so here it's a blanket of soil it retains retains moisture good microbial health very little or no dependence on fertilizers options for use mulch it compost it or uh, turn them into fruits and flowers i'll show you how you can turn them into fruits and flowers yeah next slide so this is this is what i'm this is my mango tree. I have a beard in the 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 Next slide. Yeah. See this. I get That may be 2019. It is fairly cool. I'm not boasting. It is, you know, if you can have, I don't have much land, but whatever is there, just planted trees, I mean, bamboos, this, that, and everything is just covering my house. Top land is all power. So that also working nicely. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a Madhili Panjani, the complete Vatikis, I am complete carbon sequestration system. full carpet like growth. Beautiful. I just maintain it. I water it. I love it. So every day till 7.30 I work. 7.30 I get out of my room. Till 7.30 I work on my academic things, this, that. 7.30, then around 8.39, I'll be in field doing something, you know, which I enjoy most. Which gives me a lot of energy, a lot of refreshing, uh, you know, refresh. I mean, I really feel good. That's what my personal experience. Go to next slide. You can get lots of mangoes. This is all my own mango tree only. One mango, I get lots of mangoes. This time, mangoes are less. Then give it. I don't sell anything. Share it with people, my sisters, brothers. So many people are there nearby. Uh, go, go next. Yeah, I mean, you can turn it to papayas, bananas, right? Uh, that is my, this is my, again, I just put a thing there and put my bamboos there so it will not cross that uh, boundary. Go to next slide. I mean, vegetables you can get on the terrace or uh, other land. Next. Next slide. Yeah. Next slide. <laughs> yeah. Podina, other things. You get every, most of the things you can make. You know, it's very simple. You just put some half an hour job, then it will grow. Next slide. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. You can also, I, I get, I never buy eggs. I get my own. Now I put a pen, long pen where they can move around freely. I get my, you know, eggs. I'll not uh, use them for meat. And I mainly, my interest is fertilizer from the, from the chicken. Right? They are good pest keeping also. This is what I said. This one, 
I put in 2007, I moved into my, this is a flat plate collector, simple rack wall flat plate collector. I moved in 7, 2007 to my new home. Now it is 17 years. I never touched on that. I have hot water in my bathrooms, all the bathrooms, washing a laundry area and the kitchen. Almost near 90 degree, you can get it. If you are, your mind is oriented properly, you can use it for cooking. You can save a lot of gas. But my wife wants to take it from the fresh tap and, uh, you know, straight running. If I am using, I will be using the other one. I see there is no harm. Okay. And this one, I put it in now 5 years plus and uh, 3 kV. I, that time, I put 2.42 lakhs. I was not worried about the kind of economics and other things. I just wanted to use technology. That is what my, I am very much a science person. I love science. I practice science. Very many things I do and most things are working beautifully. Just you need to understand and do it. I didn't go for subsidy and all that because I felt subsidy people sometimes give low quality stuff then. I just did it. And it is working fantastic. Even last month bill was some 220 rupees out of us. 200 is just, uh, you know, for the fixed uh, meter charges and other things. Go to next slide. So here, ultimate solution is you connect with nature as far as sustainability is concerned. Solutions are self-contained in nature. I told you, you know, because we are only copying nature. Your eyes are out of focus. You have many, many things, you know, like your sense of smell, you are many, many systems. You are only trying to imitate those systems to do the job for you, if that fails. So the nature is, as I said, zero waste system, which we are all trying to, you know, like uh, imitate. So then be aware that we are only part of nature. Try to grow as part of nature. Then it becomes a blissful experience. Our life and health are essentially connected to elements of nature. And elements of nature responding to us very powerfully. Don't miss, feel the pulse. Do not miss the pulse of nature. When you connect with the nature, you know, Amo, that is, that is something going wrong there. Right. Do not miss the pulse of planet Earth. Go to next slide. So take home message is get close to nature. Wonderful place to boost your imagination. Just, just just walk around, open your eyes, walk around, look at things. Then you see many, many, you know, many, many interesting stuff. Uh, live easy. Life, you know, it's like it just happened. It will just happen. You don't need to complicate life. Live easy. Uh, you know, you, you are blessed. Do not try to live uh, on planet Earth. I feel, I strongly feel there will be many planets, there will be life. I have a very strong feeling there will be many planets, but we hardly know. There are billions of, uh, you know, planets of which we know just Earth, Moon, and maybe a little bit of Mars. So we cannot say that there is no life on other planets. That will be a foolish thing, I feel. It will be there, but it's, Earth is a fantastic place. So you, got, you are blessed to have a chance to live on this Earth. We are just one part of nature. Blend in as green as possible. Attitude makes everything possible. Attitude decides. You become what you think. Definitely, you become what you think. I thought of uh, my home way back. I was in uh, Fiji. I wanted to have uh, the design like this. All I just tried it, and it happened. And I am happy there. Very much happy there. No issue. I don't want to move into city or other place. I just live there where I wanted to live. I tried uh, several things, and to be at that place. So finally, I am there. Right. Or I was in abroad as a Fulbright scholar or other. I just wanted, not wanted to think. Then attitude makes everything possible and enjoy. That's what you be happy about life. Just enjoy, you know. Be, you know, don't worry much about things. Just enjoy the present and keep going. You can plan always. Plan always, plan for things and other things. So that's it. I think next slide is the last slide. Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, uh, maybe another slide was there, I think. I don't know. He is now, he is a big guy, he is my son, he is my, these two are my brothers. Kids, he did from IIT, then he got a scholarship from Cambridge, and then he is, he is doing pretty good. My son is, uh, I did in ICER, and now he is doing his MS in uh, US, UT Dallas. The other guy is doing now plus one, <laughs> all that big plus two, all right. So I am very close to them. So next slide, I think. Yeah, that's it, uh, finished. Thank you. any questions you can ask me since i have given the keynote thing i just uh, took some time extra but i hope uh, since you don't mind huh? not much but still little more maybe some five minutes plus
Yeah. The dice is now open. Yeah, any 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 questions, please? No questions. Thank you. If you have questions, no issue. I mean, like I prefer people ask questions. Uh, you know, to the I mean, uh, in the public, then uh, it becomes useful to everyone. If you ask in person, you know, like then you only benefited. But if you ask in the crowd, then several people are benefited. So I welcome that. You have a question? Somebody lifting his pen, so I thought, you have a question? No. Yeah, you have a question, please. Glad. This is mine, I think. Yeah, please. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Asha. I'm an assistant professor from Department of Zoology. Sir, nature ne conserve yaan uri baad steps sir then ne follow yin onda kanda the lotri sambosham. Ipa ende weetla anangi polum. Yangal palla karinglum tiru mani kum. Yena cheyanam nature ne udhara illata riri illa sustainable ani thala karinglum cheyanam ende vijari kum. Paksha cheyan orla samayta. Nammada convenience um nammada baaki orla nammada privilege nuoki nammala chalpan cheyam madi kum. Eni kyo ano almost ella aradi or avastha adu ani ari kum. Pa oru mindset te matya orla na adhyam enda. Adi ne enda cheyam bitta. When you change, everything changes. That is the only word. When you change, everything changes. That's why I said that. In the past, actually, plastic is in 2007. Where are they under the bucket? Where are they under the bucket? Plastic is in the bucket. It's not a paper. 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 It's not a अदर लार के चाहिए हम बच्चों ने हमारे ने लगा, because I have interest and I have my car and other facilities. पर जब अपन हमारे विलेज और विलेज जिला आलकारे वाले पढ़े मरे, I am there in the planning board, Kerala planning board लूँ ना एंड विलेज लूँ ना, I used to talk to them, you should provide. Now you can see कोरा साल तक का ये प्लास्टिक के स्टोरेज नो ला बिन निगलम साल ने गला का पाले विलेज जिलों में it is coming up and people are start using it. अंदर इडाम बच्चों, system efficient ने लगेलों apa nama la aja ni, ni nama kita main presiden ni ramo. Nama la pelan yang ada um, nama la cegi ni ni um, nama la ipar ni nairte ipar ni convenience. Percaya once you start practicing, it becomes very easy for you. You have a plastic with you, you will do it here only. Ini tu iu tu iu tu habit tu lagu orang orang tu presiden matro lalu. A habit tu lagu mandiri ni macam ikan orang orang lalu you feel very very easy. But, ni aku ni practice orang ni amarai ni ana. It's very very easy. Only thing you know, we have to think a bit whether I used to throw this there. Even if a bus ticket to all, I am carrying it. I am in my pocket. I am not going to take it. Or take it out. I am not going to take it because it's quite possible. You know, just keep it in my pocket. Why am I going to take it? I am going to seal it. I am going to take it. Automatic. I am going to take it. That is our second nature. Right tomorrow. Then everything works. So you try to change, and you see everything around you start changing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Professor Mohammed Hatta, for enlightening us with your words of wisdom put across in such simplicity. We hope each of us here will draw inspiration from your valuable tips. St. Stephen's College is extremely honorable. There is one question, I think. This is Asha yourself, right? Already, Professor answered Barney, no, but I just add on to what he meant. Yeah. She was asking, like, this is a question, it's a good question she asked. Whenever we mention sustainable development, the discussion holds on a global or national level. I believe it's rather important to host this discussion in the grassroots level from our homes. This movement has come to be made practical from our homes. What is your thought on this as a government official? So this is the question from Ms. Asha, Department of Zoology. So already Sara Bhagavad Gita answer Varanya. So like what he mentioned, I will start from what he is on. Gandhi Varna, be the change what you want to be. And the Mahagandhi Varna means another. Basically follow you. 
ഒരു നിങ്ങളൊരു കാർ യാത്ര ചെയ്യുക ഒരു റഫിൾസ് റേസ് ലേസോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ മുട്ടായി ആ എത്ര വരെ ഫോളോ ചെയ്യണ്ടെന്ന് അറിയത്തില്ല ഒരു നയൻറ്റി പെർസെൻറ്റേജ് മല ഇന്ത്യക്കാരും അത് കാറിൻ്റെ ഇത് തുടർന്ന് തീർന്നു കഴിയുമ്പോൾ പുറത്തോട്ട് കളയത്തുള്ളൂ എത്ര പേര് സ്വന്തം വീട് വരെ അത് പിടിച്ചു വെക്കും അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഒരു വേസ് ബാസ്ക്കറ്റ് കാണുന്ന വരെ അത്ര നേരം എവിടെ കൊണ്ടുവെക്കും പിന്നെ നിങ്ങളുടെ വീട്ടിൽ യൂസ് ചെയ്യുന്ന പെസ്റ്റിസൈഡ്സ് ഇപ്പോൾ വീട്ടിൽ ഞാൻ ഞാൻ പറയാം യു ആർ ആസ്കിങ് ലൈക്ക് ഹോം ഗ്രൗണ്ട് ഗ്രാസ് റൂട്ട് ലെവലിൽ വേണോ വേണ്ടയോ എന്നുള്ളത് ചോദിച്ചു മൈ ആൻസർ ഈസ് ബോത്ത് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് നാഷണൽ ലെവലിലും വേണം ഗ്രാസ് റൂട്ട് ലെവലിലും വേണം രണ്ടിടത്തും വേണം ബിക്കോസ് എവറി ഡ്രോപ്പ് ഓഫ് വാട്ടർ മാക്സ് ആൻഡ് ഓഷൻ എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഒരാൾ നിങ്ങൾ ചെയ്യുന്ന ഓരോ ഇൻഡിവിജ്വലിൻ്റെയും ആ ഇമ്പാക്റ്റ് ആണ് ഗ്ലോബൽ സ്കെയിലിലും കാണുന്നത് ഇപ്പോൾ ഒരാൾ മാത്രം യൂസ് ചെയ്യാതിരുന്നു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ നമ്മൾ വായിക്കൂ ഒന്നല്ലേ ഉള്ളൂ പക്ഷേ ഇതുപോലെ എല്ലാവരും ചിന്തിച്ചു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ എന്തായിരിക്കും പ്രൊഫസർ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ നിങ്ങളുടെ വേസ്റ്റ് വീട്ടിൽ വേസ്റ്റ് മാനേജ്മെൻറ്റ് ഏറ്റവും വലിയ നമ്മുടെ കൊച്ചിയിലൊക്കെ ഉള്ളവർക്ക് അറിയേണ്ട ഒരാളത്തുള്ളവർക്കും വേസ്റ്റ് മാനേജ്മെൻറ്റ് ഏറ്റവും വലിയ പ്രശ്നം പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക് വേസ്റ്റ് എവിടെ കൊണ്ട് കളയും രാത്രി ഒളിച്ചും ഭാഗത്തും അപ്പുറത്തെ ഒരിടത്തേക്ക് കൊണ്ട് കളയുന്ന ആൾക്കാരെ കൂടുതൽ ഭൂരിഭാഗവും അപ്പോൾ അത് കത്തിക്കാൻ പാടില്ല ആ പോയിസ്നസ് ആയിരിക്കും അതെങ്ങനെ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ രീതിയിൽ ചെയ്യാം സത്യം പറഞ്ഞാൽ ഈ സെഷൻ കൊണ്ട് ഏറ്റവും ഉപകാരപ്പെടേണ്ടത് നിങ്ങൾക്കൊക്കെയാണ് എങ്ങനെയാണ് നിങ്ങളുടെ വീട്ടിൽ മാനേജ് ചെയ്യേണ്ടത് എനർജി എഫിഷ്യൻറ്റ് ലൈറ്റ് ബൾബ്സ് നിങ്ങൾ യൂസ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് എത്ര പേരാണ് അതുപോലെ വാട്ടർ ഹീറ്റർ യൂസ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് ഈ സോളാർ പവർ റൂഫ് പവർ ഇപ്പോൾ ഗവൺമെൻറ് ഒഫീഷ്യലായിട്ട് പറയുന്നുണ്ട് അപ്പോൾ റീസെൻ്റ്ലി പ്രധാനമന്ത്രിയുടെ ഒരു പുതിയ സ്കീം വന്നിട്ടുണ്ട് സോളാർ റൂഫ് ടോഫിന് വേണ്ടി അതിന് സബ്സിഡി വരെ ഉണ്ട് വൺ ക്രോ ഹൗസ് ഹോൾഡേഴ്സിന് ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ഗുഡ് തിങ് അത് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് റൂഫ് ടോപ്പ് നിങ്ങളുടെ വീട്ടിൽ വേണ്ടി മാത്രം യൂസ് ചെയ്യാൻ മാത്രമല്ല യു ക്യാൻ ഈവൻ സെൽ ടു അതേഴ്സ് നാഷണൽ ഗ്രിഡിലോട്ട് വരെ അത് സെൽ ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റും അപ്പോൾ അങ്ങനെ പല കാര്യങ്ങളും ഉണ്ട് പിന്നെ നിങ്ങൾ യൂസ് ചെയ്യുന്ന വേറെ ഒരു സംഭവം ഈ കല്യാണത്തിനും ബാക്കിയുള്ളത് കാരണം നിങ്ങൾ പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക് സ്പൂൺ പ്ലാസ്റ്റിക് കപ്പ് കംപ്ലീറ്റ്ലി അവോയ്ഡ് ചെയ്യുക നിങ്ങളുടെ വീട്ടിൽ ഒരു ഇവൻറ്റ് എടുത്തുവാണെങ്കിൽ മേക്ക് ഷുവർ ദാറ്റ് യു ആർ യൂസിങ് സ്റ്റീൽ ഓർ സംതിങ് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ വുഡനായിട്ട് കിട്ടും ചിലപ്പോൾ കോസ്റ്റ്ലി ആയിരിക്കും ഈ പ്രശ്നം വരുന്നത് എന്താണെന്ന് നിങ്ങൾ കോസ്റ്റ് കോൺഷ്യസ് ആകുമ്പോഴാണ് ബാക്കിയുള്ളതിൽ സാക്രിഫൈസ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് സോ ഇഫ് യു ആർ നിങ്ങൾ സ്വയം വിചാരിക്കുകയാണ് എനിക്ക് ഈ സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റിനോട് കോൺട്രിബ്യൂട്ട് ചെയ്യണമെങ്കിൽ യു വാണ്ട് ടു സി ആക്ട് ലൈക്ക് ദാറ്റ് അതാണ് എനിക്ക് പറയാനുള്ളത് ബേസിക്കലി പിന്നെ എങ്ങനെ വേറെ ഇൻഡസ്ട്രി ലെവലിൽ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റും ഐ മീൻ ഗ്രാസ് റൂട്ട് ലെവലിലുള്ള ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ നിങ്ങൾ ദാഹിക്കുമ്പോൾ കടയിൽ കയറി കൊക്ക കൊളം പെപ്സിയും വാങ്ങിക്കുന്നതിന് പോലെ ഒരു കരുക്ക് വെട്ടി കുടിക്കുക വണ്ടി നിർത്തി പാവപ്പെട്ട അവനൊരു ഇൻകം ആവും ഈ മൾട്ടി നാഷണൽ ആൾക്കാരെ എന്തിനാണ് സഹായിക്കുന്നു അവൻ ഈ പ്ലാച്ചിമടയിലെ വെള്ളമൊക്കെ ഊറ്റി എടുത്തിട്ടാണ് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് കൊക്ക കൊളം പെപ്സിയും തരുന്നത് So that's also part of the sustainable development. You can recycle it. You can recycle it. You can recycle it. So already that is a love. Pinne, last I want to tell you that. Start building a culture. One of the things that we have to do is that there is no way to do it. There is no way to do it. There is no way to do it. It's very difficult. He is doing it. It's a wonderful job. I'm not easy. I'm not easy. It's very difficult. He is doing it. It's a wonderful job. I'm not easy. I'm not easy. ലൈക്ക് അതിനൊരു പ്രത്യേക കഴിവ് തന്നെ വേണം വി ഷുഡ് ആക്ച്വലി അപ്രീഷിയേറ്റ് ഹിം ഗിവ് ഇം എ ഗുഡ് റൗണ്ട് ഓഫ് ലോസ് ഫോർ ദാ അത് മലയാളികളെ അറിഞ്ഞിരിക്കേണ്ട ഞാൻ ഈ ലോകത്ത് പല രാജ്യത്തും ജീവിക്കുന്ന അപ്പോൾ ഈ യൂറോപ്യൻ നിങ്ങൾ ഈ യൂറോപ്യൻ സ്റ്റാൻഡേർഡിൽ ജീവിക്കണം എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഇവിടെ റോഡിൽ ഇറങ്ങി വേസ്റ്റ് ഇടുന്നവൻ അവിടെ പോയാൽ ചെയ്യുമോ നിങ്ങൾ ദുബായിലൊക്കെ പോയി ഏതെങ്കിലും ഉറങ്ങി നട്ടലുണ്ടോ അവിടെ പോയി ചെയ്യുക എങ്ങനെ പബ്ലിക് റോഡിൽ വേസ്റ്റ് എറിയാൻ ചെയ്തില്ല അല്ല പേടി ലോ ആൻഡ് ഓർഡറിനെ ഇവിടെ ആണെങ്കിൽ അതില്ല നിങ്ങൾക്ക് യു ആർ നോട്ട് കൺസേൺഡ് ആ പണ്ട് തൊട്ടേ എങ്ങനെ ആ മെൻറ്റാലിറ്റി മാറണം യു വാണ്ട് ടു ചേഞ്ച് ദാറ്റ് മെൻറ്റാലിറ്റി ഇനി ഇങ്ങനെ പോയാൽ പോരാ നമ്മുടെ തലമുറ മാറണം അടുത്ത തലമുറ മാറണം ഇപ്പോൾ പണ്ടുള്ളവർ എങ്ങനെയായി എന്നുള്ളതല്ല നമുക്ക് മനുഷ്യന് ദൈവം ബുദ്ധി വന്നേക്കുന്നത് എന്താ വെച്ചാൽ ടു ലേൺ ഫ്രം യുവർ മിസ്റ്റേക്സ് ആൻഡ് സ്മാർട്ട് പീപ്പിൾ വാട്ട് 
ഇറ്റ് ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് ആ നോളജും ആ മെഡിക്കൽ ഫീൽഡിലുള്ള പുരോഗതിയും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ അഗ്രികൾച്ചറിൽ പട്ടിണി ഒരു പരിധിവരെ മാറ്റാൻ പറ്റി അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ഈ പോപ്പുലേഷൻ കൊള്ളുന്നത് അപ്പം വി ഹാവ് ടു അത് ഈ റിസോഴ്സസ് എക്സ്പ്ലോയിറ്റ് ചെയ്യുന്നതിൽ ഒരു ലിമിറ്റേഷൻ ഉണ്ട് അപ്പം ഈ ഗ്ലോബലി ഞാനിപ്പോൾ സംസാരിച്ചു ഓരോ എമിഷൻ്റെ കാര്യങ്ങളും നമ്മുടെ ഗ്രീൻ ഹൗസ് എമിഷൻസിനും ബാക്കിയെല്ലാം അത് ഗവൺമെൻറ് ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് ഇൻ്റർനാഷണൽ ലെവലിൽ പക്ഷേ നിങ്ങൾ ഫ്രൂട്ട് ലെവലിൽ ചെയ്തില്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇറ്റ് വോണ്ട് ബി എ സക്ക് ഇപ്പം യൂറോപ്യൻസിന് ചെയ്യാവുകയാണെങ്കിൽ വൈ ഡോണ്ട് യു യു എസ് അവരുടെയൊക്കെ ഒരു മെൻറ്റാലിറ്റി എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ തന്നെ അവരൊരു വേസ്റ്റ് കിട്ടിക്കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ അവൻ അടുത്തത് എവിടെ ആ ട്രാഷ് ബിൻ നോക്കി നടക്കും നിങ്ങൾ റെയിൽ റെയിൽവേ സ്റ്റേഷനിലൊക്കെ ആണെങ്കിൽ ആരും കാണാതെ കുറെ കൂടെ പോയി ഇടത്തില്ലേ ആ എത്ര പേര് ട്രാഷ് ബിൻ നോക്കി നടന്നിട്ട് അവിടെ പോയി ഇടും വാട്ടർ ബോട്ടിൽ ചെയ്ത് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇറ്റ്സ് വെരി ഡിഫിക്കൽട്ട് പക്ഷെ ആ ചേഞ്ച് നിങ്ങൾ കൊണ്ടുവരണം നമ്മുടെ ആ സംസ്കാരത്തിൽ കൊണ്ടുവന്നാൽ മാത്രമേ നമ്മുടെ ആ ഒരു ജനറേഷനും ആ പുരോഗതി ഉണ്ടാവുള്ളൂ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് കുറച്ച് പൈസ ഉണ്ടാക്കി കുറച്ച് ഡിഗ്രി കിട്ടി എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞ കാര്യമില്ല യു ഹാവ് ടു അപ്ലൈ ദാറ്റ് ഇൻ യുവർ കൾച്ചർ ഓൾസോ എന്നാൽ മാത്രമേ യു വിൽ അപ്ലിഫ് ദ സ്റ്റാൻഡേർഡ് അതും ആ ജനറേഷനിലും ആ ഇംപ്ലിക്കേഷൻ നിങ്ങളുടെ ഫ്യൂച്ചർ ജനറേഷനിലും സോ ബി ദ ചേഞ്ച് വാട്ട് യു വാണ്ട് ടു ബി സർ ഐ വോണ്ട് സർ ഐ വോണ്ട് ടു നോ വാട്ട് ഗവൺമെൻറ് ഈസ് ഡൂയിങ് ഫോർ സോളർ വെഹിക്കിൾസ് Yeah. Do we get any subsidy for uh, buying and using solar vehicles? Uh, sir told that he is uh, using solar panels and government is also uh, doing so many things for solar panel people, using people. So in future, what will be the role of solar vehicles? I want to know that. Thank you, sir. Electric vehicle is not the case. It is solar. It is solar. See. Yeah, I am not an expert on solar vehicles and these things, my domain is diplomacy, okay. But, uh, see, we are now called electric, that level is now called electric. Because solar panels, you can use a car for the use of the restrictions, you can use the energy for the night, you have to store the energy. So, best, please sit down. So, best possible solution is that now, for mass production, this solar vehicle is going to be a profit for the company. So, he is thinking that way. ഒരുത്തനും ചാരിറ്റി വേണ്ടിക്ക് അല്ല ബിസിനസ് പറഞ്ഞു ചെയ്തു ടെസ്റ്റ് ആയാലും ടാറ്റ ആയാലും എല്ലാവരും അവരുടെ പ്രോഫിറ്റിന് വേണ്ടിയാണ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് ബട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ടു ഇൻ എ എഫിഷ്യൻറ്റ് മാനർ അപ്പം മാസ് പ്രൊഡക്ഷൻ ചെയ്യുമ്പോഴത്തേക്ക് ഇപ്പോൾ ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾസ് ആണ് ഐ തിങ്ക് കേരളത്തിൽ തന്നെ പെർ കാപ്പിറ്റ വൈസ് ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾ കഴിക്കുന്നത് ഇന്ത്യ തന്നെ കേരളമാണ് ഞാൻ അമ്പത് സ്കൂളിലും ഡൽഹിയിലും ബോംബെയിലും ആണെങ്കിലും പെർ കാപ്പിറ്റ ഒരു ഇറങ്ങുന്ന കാറിൻ്റെ എണ്ണത്തിൽ ദാറ്റ്സ് വെരി ഗുഡ് അച്ചീവ്മെൻറ്റ് ഫോർ കേരള ആക്ച്വലി കേരള ഇസ് വെരി പ്രോഗ്രസീവ് സ്റ്റേറ്റ് അപ്പം സോള നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾ ഈ ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിളിലാണ് നമുക്ക് പൊല്യൂഷൻ ഇല്ല അത് ദാറ്റ്സ് ഗുഡ് അത് ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ മെയിൻ കൺസേൺ ഇൻ്റർനാഷണലി എന്നാണ് വേർ ദാറ്റ് എനർജി കംസ് ഫ്രോം നിങ്ങൾ ആ ചാർജ് ആൻഡ് യൂസ് ചെയ്യുന്ന എനർജിയില്ലേ അത് ഒരു തെർമൽ പവർ പ്ലാന്റിൽ നിന്ന് എടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ദാറ്റ്സ് ഡിഫീറ്റ് ദ പർപ്പസ് ഓഫ് വാട്ട് യു ആർ ഡൂയിങ് ഇറ്റ് ഷുഡ് കം ഫ്രം ദീസ് ഗ്രീൻ ലൈക്ക് ഹൗ വാട്ട് സോ കമ്മിങ് ബാക്ക് ടു വാട്ട് ഈ സൈസ് നിങ്ങൾ ചെയ്യേണ്ടത് വീട്ടിൽ ഒരു സോളാർ റൂഫ് ഇൻസ്റ്റാൾ ചെയ്യുക യൂസ് ദാറ്റ് എലക്ട്രിസിറ്റി ഫോർ യുവർ ഇലക്ട്രിക് വെഹിക്കിൾ ദാറ്റ് വിൽ സേവ് Yeah, solar kshas is one sign. CSR is solar powered auto rickshas. No? Solar kshas is one sign available. The car is not used for the UCM. The UCM is not used for the UCM. So you cannot actually use it like, you know, for car. Which needs much more power. At the same time, there is a boat. Drifting boats, country boats. This is the male roof. Because there is no shade, nothing. Panels could be kept. And, you know, some, at least, there is a lot of fishing and drifting. ആ ഡ്രിഫ്റ്റിംഗ് മോഡിലേക്ക് വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുന്ന സാധനം ആക്ച്വൽ പവറിങ്ങിലേക്ക് അത് ഹൈബ്രിഡ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള സാധനങ്ങൾ വന്നു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഹൈബ്രിഡ് ഇസ് കമ്മിങ് സോ മെനി ഹൈബ്രിഡ്സ് ആർ കമ്മിങ് സോ ദാറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ടൈം സച്ച് ഡ്രിഫ്റ്റിംഗ് പാസീവ് കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് മൂവ്മെന്റ് ദെൻ യു ദിസ് സോളാർ പവർ ഇസ് ഫെൻറ്റാസ്റ്റിക് ദെൻ അതർ ടൈംസ് യു ക്യാൻ ജസ്റ്റ് ഷിഫ്റ്റ് ഓൺ ടു അതർ ഹൈബ്രിഡ് ഫ്യൂൽ വിച്ച് വിൽ സെർവ് ദി പർപ്പസ് ആസ് സച്ച് പവർ കാറിനൊക്കെ ഉപയോഗിക്കാനായിട്ട് കിട്ടില്ല അതിൻ്റെ അകത്ത് പെട്ടെന്ന് ഓർ ഓൾസോ ഓൾസോ യു ആർ മൂവിങ് യു നോ യു നോട്ട് സ്റ്റേഷനറി ടു ക്യാപ്ചർ ദി തിങ് യു ജസ്റ്റ് മൂവിങ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ഈസി യാ
एवरी कंट्री इल्ले वांटिकल दे वांट टू प्रमोट टू गेट अपिक वेट टू सिस्टम तो तो ना लोगों तो इल्ले इतना आल टेस्ले या ना एटीएम वाली कंपनी तो आने और कम के बीवाईडी मारा चाइनीज कंपनी है इट्स अ बिग दैट्स अ बिगेस्ट रेट्रिक वेकल मैन्युफैक्चर आवरी पर त्रेटा ये यूरोपियन कंपनीज से ना अमेरिकन कंपनीज से बिकॉज़ दे आर कैप्चरिंग द मार्केट इन यूरोपियन यूनिट इंडिया वाला समय चला नंगला स्पेक्ट्रम आउट है ये मिया प्रोटेस्ट ये तो कह रहे हैं आप गलबान इश्यू मत कह रहे हैं शोलोज बोल रहे हैं तो लोग वहाँ में महिंद्रा का बोल रहे हैं नमला एक्चुअली वी नमला वी शुड प्रमोट आवर कंपनीज लाइक टाटा महिंद्रा आवर दैट इज़ अ न्यूज़ थैंक यू आर स्टीम गेस्ट ियेशन First, I welcome our chief guest, Sri Shamchand IFS, onto the. I welcome our chief guest, Sri Shamchand IFS, onto the stage to receive the token of our love and appreciation from Principal and Bursa. Thank you, sir, for the pre your presence in Saint Stephen's College, Uruguay. Now, may I welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Professor Mohammad Hatta, on stage. Thank you, sir, for your presence and valuable insights you shared with us. As we come to inaugural ceremony let me welcome dr jisha george convener of research cell and assistant professor in department of commerce to propose the vote of thanks honorable dignitaries on the dais respected participants dear colleagues and students qc 24 The International Conference on Sustainable Development for a Better Future aims to bring to the faculty members, students, researchers, and practitioners across the world to address pressing challenges faced by the world. As the convener of Research Cell, I am standing before you on behalf of. St Stephen's College Udaipur to propose vote of thanks to all those who have made significant contribution towards the successful organizing of this two day international conference first and foremost i would like to thank our chief guest sri shyamchand ifs who took time out and agreed to inaugurate our international conference despite of his busy schedule thank you very much sir for inaugurating the international conference in the best possible manner thank you sir at this outset i would like to thank our keynote speaker professor dr mohammad hatta who express his experience knowledge in the most interesting and informative manner thank you very much sir i express our heartfelt gratitude to our beloved principal dr stephen mathew sir who is the backbone of this international conference thank you sir for your all hearted support at this occasion i would like to thank our barsa father jins nalikatil for his ongoing support guidance and inspiration thank you further the conference coordinators dr kc thomas dr thomas matthew dr bindu baby and iqsc coordinator 
Dr. Sinsi Joseph requires a special mention for their hard work and sincere efforts for the successful organizing of this conference. Thank you. This conference is the output of the teamwork of all the staff of this college. Thank you all the organizing committee members for, their, for your sincere efforts. I also thank all the participants who make this conference a grand success. With these warm words, let me conclude my words and I wish all the participants a wonderful learning experience. Thank you. Thank you, Jisha, ma'am. We have come to the end of the official inaugural ceremony. As we embark on this journey of knowledge, exchange and collaboration, let us carry forward the spirit of dedication and hard work that has brought us together today. With that, we officially have kick-started Quesishio, the International Conference on Sustainable Development for a Better Future. Thank you all for being part of this momentous occasion. I request all the dignitaries to gather together for a photograph. And I request all the participants to raise from their seats so they can be also part of the photograph. All of you can remain seated. breaking for a tea break. I request all the participants to report back in education theatre for the second session after 10 minutes. Tea and stacks is made available for you outside this educational theatre near the hallway.
uh, here because there are seats, vacant seats. Please come and occupy these seats. I request all the students to please come forward and fill the front seats. No, no. Magle parallel is the session narakku ana. Adi arna thale. Nengal numbo to kari rige. It's my esteemed honor to introduce a luminary in the field of development economics, Dr. Rajesh Kanath. He's assistant professor and head of the Department of Business and Management Studies at the prestigious Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies. Dr. Kanath's illustrious career spans over 18 years of scholarly experience with his master's degree from University of Hyderabad and doctoral degree from Cochin University. His expertise in development economics is unparalleled. A prophetic author, Dr. Kanath has contributed nearly 60 articles to renowned national and international journals, engraving his name in the annals of academic literature. His insights have graced the pages of edited books and magazines, both in English and Malayalam, for the cementing his reputation as a thought leader. Beyond the ivory towers, Dr. Kanath's influence has resonated across India, where he has shared his wisdom as a sought-after resource person and seminar presenter. His Economics Today column in Malayalam has enlightened and enriched the understanding of economic principle among the masses. Today, Dr. Kanath will share his insight on the topic, Journey to Tomorrow, Spearheading Sustainable Development Goals via Accessible Tourism, a subject that resonates with the conference theme of promoting sustainable and inclusive growth. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride that I invite this esteemed scholar, Dr. Rajesh Kanath, to grace the second session of this international conference, Kizisho 2024, with his impeccable knowledge and profound insights. Over to you, sir. Thank you for the nice introduction. So before starting my presentation, uh, let me express my sincere thanks to the uh, management and the whole team of um, St. Stephen's College for having me here. So today, I am planning to give you a conceptual framework on sustainable development goals through accessible tourism. So morning, I think you had uh, a science session, right? So how many of you are uh, in the uh, BCom commerce students? So majority are in physics. You have physics, no? Physics and zoology. Chemistry. Commerce. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I understand that majority are uh, not from social science, right? So here, um, anyway, I'll try to present, I told you that presenting a uh, conceptual framework and uh, I'm sure that, that um, you can follow my presentation, I don't know whether you can accept or, I mean, reject, but uh, you can follow it. I have arranged it in a simple manner. So, uh, the title of this particular session, uh, seminar is Sustainable uh, Development for the Future, or something like that, right? Sustainable Development for the Better Future. Am I right? See here, um, uh, if you arrange this particular, I mean, it was, it is a recent or the 
current or up we can say that the sustainable development so if you arrange this uh, if this were in 90s it was a current during that time also this subject has got relevance and if you are arranging this seminar or that same topic even in 2050 also this will be a, um, a unique seminar why this is happening any idea or i'll put my question in a different manner actually the concept of sustainable development started uh, in 1990s precisely after the uh, bretland commission report of 1987 and in to, uh, 1992 we had rio summit and forwarded uh, followed by rio summit we had the agenda 2020 2021 then in johannesburg 2002 summit again we uh, we were we had this uh, millennium development goals and in after uh, 15 years in 2015 UN uh, gave emphasis on or the another design another concept called uh, sustainable development goals and i am pretty sure that by the year after 2030 again un will be coming up the similar development goals uh, the prime goal will be sustainable development you know why this is happening any reason for that because Uh, in uh, is today as well as in tomorrow you are going to have uh, going to listen so many sessions on sustainable development it is very easy to preach sustainability and it is very difficult to attain sustainability that is the major difference preaching is very very easy but in order to attain sustainable development individually we have to change so here in that way i am just introducing a small concept so moving on to my topic here this time the goal of sustainable development 2020 if you carefully watch that goal to end poverty and hunger in all the forms and dimensions to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity equality and healthy environment by 2030 and earlier versions of sustainable development where we gave much more emphasis on human development and as well as the environmental sustainability but apart from that when it is coming to the 2015 or we are in 2024 we are thinking much on the concept called dignity equality and more or less a healthy environment then here i wish to introduce a certain kind of people uh, no uh, generally they are known as vulnerable people so who are the people generally called as vulnerable so i i don't want to go to the details here among the vulnerable people i wish to take only one category that is called people with disabilities and technically we call at present the political uh, uh, correctness because of the political correctness we are using it is uh, not disabled differently abled uh, people i'll show in order to for a better clarification i'll show a small video can you can you minimize it just a minute this hall is looking like a multiplex theater this is the first time i am addressing a crowd like a, a hall something like this okay so you are all lucky uh, so i thought of showing you a small film okay but let's go video okay sound is there
sorry we are not considering the disabled for the auditions you are mistaken the performer is him my brother i am here just to cheer I'm not disabled. I'm differently abled. So what you understood overall? Ability is different. Disability is something different, right? Then why I showed this uh, video means Basically, you just imagine how our society is considering these disabled people. I hope majority of, uh, almost of, uh, all of you are belong to Kerala, right? Malayalis. Here, we are calling, we are, in order to identify a particular person, we have some names, right? Even though these people, they have names, we are calling them with their disability. I'll give you a popular example. There is a movie called Kunyi Konan. Uh, many of you might have watched that movie, right? So that is a disability part and if a particular person is having any problem with his own leg or something like that, we used to call him as Chattukal or something like that, depends upon the locality, that name or the uh, that usage will be different. So have you ever think of, actually it is our duty to include all those people. And disability here, uh, I have shown only one video that is only the regarding blind. And disability is totally a different concept. I'll give you one more uh, video. So films are over, now we can move to this presentation. Then, excuse me, can you? next slide.
So here I just want to mention about our attitude, how we are considering the disabled people. While entering this college, I was just thinking whether if a I mean, disabled person is there, how he can move into the a college. Even not only the, I mean, the problem is not with this particular college, almost all institutions across India, across especially in Kerala as well as in India, the foreigners are much far ahead in this case. So, we are not considering, even our bus, train, everywhere, there is no ramp. We are not considering the disabled people. Suppose a one disabled person, if he want to enter this particular stage, then also it is not easy. So, it is not our problem, our society never consider or uh, such a group of people. So, they are special, but unfortunately, they are all excluded from our um, day-to-day -day thinking, even from our life. Then, uh, European, here we are talking about diversity or equity or inclusion. At the same time, we must know that there are European countries, like even uh, European Union, even in uh, uh, like uh, United States, they reach the area or reach the point called belongingness. So, we have to reach that particular level than the equity. Even now also we are talking about equity or diversity or whatever it is. But what I am trying to say is that we should reach that point where we they have to feel that they are all belonging to the same group. So, here I just put two or three, uh, two pictures. Then you can see that the discrimination. In knowingly or unknowingly, we are also part of this particular problem. Then uh, you can see that in, in next time onwards, if you go anywhere, you just think whether that particular building or organization is providing facility for the disabled people. And why I am talking too much about this disability means in the uh, altogether in world, around 15 percentage of the people are with different types of disabilities. And there is a particular problem with the disability that that disability may increase over the time. So. Uh, if we are getting much more late, that we are uh, denying their um, chances to enjoy the life properly. So it may the uh, the disability may increase over the time. So um, here, what we can do? So I am a person I'm, uh, conducted research in tourism. So here, what my point is that. Uh, I am just trying to connect this disability part as well as with um, tourism. The, I'll come to that uh, concept. Then, uh, I hope all of you are familiar with the concept called tourism. Today morning, I just saw one um, write-up uh, write by uh, Murali Tumarakudi and he was asking about the, I hope you might be knowing him, right? I think he's supposed to uh, attend this seminar. I have seen his uh, photo in the um, I think the initial time uh, they sent me a brochure, I, I have seen his photos. So he asked a question, how we uh, count the tourist number in Kerala? Because he had some confusion with the uh, uh, foreigners arrival in Kerala, something like that. So the tourist means a person who is traveling to a particular destination and he is staying there. At least he has to spend that particular destination for 24 hours, minimum 24 hours. So if you travel, uh, today morning I came from Eranagulam to this Ullavur. So I cannot or you cannot consider me as a tourist. I am just a visitor because I am not going to stay here. If you are staying in the registered uh, accommodation units, then your name will be accounted as tourist. So here uh, after... Uh, uh, world was second countries especially developing countries consider tourism as an engine for growth and they have implemented so many activities to promote tourism uh, tourism in their countries so what happened was as a result by 1980s there took place a, a, a period called uh, mass tourism tourist flow was very very high during 1980s then Again, this sustainable development or the uh, 
the world was thinking in another direction so we have to control the tourism something like that so that was the connection with the sustainability and the tourism so if you look at the literature of sustainable tourism always we are talking about like economic sustainability uh, so many uh, rosy concepts are there like a green tourism eco tourism responsible tourism all these can be connected under this so called sustainable uh, tourism so here even though we are talking to uh, too much about sustainable tourism the sustainability uh, so far included as i told you that environmental sustainability economic sustainability and the socio cultural sustainability even that time also we are not in a position to think about a uh, subsequent market size people or a, a special category of people called disabled people so it is our duty as a social concern it is our duty to include each and every person to um, they have to or we have to uh, consider them or we have to include them along with us in throughout our uh, each and every uh, activity so that concept is called uh, accessible tourism or disabled tourism so here the disabled tourism or accessibility means uh, of um, that activity that provides accessibility of mobility hearing visual cognitive or intellectual and psycho social disabilities including the elderly and people with temporary disabilities to all disabilities and non disabled people this is the acceptable definition for such um, accessible or disabled tourism then uh, many countries even in china i told you about european countries as well as us but even in china cambodia all of them are practicing these pictures are from cambodia and uh, accessible tourism and uh, accessible uh, tourism is considered one of the uh, most important concept even in social uh, inclusion so that is what unfortunately that missed in the um, slide then this is what i am trying to present uh, since beginning that here we have a sustainable development goals and there are like uh, 17 goals are there starting from sustainable uh, development goal 1 then here uh, uh, then 1 4 8 um, 10 etc 17 goals are there if you uh, closely watched or uh, refer the sustainable tourism uh, sorry sustainable development document or sustainable tourism goals of 2015 only three places where it was mentioned about tourism that is in uh, uh, sdg 8 10 and um, 13 but if we promote sustainable development more than that i feel then we can include apart from that we can include or we can connect many other aspect of sustainability that is what i have mentioned here this is a simple conceptual model based on your imagination you can elaborate this particular model and while promoting accessible tourism here it offers an uh, economic opportunities because in management terms we are uh, trying to tap a particular uh, component called uh, niche market because they are special so nobody is entering into that particular segment so uh, we can have a uh, we can consider it as a niche market naturally there is a scope for economic opportunities then enhancing the experience for travelers then naturally uh, it uh, gave much emphasis on environmental environmental sustainability then naturally that is an empowering uh, both the local uh, and the uh, disabled communities that is an empowerment even the local communities also that is an empowerment because for the successful practice of accessible tourism we need the overall help of all people including the local communities then if you promote accessible tourism we can uh, preserve and showcase our cultural diversities so uh, altogether so my conceptual model says that if you promote accessible tourism on the one hand we can meet the goals uh, prop, um, uh, 
proposed by sustainable development goal at the same time it gives an, uh, an adequate source or adequate um, solution for inclusive tourism development model and then uh, moving to the some practical experiences if you uh, look at the um, accessible tourism in india um, in the agra is the one place known for accessible tourism where the taj mahal and other uh, historical monuments have the got the facilities to accommodate all kinds of people but uh, except that even delhi metro the, it is with the uh, um, facilities that can accommodate disabled people and now that concept is uh, in india it is getting much more uh, people are much more aware of such needs so that changes are there but we are far behind comparing the rest of the nations so why it is important again uh, our population if you take the population around 2.68 crore of indians that was in 2011 that number might have increased are uh, in india they are considered as disabled citizens and this at the same time in kerala that percentage is almost similar 2.6 percentage of our total population is uh, around 3.4 crore people so we, uh, there are disabled people in india across even in kerala also we have disabled citizens so in order to accommodate all people so we have to encourage what we call the accessible tourism facilities across our cities or in another way we have to uh, say that we have to uh, uh, redesign our existing tourism facilities in order to accommodate all these people and then actually kerala was the yeah uh, one state in india we declared accessible tourism uh, destination in the year 2019 that we are uh, the government agreed that we will be providing accessible uh, people with disabilities and elderly by the year 2019 declaration was there and he uh, actually we have taken some initiatives for that we have received some international uh, awards also then um, in kerala altogether 66 destinations are rated or according to official statistics they are all uh, 66 destinations are with them accessible tourism facilities this these are the destinations available in Kerala with accessible tourism facilities. I'll then, what do you mean by accessible tourism facilities in Kerala? There is a saying that statistical or official estimations are there, reality is there. I am now I am talking about the official conditions or the statistical part. So here, if we have accessible toilet then uh, we can call it as accessible toilet means uh, the there will be special arrangements for disabled people then pathway then ramps then um, uh, yeah these are the statistics that we observed from uh, a particular destination i'll come to that and uh, then touch screen kiosk then normal wheelchair and signage if we have all these seven uh, components or seven facilities in a particular destination we can call that particular destination as an access uh, accessible tourism destinations and we have conducted one study to check this particular uh, system is working or not in order to understand how uh, effective i mean access efficient accessible tourism facilities are there so uh, i have a scholar she is basically uh, a deaf so she is working on this particular subject and we conducted one uh, small case study at uh, a place called alikod monakal uh, beach where it was very difficult to get uh, what we call the sample because we were uh, finding out uh, trying to find out some uh, disabled people and um, altogether we conducted a study it is not yet published we have sent it for publication some of the observations from that findings is, is 
one is the people basically they are satisfied with um, ramp facilities then where accessible rain shelters are there wheelchair accessibility is there but uh, tourists are uh, that uh, pathway are not that much efficient that means in the particular locality there are certain breaks officially there are pathways but there are certain breaks then so what we understood that the individuals with the different types of disabilities such as locomotor vision and hearing impairments suggesting that tailored amenities and communication support services are vital for enhancing communication support sir sorry tailored amenities and communication support services are vital for enhancing overall accessibility and satisfaction during uh, tourism experiences but the major problem is then uh, technically or officially though there are why we have selected this uh, uh, thrissur adikode munakkal beach was thrissur district is known as one of the better district uh, in the accessible tourism uh, literature so out of that thrissur districts this is the one of the non um, accessible tourism destination that is why we have selected this particular destination but even though the, the maintenance part was uh highly insufficient and they don't have, we couldn't find out sufficient number of trained staff in that particular uh, locality and uh, again uh, the disabled people they need i told you in the beginning that disability means they have to get proper information because some people are uh, blind or some people are deaf so we have to provide somehow we have to provide accurate information unfortunately such facilities are also less in that particular destination so what i am trying to say is then see ideally sustainable tourism uh, sustainable development or the uh, accessible tourism can promote sustainable development but here in kerala we have launched certain initiatives unfortunately uh, we have to cross or we have to uh, travel a lot towards that direction technically we have launched all such facilities but in practically we are far behind in reaping the correct benefit of sustainable development okay that is all about from my presentation so now you can ask me any questions i am happy to give you my reply So if anyone wants to ask him any questions or do you need if uh, any more clarifications you can please ask Thank you so much for the presentation it was very good um I just wanted to understand so from the presentation it's very clear that Kerala has taken a lot of interventions to uh, enable you know um um tourism accessible tourism i just wanted to understand if kerala has also taken steps or any interventions to enable responsible tourism yeah it is there uh, kerala has taken so many steps not only in responsible tourism even in eco tourism and uh, every initiatives are there initiatives are there but how far it is practiced is the question mm -hmm. same as accessible tourism we have officially 66 destinations are there but in some of the destinations nothing is there only name is there name sake reforms are there that is not the solution for uh, sustainable development so what would be you know some examples of providing I'm, for a response i am working in the government sector so i have some restrictions okay i have shown you na uh, that um, let's Maybe I missed the, that part. I came in a bit late. 
uh, how can I, uh, 66 destinations are there. Okay. And that destination was the best destination out of the 66 destinations. And even that destination also, there are so many issues. Then you can just imagine what about the situation in other destinations. In many of the destinations, nothing is there to see. But according to official uh, documents, all those things are termed as accessible tourism destinations. So but this is ground, what I said in the beginning that mm. preaching is very easy, practicing is, practicing is totally different and difficult. And for that we need to have a will. Okay, I think you are satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Susan Abraham. Uh, I think uh, yeah, from your presentation, what I've understood is that uh, when it comes to accessible tourism, what uh, the mindset of Kerala generally is that uh, if you provide ramp facility or facility for using wheelchairs, then your concept of accessible tourism has been achieved. Uh, at least that is what I've understood from your presentation. Am I right in that aspect? Yeah, because it, when exactly. you have people with, uh, who are deaf or who are blind, uh, how do they, uh, how, how, what accessible facilities can you provide for them? I think that is very low in the list of priorities. Exactly. I, uh, yeah, okay, I just wanted to. Thank you. And any more questions? One problem, I think uh, the market is very, very less. In the globalized era, everyone is looking at the market. Here we can consider it as a niche market. And unfortunately, it is not a developed. And in everywhere, if one particular destination is uh, arranging such a facility, that is not a solution because the bus and train and the entire buildings, what you said is exactly right. So, uh, nowhere it is disabled friendly. So that is the one major challenge. So now the colleges, they have to construct one lift and other things if the government uh, college is having two-storied or three-storied uh, because otherwise they won't get the NAC accreditation because the main purpose is uh, if you want to get the NAC accreditation, you have to set up a lift. The purpose is meant for uh, men. That lift is meant for the disabled people. But... Uh, yeah, that ramps, the construction of ramps, all what we call in Malayalam, we can call it as a Vadibad, um, there is a word, no? It is almost something like that. Sir, I have a doubt. <coughs> uh, I'd like to know what are the steps taken by the state government with regard to privatization of tourism. Uh, this is an indirect question to uh, sustainability. Uh, what I have felt is that uh, it is the pure uh, nationalization of the tourism that is in the being in the government sector is the sole reason for the I won't say pathetic but for the poor uh, state of tourism in Kerala. Actually in uh, Kerala tourism, tourism uh, government is doing a, just a catalyst role. They are not doing uh, even though they are running some uh, hotels under KTDC and all, uh, government is not a major player in tourism development. And now they are openly encouraging the private players into this market. So it is not a nationalized style. In Kerala, uh, even in Kerala also, private players are playing the main, private sectors are playing the major role. That is the another issue with the accessible tourism because when the private sector, they are looking for the market, they are looking for the people. Accessibility tourism, altogether in Kerala, 10 lakh uh, people are there with uh, different types of uh, disabilities so they are they may not be much more interested to uh, encourage them but it is the duty of the state to interfere in the market uh, sir, without you, state uh, intervention yeah. i don't think that accessible tourism that accessibility is possible have you felt that uh, privatization is a good way for attaining 10 percent uh, sustainability in tourism no did i say that uh, no no have, have you felt uh, no, no. Uh, See, think. basically, I support privatization to a certain extent. Not fully. Because if you, uh, there are so many examples, you just go to the uh, Kochi city, you can see how they are utilizing that uh, nearby lake and other things. So, I didn't say that. 
but in uh, being an economics person, uh, to certain extent, I support privatization. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. Anyone else? So we are wrapping this up. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time and effort and also for your vital knowledge and perspectives that you've shared with us today. And once again, I thank you on behalf of St. Stephen's College. Thank and you all. Thank you. Now it's time for lunch break. The lunch will be served in uh, Charigod Hall. And everyone has to assemble back here sharply at 1.30. And you have washroom facilities near library and media room. Uh, physics department which is on the top floor and also in your chemistry department so once again it's time for lunch break and thank you all next session at 1 30 is an invited talk by doctor dr jose chatukulam to introduce you to uh, professor dr jose chatukulam in the previous session, you would have noticed how uh, academically brilliant he is because uh, he, could, uh, he could actually go through all the different topics. He could handle all the versatile topics. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce you, uh, him to you people. Professor Dr. Jos Chathakulam is a former professor of Sri Ramakrishna Headgate Chair on Decentralization and Development Institute for Social and Economic Change, <laughs> Bangalore, and currently Director, Center for Rural Management, Kotem, and a na national level expert on decentralized governance and rural development. He has wide fieldwork experience throughout the country, and he is associated with several consultative committees of the National Ministry of Rural Development and Ministry of Panjaiti Raj, Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. He also has an equally good record of publications, and he has publications in various uh, journals. <coughs> and uh, he was one of the key organizers of the People's Plan campaign in Kerala and Gram Panchayat Development Plan in other states in India. He had administered and evaluated 176 projects covering different parts of the world, including Nuba Mountains in South Kurdofan, Sudan, he has done extensive research on decentralization and local governance across the Indian states, Latin America and Africa. And he is an expert of devolution index, which is used to compare the rate of decentralization across the Indian states. Recently, he has co-edited two books, Challenges to Local Governance in the Pan Pandemic Era, Perspectives from South Asia and Beyond, and Deepening Democracy, Comparative Perspectives on Decentralization, Cooperativism, and Self-Managed Development. With this brief introduction, I would like to uh, hand over the session. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Nice of you. Just I will check it that there is OK, fine. Ah, OK. Yeah, really, I'm very happy uh, to come here to deliver a, a very serious uh, topic. But uh, this is a very simple uh, presentation on my side. I also would like to thank uh, your uh, respected teacher of this particular college for giving her nice words and introducing me. What I will try, um, I will try to talk to both English and Malayalam. That will be. Yeah, convenient for me and uh, convenient for the students. I think some people may be from outside the state also what I told. See, this is actually localizing sustainable development goals. You all heard about what is the sustainable development goals, STD. Uh, the, the, the issue is that there you see the prime minister of our country, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi, or the prime minister or president of any of the, uh, the countries in the world, they can have make an a see signature and agreement and for the sustainable development goals, STD goals. But the real problem is that there, when really we want to achieve the sustainable development goals, my point is that there is something we have to do at the local level. 
Local level means a local level where we are staying at the local level. A local level in your college also. I am, I am here. It is a very, very uh, see, reputed college uh, under the Mahatma Gandhi University or in the state. Here my submission is that there if you want to attain the sustainable development goals, definitely lot of things you have to do at your college level. A lot of things we have to do at our village, even our parish, our temple administration, even our household and at the individual level. That is what they are, the localizing. That means you try to localize the sustainable development goals at different levels at the local level. Individual level, family level, neighborhood level, education institutions, whatever may be. That is actually the meaning of local sustainable, localizing sustainable development STD. And this is actually some of the narratives from Kerala. I have taken only a few cases. Yeah. Now, you have a clarity on the sustainable development goals localized in the international level, in the national level, we have a concept that we have in our level, in our college, in our family, in our parish, in our neighborhood, in our individual level, try to do that. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So I will go there. So that is actually the, the, the localizing sustainable development goals. Okay, fine. Yeah. See, we look into that there. Sustainable development goals are prescribed as the answer to address the development challenges in various countries, including India. We all know that there, our country is also a signatory of the SDD 2030 and has offered its strong commitment. And internationally, we have a very good reputation in the sense that there, we have a very strong commitment as far as the SDD is concerned. We can see that there we have a lot of national level, the national level flagship programs and national development and that we actually very correlated, interconnected with the, that we can reflected in the sustainable development goals. You see that there in the India, at the, at the national level and at the provincial or state level, we have number of flagship programs and that uh, flagship programs, you see the guidelines, the operational details of the flagship programs, that flagship programs, we can see that there, the STD main, uh, the, the objective of the STD is also reflected in the sustainable, in the, our flagship programs. See, what is actually the, the actually the flagship programs, you take the MGNREJ, Narega, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. The National Employment Guarantee Scheme is designed in such a fashion we can see that there, some of the sustainable development goals are already inbuilt in our uh, sustain, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. We have a number of flagship programs and each pro uh, flagship programs, we can see that there the, the objectives of the STD is inbuilt, is grafted in such a fashion. That is what there, for instance, say the flagship programs of the government of India, such as I already mentioned that their national, uh, the national nutrition mission, national health Pro, uh, protection scheme. And we have the aspirational district and very recently our prime minister inaugurated the, the aspirational blocks also in some, in some blocks in Kerala also under that aspirational blocks programs. How the potential to address the challenges highlighted in the sustainable goals. The centrally sponsored programs, I already mentioned that they are the, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. You, you, you know that there are a lot of women folks are working at the Panjayat level under the National Employment Schemes are directly or indirectly aligned with the sustainable development goals. Yeah, with the principle of you all talked about the cooperative federalism, uh, the states are primarily stakeholders in ensuring the success that we have to examine. Localization of STD is a, center, is, the, is a central importance in ensuring the success. What I already mentioned that there, if you want to achieve the sustainable development goals, we have to localize the sustainable development goals. That is actually the very important. STD goals needs to be translated into policies and local levels. See, that is what we have to do there. It is not at the international level 
ഓക്കെ ഫൈൻ സ്റ്റേ നാഷണൽ ലെവൽ ഈസ് ഓക്കെ ഫൈൻ സ്റ്റേറ്റ് ലെവൽ ബട്ട് റിയലി വാട്ട് ഈസ് ആപ്പൻ ദർ വി ഹാവ് ടു ട്രാൻസ്ലേറ്റ് ദ മേജർ ഐഡിയ ആൻഡ് വിഷൻ ഓഫ് ദി സസ്റ്റൈനബിൾ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് ഗോൾസ് ഇൻ അവർ ലോക്കൽ ലെവൽ See, this is actually attempts to localize STDs in India. We all know that there now we have Nidhi Ayog. Earlier it was known as the Planning Commission. Uh, the, the Nodal Agency for Coordinating and Monitoring the Sustainable Development Goals in India. We have Nidhi, Nidhi Ayog in Delhi. Nidhi Ayog periodically conduct reviews on STD adoption and reach out the states and union territory. Nidhi Ayog is actually a think tank. of the country is concerned and the nidhi ayog actually what happened they used to uh, monitor and conduct serious reviews what is happening in each state how much they have succeeded to address the sustainable development goals <coughs> first document 2080 the nidhi ayog released very important document it is known as sustainable development goals india index baseline report 2080 STD India index another one 2020 20 20 uh, 2020 it is not 2000 uh, 01 2021 2021 is a mistake actually so this will be available in the internet you just click that there uh, the STD India index baseline report 2080 and after that there are a few reports you will get that there what is a picture as far as the india is concerned how much we have succeeded things there the std india index is a single measurable index to map the progress of states and union territories towards 2030 sdds it's a document the progress made by the states and union territories towards implementing the uh, std at uh, 2030 and target nidhi ayog published a report also localizing std early lessons from 2090 apart from that Uh, the nidhi ayog also published an important document that is what the localizing the sustainable development goals early lessons from a, a 2090 you see you see that there how much serious this country is uh, in uh, in actually getting the success under the sdgs that is why these two important documents some of you can just click that there the nidhi ayog then you will get that their publications you just click that there the std india index or the localizing sdds early lessons you will get lot of interesting information on things there okay yeah attempt to localize again uh, the same thing they are localize std in india for nidhi ayog localization in terms of std refer as a process of recognizing sub national level context see national level we know that there at the at the delhi level we say national all all the countries but sub national means uh, kerala is uh, under uh, the national like so sub national things there tamil nadu karnataka and all things there we have a national questions and sub national level means at the at the state level nidhi ayog assert the sub national government especially those at state play an important role so the point is that they are based on the std india index baseline report uh, 1980 and localizing std early lessons i already mentioned that they are 9020 nidhi ayog focus on localizing localization is limited to state and union territories and to some extent at the district level it only refers limited attention to the on the significance of the localization of std at the grassroots level you see my first critic is that there you see these two documents the point is that there these documents talks localization of std means at the state level that is what there the, the nidhi ayog is concerned but in some uh, context they mentioned about at the district level but the point is that there we, we all know that there at the district level uh, uh we we see state level and district level is not going to address the and their problem we have to say that there what is sub district level what is at the grassroots level what i mentioned that there uh, at the at the village level at the individual level at the household level so the point is that there the nidhi ayog document has certain limitations in the sense that there only limited attention it has it made the localization of std at the grassroots level you know where is the grassroots is with us at the at the grassroots level at our locality level 
No evaluation and assessment on the present status and performance of localize, localizing STD at the grassroots level has been attempted. There are only passive references in the localization of STD at the grassroots level involving local government. Local government means very particularly what is happening in the Grama Panchayat. Nidhyayog focus is largely on the subnational government, what I mentioned at the state level, rather than the local government. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Empowering local government is one of the solid strategies for ensuring community ownership, integration and localization of STD at the grassroots level. We all know that there our constitution has recognized the fact that their decentralization is the answer for some of the major problems as far as the country is concerned. Because of that, our constitution also made that the local justice and local economic development in consultation with the people, then only we can address the issues. So, 29 subjects, you know that there are 29 major subjects are already with the local government, at the Panjayat, Panjayat Raj institutions at the, at the village Panjayat. <coughs> and some other subjects are with our municipalities and corporations, it is there. That is what they are, the local government. Many of the STD targets are within the purview of these functions listed in the constitution. You see constitution in the Indian constitution in the 11th schedule, we see that there, there are a number of subjects. But I mentioned that there as far as the Panjayat are concerned, 29 subjects and 18 subjects are with the urban local government. But these subjects are also the subjects related to the STD uh, goals. That is what they are. So the, we have a ministry at the Delhi, uh, Delhi level. It is one of the ministry of Panjayat Raj. MOPR means Ministry of Panjayat Raj has been advocated to integrate STD, Sustainable Development Goals, with GPDP. GPDP means Grama Panjaita Development Plan. You see that there, uh, I, my request is that there are some of you, you can go to your nearby Panjayat. Ujavur, you have a Grama Panjayat. And you go to the Grama Panjayat and you ask to Grama Panjayat President and the functionaries, they will give a clear picture to you. As far as STD is concerned, we are discussing sustainable development goals in this college. And early morning, we started on talking on STD, sustainable development goals. We all feel that there is a very uh, kind of academic topic and we are discussing here. But my suggestion and request is that there you go to the Grama Panjayat. Ask the Grama Panjayat president what is this. Grama Panjayat president will teach you. These are the sustainable goals as far as we are concerned. And we are doing all our activities uh, to address the sustainable development goals. And in your panjayat, also have an important document. It is known as GPDP, Grama Panjayat Development Plan. They have prepared a plan. And that plan is known as the Grama Panjayat Development Plan. So that Grama Panjayat Development Plan, you can see that there all the sustainable development goals are directly or indirectly, it is there in the uh, GPDP. That is what there. Okay. <coughs> yeah. GPDP process supported by the Ministry of Panjayat has created a conducive atmosphere, a condition, a conduct, see, uh, the conducive atmosphere and condition for the Grama Panjayat to integrate the STD in the development action plan. Yeah, they have a particular uh, agenda for doing that. You see, this is important. Attempt to localize uh, the STD, STD goals. Out of these 17 STD goals, what we, ca we can see that the Ministry of Panjayat Raj at the Delhi level has identified 13, 1, 3 uh, goals, sustainable development goals, where it could intervene at the grassroots level. Those selected STDs are. These are the uh, yeah, 13 STDs, number goal 1, no poverty, zero hunger, you can read that their good health and well-being, quality ed education, uh, quality, equality, uh, no, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, clean affordable energy. You see, morning I got a chance to chair one of the technical sessions. Uh, in that technical session there were actually four presentations. 
If you ask me, can you put that presentations under the Sustainable Development Goals? I can say that there the first paper presentation uh, topic was something on the one party and one fish farming in Kuttanad. That topic you give to me and you ask me there, how can you integrate with the Sustainable Development Goals that particular topic? I can say that they are out of no poverty. That, that actually no poverty, that is what the development, uh, GP, uh, the, the uh, development goal, sustainable development goals one. It is that very much there, that project is for addressing uh, the issue of poverty, addressing the issue of hunger and good health and well-being and number of things, things there. So in your college also you can say that their number of STD goals are also involved in the entire process of this college, you can say that their quality education, you can say that their gender quality, uh, yeah, reduce inequalities, decent work. So the, my point is that there, when, when you people can work that they're out of the 17 STD goals, how many STD goals are already, you are going to address directly or indirectly. For any action you can relate with the uh, sustainable development goals. That is what they're, as far as the local government, the panchayat are concerned, these are these issues they have taken and they have started addressing things. I will give you some concrete examples on some panchayats. Yeah. <coughs> this actually expert group has prepared a uh, yeah, report on the local, localization of uh, uh, sustainable development goals in the PRIs means panchayat raj institutions. Uh, it already pr gives, a pr uh, gives a framework for localizing the implementation of sustainable development goals through capacitating local governments. That is an important point, you see, capacitating local government. I already mentioned that there, we have a Grama Panjayat in here in this locality. But what we have to do there, the Ministry of Panjayat Raj and other institutions, what they did, they have given certain kind of a capacity building and training. It is known as C, C B and T. C for capacity, B for building, T for training, C, B and T. That is what there is the capacitization. So sometimes what happens, some expert has to come in your college. So you can, they can also give some kind of a directions. You do some activity, then we can address the sustainable development goals. So the point is that there in your prestigious college, this college, your panjayat, your locality, your household at the individual level, we, when we are trying to address the sustainable development goals, you take the summation of all together. Because of this confidence only, our Prime Minister declared that they are okay, we are also signatory and we are going to address sustainable development goals 20 and 30. So, this is what there, we all have a major role to do with that there. This is what the importance. Yeah. Here, Kila, I already mentioned that there, Kila, Kerala Institute of Local Administrator giving training to the, uh, to the local government. Even you people also request that there are some of the Kila experts will come and give a training to you. That is what there I mentioned, the capacity building and training. They have actually, they have actually constructed a center for a, a sustainable development goals and local government. It has prepared a draft local indicator framework incorporating the, the sustainable development goals and subsystems. Yeah. We, we all know that there, and by, by introducing uh, the giving, see, introducing, uh, yeah, my activities, it mentioned that the decentralized plan campaign, Kerala, which has 25 years of experience in the planning and decentralization efforts, and the best opportunity uh, for localizing sustainable development goals. I would like to say that there in Kerala is the best, uh, the best suited state and environment for, uh, for, for introducing the concept of localizing the sustainable development goals. Yeah. What actually I did, I have taken a two, two small grama panjaya, they did not get a chance to go to your panjaya, otherwise I would have taken some data from this panjaya, but my uh, samples from one is from, uh, see, from Chelakara, is a Trichur uh, panjaya. Another panjaya is uh, Nellanad from uh, Tiruvandavaram district. These two panjaya I have taken, I collected some data. I examined that there, this is actually some rhetoric, means some kind of a demand, people used to say, uh, like politicians, but we have to see whether this document 
But there the sustainable development goal is there. I have gone to these two panjayat. One panjayat in Trishur in Chelakara, another panjayat in, in Tiwandra. And I have uh, see, made some kind of inquiries whether this is there or not. Yeah. This is actually one panjayat I have taken from the Trishur district and another panjayat from the, um, uh, from the Tiruvanduvaram. And we can examine there the sustainable development goal is there as far as these two panjayat are there or not. Yeah. You see the basic statistics of one panjayat, which are the, the Tiwandram, Nelinad panjayat I have taken. So the, the, the point is that there uh, is actually a panjayat, is a women headed panjayat. And the OSR means, uh, you know what is OSR? OSR means own resource, own source, own source revenue. That panjayat is so powerful in the sense that there are panjayat could generate own income is 1.9 crore rupees. If I go to UP or Bihar or some other Indian states, I say that there are ground panjayat in Kerala could mobilize this much of amount as own resource, OSR, own source revenue. It is difficult to believe that panjayat, but this is a situation there. You can see this is the case, the total, total project and everything is there. But you see that there, this panjayat is uh, headed by um, women, women headed panjayat. And the political, uh, we know that they are in Kerala, all the panjayat are, are, are politically constituted. And this panjayat, the particular panjayat is a Congress dominated panjayat, the, the UDF. I have taken two panjayat, one from the LDF and one from the UDF. If I take two UDF panjayat, people may say that there, this is only applicable in the UDF panjayat. If I take two LDF panjayat, because of that, some other reasons I have taken these two panjayat. We say what is there. Yeah, you see that there, the, the linkage with the sustainable development goals. These are uh, killer did work organizing, they have organized workshop, consultations, training, awareness programs, campaign, prepared full support. Killer have given a full support. I already mentioned that there are a local indicator framework for operationalized of this kind of exercise. Uh, prepared a vision document. I have gone to the panjayat that panjayat prepared a vision document to implement six key programs in tune with the sustainable development goals with a common uh, tag line. It is known as Nellanad Nallanad. Something they have to tell to the people so that they have find out a slogan or whatever may be there, Nellanad Nallanadu. Nallanad is a land of well-being. Uh, no such a, a tagline I have seen in the other panjayat. So this is what they are, the panjayat they need a lot of work, preliminary work for that. But actually what happened, unfortunately, we academicians and we students and we teachers, we are fully not aware of what is happening in the panjayat. We are talking the sustainable development goals in here. But go to the, uh, the, the village panjayat, they also will talk. And sometimes some village panjayat may, sometimes the, this, this, uh, whatever ground panjayat the president will talk, and he would have been invited him. I think he would have been uh, talked in a better fashion than me. Maybe presented in a better fashion. That kind of understanding they have generally. Yeah. You see, I have taken these, these the panjayat programs. I have seen that their program number one from the panjayat document they prepared. They have a Mukta Nelinad. They have a project, particular project. Uh, it is known as solid waste and liquid, liquid waste free, liquid waste free Nalinar. I asked the Panjayat president that day, Madam, you tell me why you prepared this, this particular project? What is the philosophy in it? Why you prepared that? She said, look, these are things. My that project is going to address good health and well-being. This, this sustainable development goes free. I'm going to address through this project. Whenever I go to field work, what I used to there, I don't say that I'm an expert. Sometimes what I will do, I came here, I don't know anything. You tell me, madam, why you did? Then she started teaching me. Okay, this is a case there. She only said that this is a case. You say clean water and sanitation. Climate action. Then I asked, what is climate action? She said, you will look in the, you are not aware of what is that. You see the sustainable development goals. You take the sustainable development goal 13, there is something on the climate action. I said, yes, as a student, I have taken my book, I have noted it, things there. I want to know that their house is competent. Capacitization has taken place. 
I, you see, lot of exercise they did. That is why they prepared this, this program number one, consisting of number of projects and put together. And she thought, this is the case there. You see the another one, comprehensive watershed development. I said, why comprehensive watershed development, development project? She said, no poverty. Uh, again, clean water and sanitation is the kind of correlations. You know what is watershed? Yeah. Vidya Velicham, enlightenment through education. No poverty. I asked her how it is related to no poverty. She could explain directly or indirectly. Uh, quality of education, reduce inequalities. Yeah, Panjayat level Sahitya Academy. I thought that there how is going to link with the Sahitya Academy things to the sustainable development goals. Then she said, look into that, their good health and well-being. That is what their people have more, more, more kind of a, a see, more, uh, more understanding, more literary activities. That will finally, uh, their mental health, it is related to this. This is the way what they did it there. Panjai Sports Council, again, good health and well-being. Labor hub and an and, and, and Employment platform, again she tried to link all the things, industry, innovation and infrastructure. You go to state government, state government say, say that there is something different. But they have a program, they have a project to address these kind of issues. You talk to Delhi and have a discussion with the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi will say that there, I have introduced this, this, this particular flagship program. Why? Because to address these number of sustainable development goals. That is what I mentioned that there we have at the national level, we have at the state level, sub-state sub level, even at the grassroots level. You can go and examine what is happening in your own panchayat. Yeah. Tunnel. Another, another one is their shadow of for senior citizens. They have a particular project in that panchayat. You take the another one, what I mentioned about Chalakara Panjayat. You see, this Panjayat is also handled by a woman. And this Panjayat also, oils are also 1.5 1 crore, one and a half crore rupees. Uh, total number of projects and all things there. This is a political, present political regime. It's actually a CPM dominated Panjayat in Trichur. What I have seen in the Tiwandra, and they could, uh, the, they could do a little bit of kind of localizing the STD sustainable development goals. But what, what is happening in the another Grama Panjayat in the Trichur in Chalakara? Yeah. They have a project name, Health for All. And these are the sustainable development goals. Because of that, they have a, uh, they developed a project known as the Health for All. Energy for Solar Panel. This project I have not seen in um, uh, Nelanad. But it, is, it actually dif differ from Panjayat to Panjayat. Number of reasons for that is a climate action, and here that there are seven affordable uh, clean energy. That is what the solar panel. How they prepare a plan, a plan in the panchayat? Panchayat has given a project in the sense that they are in our panchayat. Institutions are going for a solar panel. We will give this much of subsidy. Individual level household people, if they go for a solar panel. For Panjayat fund, we will give this much of subsidy. Then I asked why you are giving subsidy to solar panel for installing solar, solar panel. Then she started talking about this electricity and all things there. Solar is the case there. We can reduce the, 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 uh, the, the emission of carbon dioxide. And that is nothing but the affordable clean energy, solar energy. That is what the, it is there in the sustainable development goals. You see, sustainable development goals at the international level, how it is taking and translate into the local language and local action in a Grama Panjai. This is the way what they did. Again, they also have a Malinya Mukta, Chalakara, solid and liquid waste. We have already seen the another thing also there. Fitness and days for women. <coughs> Number of Grama Panjai or municipalities, they have started the, these are fitness and days uh, for women. These are the gender equality. When you talk about gender equality, so the point is that there we can talk to gender equality, but the point is that there how to localize the gender equality at the panchayat level. She said, 
I started a fitness center where the women folks are coming to attend the, uh, to do certain kind of exercise. Otherwise, they don't get a chance for that. This is nothing but I am fulfilling, I am addressing the issue of uh, the, the, the gender equality. You come to your college, ask to the principal, how in your college, uh, the, 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 the gender equality, how to there, and what type of gender uh, friendly atmosphere in the entire college. You know that there you have a separate toilet, you have a separate uh, place, uh, you have a privacy, lot of things there. That all introduced in this college, and by introducing that, we are addressing the sustainable development goals. That is what the localizing the sustainable development goals. They have a mini industrial stage, and uh, she could, that Punjab president should link all the things, uh, industries, innovations, and uh, infrastructure kind of issues. Child friendly Panjayat, again, gender, gender, gender equality. Yeah. Protection of water bodies, yeah. There are still, there are some challenges. So my point is that there, I have taken only two panjayat, but I could like to say that they're in almost all panjayat because of these things, they could translate at the local level. And the training institute, Kila also did a lot of things there to localizing the STD. They have given a lot of training, a framework. They are a mechanism to monitor it as a result to what happened. This is what is happening. But I notice there are certain challenges you should understand. There are many conceptual and operational issues of localizing STD at the grassroots level. So still it is a major problem. We can say that there we can talk, but to operationalize it and conceptualize at the local level, uh, still we have a lot of problem. But these panchayat have succeeded to certain amount, but still there are problems. They are not very clear about that, what the nest they have to address and all things there. Elected functionaries at the grassroots level and other rural stakeholders have not been able to fully internalize the sustainable development goals in general. But there are some people, uh, still some elected functionaries are not fully to understand what is this. Capacity, again, I could make out that there is a lot of capacity deficit. There's a problem of lack of capacity in, in using available secondary uh, data from different sources. Uh, you see, the point is that there our data is at the national level or state level. So a particular panjayat, you take the Udur panjayat, they have, we, we all would like to talk about the uh, sex ratio. But you go to the panjayat, ask them what is the sex ratio, there may be a problem. So you take the sex ratio of over under seven segment, under five segment in Kerala, you get a letter. But at the level, but still they have a problem that they have to use the data at different levels. Lack of pro proper measurement framework of quantifying STD at the local level, that is also a problem. I, after sometimes I may go to the panjayat, I ask to the panjayat president, madam, you tell me how much of poverty you can reduce at your panjayat. Uh, she has to say that there is something to quantify. How much percentage? Uh, in terms of uh, population, in terms of percentage. So the point is that the local, you say, you can say that they are uh, constructing a, a neat and clean toilet for girls. You can say that there we are addressing the gender equality, but how much, how to measure it? Still we have a measurement problem. Lack of support from the local bureaucracy. All people are not aware of these kind of things there. See, another thing is that there we can talk to uh, sustainable development goals, but the local language, uh, you see, in Malayalam, what, how to localize, how to put it into the local language. I had did some work in different parts of the country, and sometimes what happened, the how to, see, I can say that there are no poverty or uh, gender equality, but the point is that there, are uh, uh, see, a, a, a tribal panchayat, a tribal people has to translate the gender equality in their own language, that kind of problems are there. Deficit in expertise <coughs> for all the things. Serious methodological issues to aggregations and disaggregation of STD goals. I already mentioned that there are a lot of panjayat, we are doing things there. But how you will measure all the things and aggregate at the national level and at the, you know, at the state level, at national level and international level. Still, we have a lot of problems as far as challenges to localizing STD at different levels. Yeah, these are some of the problems, but we are doing. 
My conclusion is that there the experimentation in localization of HCD in these two GPs and many cases all over the country have the feasibility to scale up this model across the India. The experimentation in localization of HCD in these cases have some theoretical perspective of Gandhi Kumarapa framework of political economy of develop, development and environment. See, these things we are doing now the national level and international level, Gandhi is getting a lot of appreciation and people are ready to study the Gandhian economics and Gandhian philosophy. And uh, this uh, Dr. Jesse Kumarappa is a Gandhian economist, very, very serious uh, economist on Gandhian lines. He's the one who written that a very famous book on the uh, permanency of uh, Economics of Permanency, that is what the book, very interesting book, he, he written that book when he was in jail and Mahalma Gandhi has written that forward to that book. Any foreign uh, uh, people used to come and interview Gandhi on economic issues, Gandhi used to say that there as far as economics is concerned, you ask to Kumarapa and Kumarapa is the last word of Gandhian economics, both together they worked and that, that framework is there, this actually sustainable development goals. I would like to say that there, but internationally people are not accepted and recognized the contributions of Gandhi and Kumarappa, but I would like to say that the basic foundation of the sustainable development goals is basically from the, uh, from the Gandhi and Kumarappa. So my hypothesis is that their localization of STD goals, if, you, if we all do seriously at the local level, at the college level, at the uh, at our habitation level, at the, the household level, at the, at our yeah, whatever may be our local level. If we start addressing these things, nothing uh, difficult. We may be in a position to address the sustainable development goals in uh, 2030. So this is actually the the localizing the sustainable development goals. We have taken that concept at the national level, try to bring at the local level, at the grassroots level with us and try to implement it and with a kind of a convincing language and convincing kind of a action along with the people, with the people's participation. I am fully uh, confident and that there we can address. But at the same time, uh, as an activist, I also have certain kind of disappointment and kind of, kind of pain with me in the sense that there still that Russia-Ukraine war is going on. If somebody is making a, a kind of little bit pollution in our environment, we all feel very sorry of that. But what is happening in, a, in a Ukraine and Russian war? What is the result? What is actually happening in the Israel and Palestine? I'm not going to this side or that side, but the point is that there, so person who has some concern on sustainable development goals, definitely we also have kind of serious concern what is happening at the international level. We all feel that there, we all hope that there situations will be solved within a short of period. Definitely situations will change. We can also, uh, we all can achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable knowledge with us. If anyone wants to ask any questions, If anyone wants to ask any questions, you can kindly ask. Good afternoon, my name is Susan, sir. It's a very, very informative session and very enlightening too. Um, my question is, see, as far as Kerala is concerned, we know that we have gone a long way in um, achieving most of these, at least uh, uh, many of these F F F many of these SDD go SDD goals. However, am I on? Okay, sorry about that. About how uh, compared to the rest of India, uh, the Gramma Panjayats and rest of India, 
uh, how uh, i know we stand a way ahead but still uh, how bad is it uh, with respect to implementation of uh, sdg uh, goals at the local level in the rest of india especially the bimaru states and uh, those states uh, is is something really happening there or is this just uh, still in the paper that's my question yeah, I, I, i i got your answer a question i will tell you um, madam very interesting question and we all are uh, this concern but i would like to say that there uh, you see Uh, ministry of panchayat raj which i mentioned that there they have already selected 13 13 panchayat in the entire country and that panchayat is uh, in the sense that they, they addressed the uh, they achieved a carbon neutrality that means there the total emission of carbon they could make certain kind of exercise so that they can capture the uh, carbon dioxide carbon dioxide sequestration what they mean that there out of 13 panchayats madam only one panchayat is from only uh, only one panchayat is from kerala remaining 12 panchayat are outside this kerala state and some of the panchayat i can give the list of panchayat some of the panchayat are already in the bimaru state what you mentioned that things there so the point is that there that kind of things what is happening there so the point is that their bimaru state is also improving a lot and i would like to say that their niti ayog has written another thing the health index health index health index you are right kerala is at top but incremental index you take you know what is incremental index in the incremental index we have already achieved a certain state but last one year among the indian state which state had did a good work incremental index because of that you know that there uttar pradesh up got the first on incremental index that means the bimaru state is also in a position to running fast i have recently visited a gram panchayat in manipur there a panchayat could address the carbon neutral issue like our meenangadi panchayat which i mentioned one in kerala manipur they have a panchayat and that is actually the the one panchayat in there and their jammu kashmir one panchayat is sir palli and the central ministry has prepared a good road map and their ladakh is going to uh, going to declare the carbon neutral ladakh so things our understanding is that their entire india Uh, some of things if i get a chance uh, next time i come to your college definitely i will present a paper something on that the covering instead of two from kerala i'll take or four or five from the e, including the bimaru state so situation has already changed i i appreciate your concern but this is a case anyone else now i invite dr bindu baby department of chemistry to propose the vote of thanks thank you so much sir for the wonderful session though i am from a different faculty because uh, you are from social science i am no way from social science but then uh, we could we could understand we could follow you and you were uh, able to uh, help us understand how to localize sdg goals at the grassroots levels through uh, by taking the two examples of um, panchayat and um, we were like um, it is it was new to us that uh, sports and cultural activities also comes under sdg goals and thank you so much sir thank you thank you we are moving on to the paper presentation we have two parallel section 3a and 3b section 3a is chaired by dr rajesh kano la university of fisheries and ocean studies at educational theater the paper presenting candidates are reeta babu anub arjunan bahuleyan sanal ts dr susan ibrahim section 3b is chaired by dr jisha george head of the department of commerce st stephen's college uravur at media center at conference hall the paper presenting candidates are anandan r manoj shirley t all the candidates please confirm your presence in the respective venues there will be a tea break after session 3b and during the tea break time you have offline presentations and online presentation on zoom so you can participate if you're interested and offline presentations 
offline poster presentation which will be held near the tea stall thank you and the participants uh, may i please know if dr anuraj kr and shalini ramachandran is are present here or not dr anuraj kr so other other participants uh, Anun anananda r manoj shirley t uh, please kindly move to the conference hall thank you i invite all the candidates to the session 3a chaired by dr rajesh kinnoth candidates please note the following instructions please stick on to the time schedule provided for presentations once the session moderator calls your name you should start the presentation without delay you will have to share your ppt and do the presentation individually you will be given 6 minutes for making the presentation and 2 minutes for discussion there will be a warning bell after 5 minutes and two bells after completion of 6 minutes during the time allotted for discussions questions will be asked by moderators participants and general audience question will be asked during the 2 minutes allotted for discussion apart from the person who is making the presentation the next two participants should be ready to make the presentation we are beginning the paper presentations so all together four um, scholars are there with their papers uh, first person is uh, rita babu A very warm good afternoon to one and all present over here. So I'm very honored to be here to stand before you to present a topic. My title is a study on the impact of environmental education and sustainability among youth in an Alagan district. So basically, 
Environmental education plays a vital role, vital role in shaping the attitude and behavior of people towards sustainable development. There is always a gap between what, how we understand the concept of environmental education and how it impacts, like whether we are making any change in our behavior towards practices. And in the study, mainly for the concept of whether we are aware about whether the people, the youth are aware about the environmental education and whether they are practicing any, uh, practicing any uh, protective action towards environment. So my title is that a study on the impact of environmental education and sustainability among youth in an Alam district. And the following are the objective of my study, to know the level of awareness and about sustainable ecosystem among youth, and also to understand the role of educational institutions in promoting the environmental education among students. And these are some of the literature reviews which I'm going through. And from the literature review, I found that many of the similar studies were conducted in foreign countries. And that's why I, I conduct the particular study in the scenario of Kerala. And the scope of the study is that the study is limited to the youth of Naglam district because youth are the future of tomorrow. So we have to know whether they know anything about environmental education and have they, whether they have ready to protect the environment for better tomorrow. And also the area of study which includes are the awareness level about environmental sustainability, individual behavior, and the sustainable practices which has been going through by the people. And the, about the research methodology, I have collected about 50 samples from the particular area. And the, I use convenient sampling techniques for collecting the study. And the tools which has been used for the particular study is percentage analysis and SPSS, which was used for data analysis brought. And questionnaire is a method which has been used for collecting the primary data from the respondents. And about the hypothesis, the null hypothesis is there is no significant relationship between the awareness level about environmental sustainability and individual behavior towards sustainable practices. And I have simply done a correlation among the two uh, the two variables, and it was found out that the p-value which is greater than 0 0.05, so the null hypothesis is accepting that there is no significant relationship between the environmental sustainability and individual behavior towards sustainable practices. And these are some of the these are some of the results or the findings which has been made from the study. The majority of the respondents are female. And only minus, minor percent, like 36 percentage, are aware about sustainable ecosystem. But majority of them know the key components of ecosystems like biodiversity, renewable resources, ecological balance, and all. And composting is the major waste disposable methods which has been used by the people. So they have a mentality towards protecting the environment, but land, followed by landfilling, which is against environmental protection. And majority of them use cotton bags, even though, but um, around 45, 48 percentage of saying that they are using plastic bags in their in their daily life. And only 36 percentage of minor people are not about know about. They are aware about the green products. Actually, they are know about uh, like they are using the green products, but they are not aware about that they are using the green products because. Uh, majority of the respondents are using the particular thing in their daily life and which has been followed by organic vegetables that, that are main, mainly used by the people. Along with that, there are household items, are there green beauty products, are there solar power, etc. And social media is one of the um, effective communication medium which has been used by the people in order to get knowledge regarding the environmental sustainability and all, followed by the classroom sections, online platforms and all. And Next, I have gone through some of the questions relating to the educational role of in educational institution towards environmental education. And majority of the uh, respondents are moderately agreeing with the statements regarding like the clubs in institutions, which was being like NSS and all, and the other environmental related clubs, which has been in the institution, whether they play any role in environmental education, majority of saying that they are moderately agreeing with the particular statement. And another thing, they're moderately 
the chosen communication medium, like if they are social media, they are, they are using, whether the particular medium has influenced their behavior towards sustainable practices, that also they are telling that moderately they are agreeing with a particular statement. And also the educational institutions providing environmental educations, then their contribution towards particular clubs which has been associated in the particular college, everything they are contributing moderately to the particular statements. And also the another thing is that uh, the outreach activities, everything which was being conducted in a particular organizations, the people are saying that occasionally such, a con uh, such activities are happening in the particular organization. And also the green campus initiatives, the respondents are saying that moderately the particular green campus initiatives has taken in the organizations or the institution where they are belongs to. And in conclusion, it was saying that even though people are using like biodegradable like uh, plier. The time has finished. Okay, thank you. Now it's the time for interactive session. If you have any doubt, you can ask. Okay, Ritu. I know the time limitations, but still being the chair, shall I ask some two, three questions? One is, uh, it is about youth, right? So how did you define youth? International oh. definition is different, national definition is different, even the state department use various definitions. Actually, I take the uh, age group between 14 and 25. Who told you that, that they belong to youth? This is just a question for you to think, okay? So you have to uh, specific which uh, definition. You, you are free to select any definition, but uh, you have to give some justifications. Then another one, uh, sampling was 50. Why don't you select 49 or 51? What is particular about 50? Nothing much. Actually, I sent the Google sheet and I get definitely the correct answer. Yeah, there is a, a, why I ask this question means in each and every college, students are doing uh, like uh, research with the 50 sample size. I don't know what is the particular about this 50. That is also a wrong, uh, it is following as a tradition. So you have to break that tradition. If you there is any particular limit for that? No, no, no. You can uh, select anything like based on this uh, population we are designing the sample size and all but don't confine with uh, 50 in each and every presentations uh, people are using that 50 so naturally the, some of other juniors will think that uh, they have to select 50 for their presentation so you try to break that so-called conventions mm -hmm. then one more thing like um, you have used a convenient sampling right mm -hmm. then what is particular about in your observations you wrote that majority are female and all because because it is based on your own convenience, right? So does it convey any, I mean... Well, actually, majority of the women are responding to the particular question. Yeah, because you have collected the samples from those women, right? No, actually I have sent it to different people and... The now here, if it is a random sampling, it is okay, good. But here you have followed convenience sampling. So does it uh, make much sense? This is what I am asking. Maybe it will be a random sampling technique. Uh, if it is a random sampling, then it has got sense, right? The majority or the 72 percentage are uh, mm -hmm. women or something like that. But here you followed a convenient sampling. Mm -hmm. This is just for, a, I mean, yes. this is research, so you have the freedom. Only thing is that you, you have to justify. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rita Babu. Next, I invite Anup Arjunan Bahulayan, Assistant Professor, Sri Narayana College, Chembarindi, to present the paper, Kerala's Nightingale Dilemma, Work-Life Balance of Female Nurses in Private Healthcare Sector. Um, respected uh, dignitaries, resource persons, and my dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, actually, my topic is uh, on the work-life balance of female nurses in the government health sector, 
which falls under uh, the woman uh, sustainability uh, under our conference theme nothing related to environment or ecology uh, so to begin with uh, the work life balance is something uh, something the amount of time one spends on work and also the amount of time one spends for oneself for family or uh, for uh, one's own personal interest etc so when it comes to uh, woman counterpart there is a special case at least in india that uh, as compared to the yesterday years uh, the women in today are much more educated more educated means more employment opportunities and uh, the irony is that uh, the irony is that uh, this educated employed uh, and if they get married if they get married early the irony happens actually this educated employed married woman has to face additional responsibilities apart from the workload uh, they need to take in their working space so uh, under the women's sustainability the first uh, theme which came to me as a researcher was the work life balance of women uh, in india uh, i have focused on the nurses in the government health sex healthcare sector which means the medical college uh, so let me get into the paper the health the healthcare sector in india is valued at 372 million dollar with a compounded annual growth rate of 22 percent which means it is going to attract fdi fii we know the case with kim's healthcare which is taken over by blackstone which is an equity company and there is a direct correlation with the population growth also now uh, the woman in the healthcare sector means 29 percentage as per the forbes list is is composed of doctors 80 percentage of nurses are uh, female and ashas is nearly 100 percentage uh, which is composed of female only and uh, the issues specifically related to women uh, work life balance issues are long and regular working hours family responsibilities uh, performing the gender roles limited child care support physical emotional demands rigid working arrangements and limited personal time the review of literature has also been conducted with substantiates with the data and this is the prime uh, objectives main focus is on the demographic variable including the age uh, marriage etc and also evaluating the variables uh, which influence the qwl uh, this was the methodology a questionnaire form was uh, uh, circulated 134 samples were uh, selected based on a random sampling method from three medical colleges across the state from Kodikur, one uh, Kochi one and also from Trivandrum. Random sample method was used and uh, ANOVA was used for statistical tests. Uh, from this table we can find that most of the issues were uh, majorly concerning for the woman and uh, I will get to the conclusion first. Uh, to conclude, the paper concludes as such, it has to acknowledge, the organization has to acknowledge the dual responsibilities of women employees and also it has to develop a system uh, where it can create a balance and also uh, utilize their full potential. And there is a positive correlation in the work-life balance uh, with regard to the variables like age, education, etc. And 85% of the data of uh, women agreed that there should be in addition to maternity leave there should be post maternity leave and also child care facilities at work place for full concentration at the work environment and also at last the organization should make efforts in making the environment family friendly in order to extract the maximum out of the uh, out of women in the work environment and uh, Thus, my paper concludes. My paper has a major limitation because only the aspects in regarding uh, to the work environment has been taken. But uh, there is a dark side which has not been taken, which is the major issue in, uh, in at least in India. Uh, I will conclude with an example. Idhu vada varsham mumbai yaan ande college la poyunda vadike. Tomorrow tam college lam poyite. Tiris return pogam bida, traini pogam bida. Namlo player kaanda thori stiram garchi andar do. Ure teacher la, namlo college la vero department la teacher la. സ്ഥിരം ട്രെയിനിൽ ഇരുന്ന് മലക്കറി ഇറങ്ങിയുകൊണ്ടാണ് പോകുന്നത് ആ സമയത്ത് നമ്മളത് കളിയാക്കി കേൾക്കാതെ കളിയാക്കി നമ്മൾ പല കമൻറ്റും ഒക്കെ പാസ്സാക്കുമായിരുന്നു പക്ഷേ ട്വൻറ്റി ഇയേഴ്സ് ലേറ്റർ അറ്റ് ഏജ് ഓഫ് ഫോർട്ടി ഐ അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡ് ഹൗ മച്ച് എഫ് എ പത്തറ്റിക് സിറ്റുവേഷൻ ഇറ്റ് ആക്ച്വലി ഈസ് അപ്പോൾ നമ്മൾ മിക്കപ്പോഴും വർക്ക് ലൈഫ് ബാലൻസിനെ നമ്മൾ ഇവാലുവേറ്റ് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ ദി മെയിൻ കൾപ്രിറ്റ് ഈസ് ഓൾവേസ് ദി എംപ്ലോയർ ദി മെയിൻ കൾപ്രിറ്റ് ഈസ് ഓൾവേസ് ദി വർക്ക് എൻവയോൺമെൻറ്റ് ഇവിടുത്തെ ഒരു ടീച്ചറെ വർക്ക് ലൈഫ് ബാലൻസ് നമ്മൾ ഇവാലുവേറ്റ് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ കോളേജിലെ സിറ്റുവേഷൻ ആയിരിക്കും നമ്മൾ ഫോക്കസ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് ബട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് നോട്ട് ദി മെജർ കൾപ്രിറ്റ് അറ്റ് ഈസ് യു സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് ഹാസ് ടു അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡ് ദി മെയിൻ തിങ് ദാറ്റ് ദി കൾപ്രിറ്റ് ഈസ് ഓൾവേസ് ദി ഹോം ഓർ ദി വർക്ക് ലോഡ് വർക്ക് ലോഡ് അറ്റ് 
it is not getting negated in proportion to the what she is doing uh, in an organization thank you thank you okay hello and did you change your title here it is given that uh, work life balance of women nurses in private health care uh, sector uh, yeah i had to change uh, from private to government sir government yeah now if it is private then it is uh, much more sensible i think uh, yeah, yeah because government means we they have a system like uh, they are all government employees uh, uh, the title is catchy and that is more i mean valid if you are conducting the study on this private uh, health care sector nurses of private health care sector Timing in the uh, data collection, the timing <laughs> issue or something like that. I mean, it's a matter. Private sector is much more relevant. Yeah, yeah. IHG, sir. Yeah. yeah. One more thing, uh, like uh, my suggestion, or uh, like um, you didn't mention anything about the role of organizations. That is also very, very important, right? Uh, Especially the nurses' organizations are very strong. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. They have a specific timetable. For sure, sir. But that's not what I mean. This table actually shows what is the actual uh, work stress that actually only uh, stress. Yeah. Not other mechanisms. Uh, no sir. What are the limitations? These are the uh -huh. major variables that were identified. And uh, except the point number one and six, in all the other variables, uh, it's highly skewed. Uh, not in favor of the. Uh, okay, but uh, what I am trying to say is that when you are dealing with this topic, especially sir. with the private healthcare sector, you have to think about that direction also. I don't know whether it is your PhD topic or not. Uh, no, sir. No. no, just you have selected a topic for a presentation. For this purpose, okay, okay, okay. I will focus on it, sir. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Anu. Next, I invite Sanal T S, Newman College, Todubura. to present the paper taxonomy and diversity of butterflies in selected sites of idiki district a warm welcome to all today i am presenting my study uh, taxonomy and diversity of butterflies in selected site of idiki district kerala india Let's move on to the introduction. Butterflies are the key species in natural sustainability throughout the world as they help in pollination. Butterflies are ecologically integrated species also play important role in food chain. The butterflies include in the Arthropoda phylum and class Insecta and Lepidoptera order. Approximately 1500 species of present in India and about 328 species reported from Kerala. diversity in butterfly in influenced by factors such as habitat type climate availability of host plant presence of predators and human activities developmental activities are one of the most important cause of biodiversity loss worldwide the higher diversity often indicate the higher healthier ecosystem conservation effort often focus on preserving butterflies diversity to maintain ecosystem balance and functionality let's move on to the study set The study conducted in uh, two major cities in Idiki district. District. Uh, the Idiki district is the largest district in Kerala. is known for the rich biodiversity, which is closely linked to the Western Ghats mountain range. The Western Ghats UNESCO World Heritage Site is one of the eight hottest hotspots of biological diversity in the world. I am choosing two sites. One is Numang College. Second one is Malayengi. This is the satellite view of uh, Numang College and Malayengi. We can see that uh, Numang College is uh, the area full of urban area. Uh, the second one is Malayengi is rural area, uh, fully cultivated area uh, with the uh, besides agricultural uh, forest is present. Next one is method in my study. I am using polar bark method to use to observe animals in the morning and evening. time and photograph them taxonomy and systematic were done using published data this is the result uh, the literature studies reveals that about 7 percentage of all life forms on earth are members of the order lepidoptera the butterflies and moth mm. the taxonomy of butterflies is 
thoroughly studied during the present study owing to the presence of increase, increased diversity of other insect in the study site. Particularly, most species was missed in the identification process. These are the fa families of Leptoptera, Hesperidae, Papillonidae, Teridae, Lycanidae, Rhyodinidae, Nymphalidae, and Hedylidae. This is the cat taxonomical features of Nymphalidae. The family is easily recognized by the reducer front legs that lack claws. The front legs, due to their length, are not used for the wagging. Unique to this family, the radius in front of wing is 5 branches. This is the picture of Nymphalidae. The species name is uh, Euplea cor. This is the uh, species, 11 species are identified from this study site. Second family is Lycanidae. Lycanids are small, delicate butterflies that are often distinctly marked with iridescent blue, red, or orange colors. This is the taxonomical characters of Lycanidae species. These are the species I collected. Next one, Papillonidae. This is the cactus features. Uh, the Peridae is the cabbage butterflies are often medium to small size and are distributed worldwide. This is white in color and black dots present in the body. These are the species. Last one is Hesperidae. The skippers are the small to medium sized butterflies with the orange or brown wings and stout bodies. Their antennae are distinctly hooked or recovered at the tip. The head is relatively broad with the widely separated eyes and antennae. Many species resist with their front and hind wings held at different angles. These are the species. Then uh, this is the diagram shows the uh, collected species. The 11 Nymphalidae species are collected and 8 Lycanidae, 6 Papillonidae and 7 Peridae and 4 Hesperidae. The present study reveals the occurrence of more butterfly species seen in Malayanji region than on Nooman College campus. The developmental activities of Todubida area compass of population is less over in Malayanji less threatened and Todubida. Let's move to the conclusion. The recent studies indicated the importance of conserving the flora and fauna of ecosystem. Butterflies are the ecological indicator species. The declining species richness shows the alarm signal of extent of our sustainability. If we ignore this change, result in the loss of our own food resources because butterflies are the major pollinators. Existence flora is directly related to the butterfly species richness. That is, animal shows vegetation specificity throughout the life period. Based on the fact, the destruction of specific flora due to construction activities leads to the extension of our butterfly community. Hence, there is an urgent need to document and conserve that species. Thank you. Sanal, I don't have any questions because I am... I'll hand over the mic to teacher, okay? I'm not an expert in this area. Okay, which identification key is used for the identification of butterfly? Taxonomical identification. Reference? Reference is uh, previous data. Uh, so you have to say the reference uh, that uh, that the scientist uh, who identified, who helped to identify this uh, butterfly. Linear, linear small of taxonomic identification. Referred to Dr. Saujis is a taxonomist. So that you have to mention in your PPT or in your presentation. So which identification key is used? Okay, can you suggest one remedial or conservation strategy for uh, in order to prevent the extinction of this bird in uh, in your area? The butterfly species are uh, living in a specific region uh, with the the specific habitat and vegetation so preserve the vegetation and uh, they living only a host plant the so preserve the host plant don't destroy it okay thank you thank you sanal next i invite dr susan abraham assistant professor christian college chengannur to present the paper 
anthropogenic intervention and its impact on the landscape ecology, resource appropriation and ecosystem management of Cochin wetland in Kerala. Respected moderator and fellow listeners, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to make a small presentation on the anthropogenic interventions and its impact on the landscape ecology, resource appropriation and ecosystem management of the Cochin wetlands in Kerala. Tropical wetlands are known for their biological and economic diversity, and they deliver a variety of direct and indirect benefits to society. This diversity and extent of benefits depends upon spatial attributes and landscape ecology. The current study attempts to look into this in detail. It begins with a uh, identifying the major anthropogenic interventions using secondary data, changes in hydrobiological settings and species diversity using primary and secondary data, uh, identifies resource appropriation by different stakeholders using secondary data, and wetland governance. The study area is a Cochin wetlands, which is the northern part of the Wayambanad Lake, and it covers 38 panjayats, three municipalities, one corporation. I'm not going into the physical features of the study area. Uh, before 1341, the Cochin estuary was a marine environment and part of the Arabian Sea. The Great Flood of 1341 brought down silt in unprecedented amounts and deposited at Kodungalur opening in the new uh, opening up a new estuary at Cochin. And therefore, after the landscape ecology of the Cochin estuary has undergone many changes over the years. Now, there has been three, uh, you can, uh, the inter anthropogenic interventions can be classified into three major uh, phases uh, between 1920 and 1975, between 1975 and 2004, and after 2004. The first anthropogenic intervention was the construction of the Wellington Island, a man-made island between 1920 and 1930. Uh, and this caused unnatural interventions in wetlands, particularly in the Waipin Island, uh, causing a rise above sea level. Uh, Pillay and Nair 1950 documented the fish species diversity during the early 1940s and reported a total of 65 fish, uh, fish species. Uh, can't see the rest of it. Uh, from 44 families and uh, I think 22 generia. Construction of the Tanirmukam Bund in 1975 to prevent salt water intrusion into the upper Kutnad uh, paddy fields. Uh, the uh, second phase of the construction of the Wellington Island and the reclamation of 50 acres of land for the Marine Drive project. These are the major second anthropogenic interventions into the Cochin wetlands. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there were uh, con continuous dredging by the port trust during the uh, of the chipping channel uh, during breeding seasons has greatly affected the fishery resources of the Cochin wetlands. Uh, uh, huge marine shell deposits have accumulated over the centuries in the estuary, and this needs to be removed for the sustainable uh, to protect the live uh, clam and to prevent. Uh, loss of erosion. Travancore cements was limited, was entrusted with this task and harvesting of shells by Travancore cements uh, started sustainably during this period. Kurup 1982 recorded 150 species of fish belonged to 100 genera and 56 families from the estuary. The third major anthropogenic intervention is the construction of four Gosri bridges from uh, connecting Waipin and uh, the Cochin mainland, uh, reclaiming 187 acres of land in 2011. The construction of the Wallar Hardum container terminal, which began in 2009, uh, rec uh, reclaiming three islands and evicting 360 families from this area. Uh, continued dredging, industrial dredging by the Travancore cements, which gradually increased and caused a uh, uh, biodiversity problems to the local environment. Uh, resulting in local protest uh, by the uh, people who use uh, clam harvesters, actually. And uh, it resulted in a court case, and the Green Tribunal uh, initially uh, ruled in their favor of Travancore cements, allowing them to continue dredging. And finally, in 2008, it was stopped. Uh, in the aftermath of this anthropogenic intervention, John et al., uh, 2019, reported a total of 200, 112 fish species from Wayamnad Lake and its surrounding wetlands from 56 families and 19 genera. Now, historically, during the reign of the Cochin Maharaja, the Cochin wetland was treated as a single entity owned and administered directly by the king. And because of this, there was no serious anthropogenic interventions into the wetlands. It is only after the coming of the 
modern users into the Cochin wetlands that major anthropogenic interventions have happened. Uh, and another specialty of this uh, uh, use of wetland is that if you look at the ecosystem people, the traditional users, uh, they have they use their wetlands on a multi-stakeholder sharing basis. However, when modern stakeholders came in, all of them uh, concentrated on uh, creating their own property rights and not allowing other stakeholders to use that particular environment. So, uh, with the passing away of the monarchy and the creation of the state, legal jurisdiction over the Cochin wetlands was subdivided and given to various state developments. So, I've come to the governance part. So, the resources used by many resource stakeholders, there has been major anthropogenic interventions, but how has the uh, state looked into the governance of this wetland ecosystem? They have divided jurisdiction over a single ecosystem among many different uh, departments, state departments, the fisheries departments to look over the Eshrine fishing, fishing related activities over in the uh, wetland, the inland revenue department to manage the terrestrial part of the wetland, mining and geology department to deal with matters regarding the Eshrine bed, inland water authority uh, to regulate and manage things related to boating channels, etc. The irrigation department to uh, manage and jurisdict issues relating to the water channels. Real estate regulatory authority over construction in the coastal regulatory zone. The port trust to control uh, and manage uh, ju jurisdiction of the shipping channels. The port department to test and to test safety of the houseboats that operate on the wetlands. Uh, Wallar Pad and Container Terminal over the terminal area and to tourism department over tourism activities, house, houseboat license, etc, etc. So with no integration or cooperation between regulators, no well-defined property rights, no strictly enforced uh, property rights, considerable confusion over jurisdiction exists. Consequently, instead of a holistic management of the wetland, it has led to wetlands being treated as open access ecosystems and their gradual degradation. Thank you. I know it's a very, very vast topic. I don't know if I've, done, I've been able to do justice to this topic, but I hope I've been able to communicate something. Okay, Dr. Susan, just a single question. I understood the issues. What is your like uh, solutions to that issues? My first and foremost solution is property rights need to be correctly defined and enforced. If you do that over a ecosystem like a wetland, half the problems will be solved. Our problem now is there are rules uh, or rather there are um, property, there are property, pro, the property rights have been allocated, but one, they are not well defined, two, they are not enforced. So in, uh, in ultimately practically what happens is this ecosystem is treated as more or less treated as an open access environment. And therefore, there is no proper management, holistic management, and uh, degradation t is taking place and nothing is being actually done to stop it. Those which can be uh, stoppable. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susan Abraham. Now we wind up this section. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Kano, to chair this section with your valuable presence. Those who have requested for your uh, duty certificate kindly collect it. It will be available with us tomorrow also in case you are coming in tomorrow, you can take it tomorrow. Uh, then a participation presentation certificates will be sent by post to your addresses. So all those who leave here kindly make sure that you have given your uh, addresses uh, at the registration counter so that we will be able to post it to you. And after that, if you require, we could also send you a soft copy of your certificate. Uh, 
uh, today after this session uh, there would be a set of uh, paper presentations too and we will also be having an online um, session after 6.30 via Zoom and uh, the tomorrow also we will continue with online sessions and um, much to our surprise and to our happiness one of the online sessions will be going in as an offline session which will be uh, uh, taken care by Dr. Gabriel Simon Tuttle, Sustainable Development and Emerging Markets. So that session will be going offline. And after that, we will also be having our validatory session offline. The remaining sessions and paper presentations will be continuing on the online mode. So in case you have any uh, queries or concerns, uh, kindly make use of the WhatsApp group or you could uh, contact the coordinators for the same. So with that, we will be concluding and uh, we're going into our next session, wishing you all a very fruitful session. Thank you. I will read out the names of the participants. Uh, please confirm your presence. Haifa is Ashraf. Hafiz Nishad. Nidhi Hasan TK. Kartika Harish. Ashwadi Samuel. Krishna Priya Suresh Kumar, then I invite Dr. Melinke Punos, Assistant Professor, Department of Hindi, St. Stephen College, Uravur, to welcome our extreme guest, Ms. Sharin Parakel. In this session, invited talk will be given by Dr. Shirin Tandu Parikkal. She is a civil engineer by training specializes in smart city development and management. She is currently engaged with the policy and planning domain of development alternatives group with focus on sustainable urban water, waste water and solid waste management and achieving resource efficiency and circulating in city systems. She has extensive research experience in sustainable planning, designing and development. Prior to making her way into development research, she acquired experience in the construction and real estate sector with international exposure. I genuinely welcome ma'am to this session. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I know we have had a very long day, but we all have to admit that it was a very informative session. Uh, first of all, I would like to Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer, organizers of this wonderful conference and also the uh, St. Stephen's College for giving me an opportunity to talk alongside, you know, eminent scholars. Uh, so I'm Shireen and I'm a researcher at Development, yeah, Development Alternatives. So let's start. So I'm part of this organization called De Development Alternatives and DA as we call it. Uh, so this beautiful building that you see right here is our office building which is quite close to Kutub Minar. And this is a standing example of circular economy because all the building materials that has gone into this building is coming from our previous office. They have recovered all the building materials and put back into it. So I hope we'll be able to learn more about the concept of circular economy as we go along through these slides. Uh, this is our vision and mission. I'll skip that for now. So we work in uh, three different impact areas, resources, climate, and livelihoods. 
When it comes to resource efficiency and circular economy, we try to innovate and also apply different technologies and strategies that would bring or reduce carbon emission and also material footprint across various sectors. And then we, we also uh, promote local, um, using local resources and local technologies and thereby we increase local value and wealth creation. And we also try to apply circular economy into various urban sectors, which are waste, water, construction, and whatever you name it, basically. So uh, coming to the second uh, impact area, which is climate resilience and ecosystem restoration. Here we try to build resilience of the community so that um, we are you know, um, capable enough to um, basically, so that we, are we have adapted ourselves to um, face extreme events, right? And then we also try to build capacity of the community so they also have that capacity to uh, face these uh, natural e disasters and other hazardous events. The third um, impact area is livelihood security and inclusive entrepreneurship where we help the rural communities of our nation to set up their own businesses and also to uh, generate jobs and deliver basic needs. So basically we mobilize them to co-develop solutions for the challenges they face in their local setting. So that's about DA. Now these are the different trust areas we work in. Uh, I will not be going into detail to all of this, but yeah, we work in a lot of sectors. So coming to today's session, uh, sustainable development, uh, I would like to first take you through how this concept of sustainable development has evolved over the years. So I'll be taking you through some landmark uh, events that have taken place which shaped the concept sustainable development of that we know today. So the first and foremost event is the Stockholm Conference which was held in 1972. This was the first major environmental conference and they really emphasized the need for um, the international communities to come together and they really emphasized um, you know how all these global issues are interconnected and how it has to be looked at a very hol holistic level and how it cannot be looked at in silos and this was the first time where a link was drawn between the environment and development so we heard in many previous sessions that you know we cannot look at development without uh, looking at environment, right? So what we are aiming for is development in harmony with environment. The next major event is the World Commission on Environment and Development, which was held in 1987. Now, this is the event where the term sustainable development was coined. And the major output of this event was the Brundtland Report. And this is the report which gave us the definition of sustainable development that we know of today. So Brundtland Report basically defines sustainable development as a development which will help or a development where you can access your needs or you're able to meet your needs without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their needs. So this major definition we all know is coming from this conference. Then in 1992, we had the Earth Summit. It is also known as United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So um, this is where um, we um, adopted Agenda 21. So Agenda 21 is a document which gives us strategies to face so many global issues like poverty, hunger issues, equality, education, and all of that. Uh, this conference did also paved way for the UNFCC. UNFCC is the United Nations Framework for Convention of Climate Change and also CBD, which is the Convention for Biological Diversity. These two are main policies that shape today's environmental policies also. So these are coming from Earth Summit. And it also paved way for uh, Kyoto Protocol and also Paris Agreements. So uh, these basically look at, uh, you know, the emission reduction and the check on the temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now in 2000, we had Millennial Development Goals. This is somewhat similar to the Sustainable Development Goals that we have in 2015. So these goals, Millennial Development Goals, uh, were supposed to be achieved by the year 2015. But then we didn't really uh, completely achieve it, but we did pave off a way for the Sustainable Development Goals, which we got in the 2015. 
So we all know by now that uh, sustainable development is not just about environment, but it has a lot of factors going in it, right? So if we try to explain sustainable development, looking at this picture, we can see natural environment, we can see built environment, we can see different factors that brings together an economy, right? We can see mobility, we can see um, power generating infrastructure, we can see different types of buildings where we have small houses, big uh, skyscrapers, so it's about everybody, right? So we also uh, heard about uh, uh, accessibility. So that's a very important point of sustainable development goals. So uh, if we go factors by factors, we have to consider future generations as well. We cannot just hold on to our needs and uh, use resources as per our need for our greed. So we also have to consider the next generation. Then we have social inclusivity where everybody comes in, uh, marginalized communities, vulnerable communities, disab disabled people, everybody. Right. And then we have economic viability where we have to invest in uh, developing sustainable economic models. Then we have cultural diversity respect where we try to um, uh, protect different types of cultures of different creed, race and caste. So we have seen this slide, I guess, so many times today. So these are the 17 sustainability development goals. Uh, I'll skip the slide because we have heard a lot about this today. So uh, we heard about uh, measuring what we have achieved uh, as per sustainability development in India, right? So uh, Dr. Joe's talked about how we can read that in the Sustainability Index of India, uh, uh, prepared by the Niti Ayo. But um, if you look at an Asia and Pacific uh, data, it is, it is very evident that we have not even achieved the goals which we had to achieve by the year 2023. Now, if you look at the climate action uh, goal, we are actually regressing there. We are not even making any you know, steps ahead. So um, that's how we have uh, gone far with sustainable development goals. Uh, so now, to sum it up, uh, I would like you to watch this video. Did you know that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call to action that unites 193 countries around the world? If these global goals are fulfilled by 2030, life on Earth will be better for everyone. So what are these goals? Eliminate poverty in all its forms. No hunger. Everyone should have safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. Everyone has equal access to health care, thus ensuring our well-being and a healthy life. Equal access to a quality education. Ensure gender equality where women and girls have the same opportunities as men and boys. By achieving these goals, each member of our society will be equal, safe, and happy. UN Global Goals also include Access to safe drinking water and sanitation access to clean energy that is safe for people and the environment, sustainable and stable economic growth, everyone has a decent job, strong infrastructure and the support of innovations, lower inequality within and among countries, cities and settlements be developed without damaging the environment and people. Achieving these goals will result in the well-being of people and our planet. We can further take care of our environment with the following goals. Sustainable and safe production and consumption of products. Take urgent measures to reduce climate change and its impact. Ensure the sustainable use and protection of ocean and sea resources. Restore and protect Earth's ecosystems. By achieving these goals, we will form a society where strong institutions ensure peace and justice. It is important for everyone to be involved and to build partnerships for achieving sustainable development goals. You are part of this process. Demand the implementation of these goals. Take the lead and share information with your friends. All right, so I hope you have a clear idea of what sustainability development goals are by now. Did you know that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call to action that unites 193 countries around the world? 
If these global goals are fulfilled by 2030, life on Earth will be better for everyone. So what? Okay, so we talked about different sustainability development goals, right? So today I would like to talk in detail about the sustainability development goal number 12, which is the responsible consumption and production. And why is it important to talk about this SDG, right? So we'll try to have a look at that. So it's majorly because of our material consumption pattern, right? So it's estimated that the material use has increased more than three times over the last 50 years. We extract all these materials to build our homes, build the infrastructure for our basic needs. So in the name of development, we have managed to, you know, uh, kind of increase our material use by three times over the last 50 years. And then it continues to grow by an average of more than 2.3% per year. And uh, we have not been able to uh, stay at the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise, for sure. And then it's also said that uh, material consumption, increased material consumption is the cause for triple planetary crisis, which is the nature loss, uh, pollution, and climate change. So why is this happening, right? So this is happening because of the pattern, the pattern in which we are consuming materials, which is the linear economy. So what is the linear economy? So if we have to define linear economy, it's this take, make, dispose pattern, where we extract finite resources, and then we use it to produce goods, and then we use it according to our need, and then when it has reached its end of life, we just dispose it, either scientifically or unscientifically, right? So what is the solution? How can we uh, increase the intensity of materials that we extract, uh, I mean, intensity of use of materials that we extract from our source, right? So before going into uh, the solution, I would like to introduce you to this concept called donut economics. This is an economic model developed by a very famous economist, K. Traworth, based in UK. And this is primarily called donut economics because of the shape, or probably we could say if it was maybe in developed in India, we could have called it Rwanda economics or something like that. Right, so here I would like you to look at this dark green rings, inner rings and the outer rings. So the inner ring is the social foundation and the outer ring is the ecological ceiling, right? So in the social foundation, we look at different factors like access to water, access to food, health, education, and all, of, all those factors, which we consider that it is necessary for a person to build a standard living or to have a basic quality of life, right? So that's the social foundation. Now to provide this access to everybody on this earth, we need to, obviously we have to use up some resources, but the catch here is that if you want to provide this access, you can, but then we should not, uh, you know, over consume materials in the process of providing this access to people, right? So if you see, in this model, anything that falls within the whole of the donut is a shortfall. And when, it, uh, when we come to resources, anything that goes outside this green, dark green outer ring is an overshoot. So let's see. And uh, so basically for a sustainable development, this graph should be falling in this light green, or you can call a mehendi green band of space. So if you try to look at it, so the question here is, can we manage, can we balance this? Can we balance the shortfall and the overshoot? Uh, data says, well, we are not managing it very well. So if you see here, millions of people are still having for a shortfall to you know, um, access to different basic needs like water, food, health. So uh, these red badges you see, these are the shortfall. Uh, people don't have access to income and work, education, peace and justice, so all these issues. And it, the data is showing that we have already overshot 
three planetary boundaries, which is climate change, land conversion, biodiversity, and all of this, right? So now let us try to see how this graph will look like for India. So this is the donut graph for India, where it shows that we are falling short of so many basic needs like life satisfaction, poverty, uh, sanitation, social support, so many things. And we have already overshot our consumption in phosphorus and nitrogen. Now, this is a case of a developing country, right? Now, how would this look for a developed country like USA? And this is how the graph for USA looks like. They've already crossed the planetary boundaries for CO2 emissions, phosphorus, and nitrogen consumption, ecological footprint, material footprint, and all of these things. So if you want to live like an average American, right? Like if we want to use materials like an average American to sustain our needs, we would actually need close to five planets of, I mean, five Earths. But, and, and yeah, as you can see for other countries, it's like close to five and four. But too bad, we have only one Earth, right? So this is why it is very important to talk about uh, sustainable or responsible production and consumption. Because if we continue to live like this, we will crash. And what we actually want to build is a regenerative and restorative planet where we allow the planet to replenish by itself before we over extract or exploit the resources that Earth gives us. Right. So this make it, makes it very important to talk about this particular SDG, Responsible Consumption and Production. So let's look at some strategies to, as to how we can achieve this SDG. Right. So there are different strategies like resource efficient infrastructure, promoting sustainable production and consumption, investment in renewable energy, integrated resource management, and circular economy explain, uh, applications. Right. So today, I will be going into detail on the circular economy applications. Now what is circular economy? Let's try to take a look. So earlier we saw the linear economy where we just take materials, we use it to produce goods and then we use it and then we dispose it off. That's linear economy. Now coming to circular economy, what actually happening is happening is we are extracting, we are using it and then we instead of disposing it, we are putting it into the loop again, either by recycling, reusing, or whatever strategies you're using, right? So basically, in simple terms, this is circular economy. Now coming to circular economy principles, so as you can see here, you can see very clearly in this figure where you say sourcing, manufacturing, distribution, and then you put it again back into the loop of uh, material feedstock, right? So if we look at different principles of circular economy, the first one is design out waste and pollution. Now this might sound very simple, but it has very serious implications. Uh, it is said that, or it is estimated that, 80% of the sustainability of a product is determined uh, at its design stage. So if you are not designing a product, um, maybe uh, for environment, or if you're not designing it properly, it will be very difficult to compensate for the environmental degradation that it will cause at a later stage. So we have to be very careful to design our products uh, in a sustainable manner so that it can be used for a longer time and it can be put back into the loop. Uh, the next principle is again keeping resources in uh, use at highest possible value. So we just don't need to put it back into the loop but we have to use it such that we are uh, you know, making the most out of that product. right? Um, third is decoupling growth from resource consumption. So data says that if we are continuing to live like this, uh, the, the kind of consumption that we have, we would need 1.8% more resources to achieve a, a additional 1% economic growth. And that is definitely not, it's not going to sustain, right? So we have to decouple growth from resource consumption and that's why we say development in harmony with environment. Um, the fourth circular economy principle is regenerating natural systems. As I said earlier, we give the planet its sweet time to replenish its resources before we over extract. 
So here I would like to introduce you to the 9R framework. So it's, it's very easy to say practice circular economy, right? So, but how do we do it? So circular economy is based on these nine R's. Um, there are actually 10 R's. The first R is numbered R0, so hence nine R's. But yeah, so the first R is refuse. So refuse, we all know, it's, it's, it has its literal meaning. So we say, we, I refuse to use this product, right? It's very, uh, how do we say, it's very material in intensive, or we say it emit a lot of CO2, so I don't want to use this, this, uh, this product. So you go for an alternative material which has a similar function, which will fulfill your uh, need, right? So that's how refuse comes into picture. Next is rethink. So um, rethink would be again, uh, how can we say, um, uh, you're trying to intensify the use of the material by probably, you can say you're sharing the same product with your friend or a family member and you're increasing the use of that one product. So that's, that comes under rethink. Now, the third one is reduce, where we uh, try to reduce the uh, input of virgin materials into the production of materials, right? We use more recycled content to produce materials or something like that. Then when we come to the fourth R, it is reuse. So here what we try to do is we use a discarded uh, product by a different consumer for a similar function. So we have to note that it should be in a very good condition for that uh, product has to be reused for the same function, right? Then coming to the next R is repair. So repair, we all know it, we keep doing it. So if, uh, like if you have a product and it's minorly defected, then you get, you go to a shopkeeper and then you get it repaired. So that's how you can keep the product in loop for a longer time. Then we come to refurbish. Refurbish is a concept where you take an old product, you give it some facelift and make it as good as a new one, right? Then we come to remanufacture. Remanufacture would be um, uh, after a product is discarded, you take different parts of that product and then use it in a different, uh, use it to make a different product of the same function. Then repurpose would be again collecting parts from a discarded product, but you would be using it for a different purpose. Then recycle as we all know, we recycle a material to lower or higher grade. Then we have recover. So uh, we all talked about waste uh, management and all of that. So we try to recover things from the waste and then again try to put it back into the loop. So these are the nine R framework or nine hours of circular economy. Now let's try to understand this with examples of some circular economy business models, right? So the first one, first circular economy business model is circular input, where we try to use more recycled feedstock and um, we put in renewable energy and we uh, use all environmentally friendly uh, inputs, right? So a great example for this uh, business model is a carpet maker called Desso. So what they did was, first of all, they tried to reduce the amount of material they put into their production. Then what they did was they replaced their conventional yarn with recycled yarn and recyclable yarn. Uh, and also they uh, removed all toxins, all chemicals that they used from their production uh, cycle. This helped Desso in making an additional 8% profit and also an 8% additional market share. The second circular business model I would like to introduce you to is the resource recovery and recycling, where we, uh, as I said earlier, we take materials at uh, the end of the life of the product or from the uh, pre-consumer uh, stage. So uh, when an industry is producing uh, products, there would be waste anyway, so we take that and then we use it for producing our new product. So that would be resource recovery and recycling. An example for this is General Motors. So what they did was, uh, they, um, they have uh, like kind of, uh, basically they recycle 84% of the waste that comes from their production uh, industries and they also run more than 100 um, production units which are zero waste.
next uh, exam i mean circular business model is product as service so basically here what happens is that uh, instead of we buying a product the company would uh, give that as a service for example signify uh, this was formerly called philips lights so they actually sold light as a service right so what do they do uh, for a monthly fee they come and they fix their light fixtures they operate it they maintain it and then once we think we don't need that product anymore they take it back and then they repair it uh, so all the products are designed for repairability and re replaceability right so then they take back all these materials since it's not the con uh, customer's own asset uh, what they did was they could reduce 75% of their uh, resources into uh, that go went into their production basically so that's one business model then we have sharing platforms and collaborative consumption this is very simple i think all of us would have used this once in a lifetime so basically this is about you know intensifying use of an underutilized asset so a very common uh, example is airbnb so if you have a room in your house which is lying vacant around then if you want to rent it out to tourists you can do it you use uber or ola for traveling so all these are sharing platforms where you actually don't need to have the car or the asset for your own right next is product life cycle extension product life cycle extension um, it has several aspects to it so basically we are trying to um, keep the product in the loop itself right so there are different strategies where you could do it but what strategy you use is very important so if you try to look at it i'll try to explain this with an example so if you have a phone uh, say this is the value chain for uh, you know production of phone so they extract raw materials they manufacture it uh, they distribute it and then it came back to us let's say uh, let's say we bought a new phone right so the easiest way for us to keep a phone in the loop would be to maintain it properly right so let's say our phone fell down and it has a crack what would you do we would try to get it repaired because we spend a lot of money on that right so we try to get it maintained or we get it uh, repaired so this is the smallest loop that you can take now let's say you used it for like a 5 years and then now you feel the need to change it you, you need a new phone right so what do you do you sell it right let's say we don't stash it at our homes but we went and actually sold it so to a service provider so what are we doing here we are redistributing the phone right now this can be bought by a second customer so you gave a second life to your phone there this is the next uh, loop that you can take now let's say the phone lived for like another 10 years and it's no uh, it's in no shape to you know uh, it's not workable let's say so what do we do then we uh, take out the parts and then we refurbish it or uh, remanufacturing is not really a strategy for uh, phones it's actually for like big industry machines or something like that but we can refurbish uh, components of a phone so this is the third loop now recycle is a loop which we adopt when we cannot uh, adopt uh, any of these smaller loops so it's uh, so our goal should always be to be in the smaller loop because it's the least material in uh, intensive loop so i hope this concept is clear to you now so uh, to sum it all up these are the different you know uh, strategies you can take in and these are the many benefits of circular uh, applying circular economy into achieving sustainable development goals now let's try to understand uh, how it would look to apply circular economy into waste management right and under waste management in particular plastics so it's estimated that almost 90 billion tons of primary material is extracted for plastic production it is estimated that world produces more than 350 million tons of plastics right and uh, only 9% of all the plastic that was uh, made in the world is recycled so far and in india that percentage is at 30% we initially used to believe that we recycle 60% of it but then recent data shows that it recycles only 30% and uh, it has various serious implications and one of the major one is uh, it's inter uh, i mean it it 
really messes up the biodiversity and it goes into our seas it goes into our forest it goes into all pristine environment whatever you name it it's there it was also uh, recent studies i guess it showed a uh, presence of microplastics in the placenta of a woman so that's how grave the situation is right so um it's said that more than 800 marine and coastal co uh, coastal species are affected by plastic waste so what exactly happened here is that we have all these discarded fishing uh, materials and things that are left in the ocean so these go down and then uh, strangle the um, marine animals and uh, there's the other uh, problem is that it with time it breaks down into microplastic and then these animals eat it mistaking it as food and then later it comes back to our food chain because we consume these fishes right it is also estimated that by 2050 we would have more plastic waste in oceans than fishes so that's how grave the situation is this is again a video let me switch this so by now you must be knowing what situation we are in so now let me take you through a case study so this is an example of how community and regulatory bodies can come together to apply circular economy to uh, face a uh, challenge i mean yeah challenge faced by the community right so this is called sujitwa sagaram the story is from kollam and um, what actually happened was that um, this community uh, their main li livelihood is fisheries right they have been fishing prawns and shrimps and all of that for so many decades as a livelihood now what happened uh they subsequently found that they are catching more plastics than fishes when they are going out for haul and then it was affecting their livelihood so what they did they went to 
several government bodies and they uh, seek help saying that this is the issue that, that they are facing. So all these stakeholders we have from Sujit Commission, Clean Kerala Company, Harbour Engineering Department, Society for Assistance to Fisherwomen, Boat Operators Association and Netfish, all of them came together to find a solution for this problem. The solution that they came up with was actually using the fisher, uh, fishermen or the, I should probably say fisher folks, uh, fisher folks community, uh, rather than keeping them at a victim position, they actually became allies to solve their own problems, right? So these fisher folks were provided with different like small infrastructures like, you know, nylon bags and uh, safety gloves and all of that to collect plastic waste from seas and oceans when they go out for haul. And then they would bring it back to the shore and then it is handed over to the uh, Society for Assistance to Fisherwomen. Then their own, it is dealt by the uh, Fisherwomen Association. So what they do with this plastic waste, they sort it, they sort it according to the type of plastic, they wash it, they sun dry it, and then it is taken to a, a shredding machine, so which is placed in uh, some sort of a port setup. And then... They shred this uh, plastics into plastic granules and then they later use it to basically construct roads. So this is a textbook application of circular economy where, we, where they took plastic waste from ocean and used it to construct roads. So what happened here? First of all, they reduced the material that will go into road construction. They reduced the emission that would come uh, out of the road construction. They also um, reduced the amount of plastic waste that was in the waste and it has so many other implications, right? So this is how you can apply circular economy in your life. So these are some principles of circular economy and waste management. I've, I think I've gone through all of it, so I'll skip this slide. So now you must be thinking, okay, these are very high level things. What can we do? Uh, it's not in our capacity to do anything, right? But uh, I think today we have heard so many examples of how we can contribute to um, achieving sustainable development goals uh, at, uh, in our capability, right? So these are some strategies that you can use in your own daily uh, life. So reduce consumption, uh, first thing. So probably instead of using a plastic packaging, you can say uh, shift, uh, shift to a more alternative material like a jute bag or a cotton bag or something like that. Reuse and repair. Uh, I've already given you an example. Recycle responsibly. Re responsibly. Uh, this might not be very much possible at our capability because it's not in our hands to recycle plastics, right? But at least what we can do is segregate uh, waste into wet and dry waste. In India, it is said that the calorific value of dry waste or you say plastic is very less because it's always mixed with food waste. So if we can segregate waste into wet and dry, at least there we can have a better quality recyclate when we recycle plastics. Then compost organic waste. I think our government is already taking steps by um, distributing things to compost organic waste at households. Then we have donate or sell unwanted items. There are multitude of platforms uh, in market right now, which takes uh, used materials and then sell it. Then we can choose sustainable packaging, as I said earlier. Then we can practice upcycling, right? For a small, uh, like, I mean, we have seen a lot of DIY videos where when there, are so, when there is a small cut on your cloth, then you change it into an embroidery or something like that. So that's an example of upcycling. Then uh, we have educate and advocate. Okay, so now you know what to do. So you might as well go and tell others to also live responsibly. Uh, so here, what we actually is looking for is a behavior change. Behavior change is not something that we can uh, achieve in a day. It will take time. But as you practice things, it will become, become a behavior, right? So yeah. Now, if you want to take it a one step ahead and want to become a sustainable development professional, then probably you can consider taking formal education and training in sustainable development related topics. So there are different, so first of all, I would like to say you that this is a very interdisciplinary uh, subject. So I'm a civil engineer, 
I came into this field. My colleagues are from, you know, economics background. They are from MBA, and then we even have people from home science, right? So it's true, truly an interdisciplinary uh, subject. So these are some subjects that I've listed down, and these are some schools that you can consider if you want to take formal education for sustainable development. Uh, and then you could probably, you know, if you just want to get a taste of it and you, you want to see if this is really my cup of tea, then you can probably go for some internships and volunteer work with these national institutions. Or you could get into research in academia, and then there are government and non-government roles. And then there are private organizations now. So now uh, private organizations are really mandated to uh, meet their sustainability targets. So circular economy and sustainable development is not going to be just an option. It's going to be a precondition if you want to you know, do a business. So uh, recently, EU and other Europe, I mean, EU is collection of European countries. So they have come up with their own circular economy um, strategies. So soon, I think, in India also, we might have some mandates related to applying circular economy into your businesses and achieving so sustainability targets. So uh, in private organizations, they are mandated to meet their sustainability targets. So there are new roles coming up, like corporate sustainability experts and all of these. So that's one option you can consider. And then if you're ambitious enough, you can start your own company, and then you can uh, contribute to the cause of sustainable development. That's it from my side. Thanks. And if you have any questions, I'll take it. Do we have any questions? My name is Ashwadi Samuel. Your talk was pretty good. So I have to add one question to it. Uh, not only you, everyone said that by 2030, we are able to um, may, uh, attain the 17 goals of sustainable development. Can you give any assurance that with this a gap of six years, we can uh, maintain or we can achieve this target? I may not be able to give a definite answer to this question, but just to take you back to my slides. Uh, let me see. So if you look at the progress that we have made so far, this is the graph for Asia and Pacific. You can see we haven't even achieved the 2023 targets, not even half of it, right? And then if you look at the climate action, as I said earlier, it's not even progressing, it's regressing. So we can in no way say that we will be able to achieve these targets by 2030. I mean, we can hope for it, right? Yeah. Thank you. I don't think they have used Indian data for this. Yeah, anywhere, anywhere in the Maybe after Indonesia. I get to be, because yeah. for Indonesia, like since we consider Indonesia as a developing country, so it would be similar to something. Yeah. yeah, as of now, we are, uh, yeah. Any other question? Can use a steel cup, etc. But I think uh, the, we need a uh, more energy uh, to manufacture the steel cups. In that way, uh, it will be harmful uh, to our uh, pay. Mm -hmm. Is it correct? Uh, it is correct. So uh, we actually had this conversation in the uh, morning when I was coming to the office. Right? It's all about greenwashing. So what you actually have to do is any product you take, any alternative that you suggest for plastic, you actually have to do an LCA. LCA is life cycle assessment or material flow analysis, right? So only if you do a life cycle assessment and material flow analysis, you would know what kind of materials are going into it, what is the kind of energy that you're putting into that material, and what is the kind of emissions and waste uh, that product is generating, right? So uh, like before we uh, suggest something, we have to do this so that we don't have a bigger problem in the future, 
right? So always we have to do LCA and MFA for uh, products, if we're choosing products. And it's also, I think, uh, our purchase behavior. So you have to make a responsible choice and you have to be, um, you have to be a little knowledgeable about all these aspects when you're choosing products for yourself. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your valuable knowledge with us. Then I invite Dr. Then I invite Dr. Navida Elizabeth Joss, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to propose word of thanks. Hello all. So this has indeed been a very enlightening session, ma'am. Me, myself, from the Department of English, uh, is not much aware of such concepts, but you have taken the pain to break it down, as everybody keeps saying, at the grassroots level, and you have addressed every point with such sheer simplicity and lucidity that every person, I think, has got the concepts through. And um, not only that, you have addressed it in such a way that we can accommodate such concepts on a day-to-day -day basis on a regular with our regular lifestyle. So I think a present this presentation was so effective not only because of these concepts well spoken and well addressed and organized, but at the same time, uh, you added video presentations and your case study to make it more efficient. So this was indeed a very fruitful session. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being here and presenting your insights to us. Thank you. So we are going, moving on to the paper presentations. So for the paper presentation, uh, this session will be chaired by none other than our very own vice principal and our IQSC coordinator, Dr. Shinsi. So uh, I would like to welcome you to this session and also to chair it and also share your inv invaluable insights regarding the paper. Welcome, ma'am. Good evening, all of you. Being the chair of the session, it is my honor to welcome you all for the last uh, offline paper presentation session of the conference. Actually, there are six presenters and of which six presenters and they will be sharing their research and insight on various topic on va in various disciplines uh, out of which two are from uh, actually um, Mr. Karthik Harish and Ashwati Samuel are from mathematics background and so I request uh, uh, Lieutenant Jay Skurian, my colleague, uh, head of the Department of Mathematics, will, uh, he will be evaluating those two papers. And also I request all the participants to actively participate uh, by asking questions and so that we can share or we can encourage promoting uh, knowledge. And I wish good luck to the participants. Uh, and first I invite Ms. Um, Haifa S. Ashraf for the paper presentation. Haifa S. Ashraf is presenting the paper titled Conservation and Effective Utilization of Abrus Precarious L Occurring in Kerala. Good evening, on and all. Today I am going to present a topic on conservation and effective utilization of Abrus Precarious occurring in Kerala. Abrus precatoris is belong to the family Fabaceae. Its common name is Indian licorice, Jacuzzi bean, 
കുഞ്ച റാറ്റി റോസറി ബീൻ കോറൽ ബീൻ വൈറ്റ് എക്സെട്ര ഇൻ മലയാള വെർണാക്കുലർ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് നോൺ ആസ് കുന്നി ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് പാൻട്രോപ്പിക്കൽ ഇൻ ഡിസ്ട്രിബ്യൂഷൻ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് സീൻ ആസ് വുഡ് ഇ ട്വൈനി പ്ലാൻറ്റ് ഓർ ആസ് എ ക്ലൈമ്പർ അബ്രസ് പ്രക്കറ്റോറിസ് ഈസ് ഫൗണ്ട് ഇൻ സൗത്ത് ആഫ്രിക്ക ചൈന ഐലൻഡ്സ് വെസ്റ്റ് ഇൻഡീസ് ഇന്ത്യ ബ്രസീൽ എക്സെട്ര പ്ലാൻറ്റ് ഫൗണ്ട് ഓൾ ത്രൂ ഔട്ട് ദി പ്ലെയിൻസ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യ ഫ്രം ഹിമാലയ ഡൗൺ ടു സതേൺ ഇന്ത്യ ആൻഡ് സേലോൺ Economic and ethnobotanical ethno importance. The seeds are used for making ornaments. It is an attractive ornamental wine. The white seeded variety is considered better than red dawn for med- medicinal preparation. It is used in Indian traditional system of medicine such as Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha and Homeopathy. Uh, the leaves, roots and seeds were used for medicine. In uh, the... Indian licorice is used as the substitute for true licorice. It is the ingredient of many hair oils, example Nilabringadi. It have neuroprotective, abortifacient, anti-epileptic, anti-diabetic effect, anti-cancerous activity, etc. Chemical constituent present as abrin, abrasin, abrol, pricol, pricasin, glyceroisin, asabiroside, tyrocarpin different parts of it could be used and they have different sorts of chemical constituents which have different medicinal effect on the body such as root leaf and seed of the fruit of the abras have different type of chem- chemical constituents which help to explore the different biological effect for the treatment of different diseases backdrop of the study kerala is an eco geographical region as per the floor of indian biodiversity uh, portal floor of kerala reported that abrus prakriti is reported all over kerala it is used in ayurvedic system of medicine the species is great threatened due to habitat loss sea dormancy habitat destruction is the main cause of habitat loss habitat destruction is due to urbanization and over uh, over exploitation so collection and identifi- identification of genotype biosystematic characterization and identification of elite genotype is of much significance objectives collection of the genotype of the accession from eco geographical regions of kerala establishment of uh, accessions in an equal environmental condition conservation of the genotype of abrus precatorius assessment of intra specific variation in the gene pool of the species in kerala based on diverse biosystematic parameters detailed biosystematic characterization of the accessions methodology field survey to locate and collect accessions of abrus precatorius from diverse eco geographical regions of kerala observation on habitat associated flora and other aspects were gathered in the passport data sheet establishment of accession in the field gene bank at research center conservation of the accessions characterization of the accessions this is the sample of plant collection data sheet Results and Discussion Field survey to locate and collect accessions of abrus precatories from diverse eco-geographical regions of Kerala were conducted during 2022-23. It grows in plains and mostly in coastal areas, a few in hilly areas. The accession studies also include representatives from varying altitudinal ranges near the sea level 7 meter to above the sea level 4.91 meter. Above 500 meter only one accession is seen. Below 10 meter altitude 10 accessions were seen. Of these uh, 64 accessions, 8 of them were white variety and the remains were red variety. These are the details of the collection uh, location of the 64 accessions of Abrus Precatorius. Habitat details. Frequency of taxonity collection site shows Uh, 21 were occasional, 15 were rare, 12 abundant, 9 common and 7 spurs. 24 habitat, 24 accession prefer coastal habitat, 23 open habitat, 13 dry and a few of them are seen in riverine. Then most of them prefer brown uh, soil, 34. in number red 13 black 12 and, uh, and uh, very few of them prefer yellow and uh, most of the accessions were seen in human rich soil type 26 sandy 17 very few in clay habitat destruction is due to anthropogenic inter- interventions like uh, uh, mahatma gandhi national rural em- uh, uh, employment urbanization etc the greatest uh, the greatest loss of habitat today is caused by human activities of degradation and fragmentation of ecosystem uh, dormancy of seed global environmental changes it prefer dry habitat 
over watery flood can reduce the distribution of the species. Most of the exceptions are susceptible to fungal attack. Summary and conclusion, 64 accessions were collected from different distributional ranges from the state of Kerala. Of these, 8 of them were white variety and remains were red. The collection species are conserved in the field gene bank at a research center. The accession studies also include representative from varying altitudinal ranges near sea level 7 meter and above sea level 704.91 meter. Most of them found in brown, brown soil and humus, um, humus rich regions. Most of them occupied coastal area. The field survey it was observed that Kerala shows uh, there is a reduction in the distribution and abundance of the species. The habitat of the species is great threatened due to habitat loss. In Kerala, the species of average precarious faces many consequences like occasional flood, human activities, urbanization, overexploitation, etc. The seed of the species uh, shows loss of viability and seed dormancy. These are my future study plan. These are my reference. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for interaction. If anyone wants to ask any ask any questions, you can kindly ask. Haifa, it was a very good presentation. Thank you. Ma Actually, I have to ask one or two questions. Uh, that uh, you have said that seed dormancy cause uh, that is the cause of the extinction of the species. One, 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 of, the, one of the reasons. One, one of so, the what is the dormancy period of this uh, seed? Three to four months or six months. So that is a usual uh, happening only. You know that is, so that we can't say when, that when it, we get. Uh, um, uh, oh, it's okay. environment uh, yeah, it will be germinating. Uh, germinating. Okay, that is the common factor yes. for all the plants. So I think uh, we can't um, stick on that re that factor. Uh, okay. And then another thing is that you have uh, selected many sites for uh, collecting or for study. Sampling sites were uh, selected. And uh, how many sites you have taken for your study? Uh, one or the uh, there is a reduction in the abundance yes, or yes. reduction in the distribution of this plant. But how can you say that you have earlier reference or if it is there, you didn't mention here? Uh, actually, it is also from the reference to in a collection in Japan. I don't know if you have any questions. 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 I don't know if you have Okay. okay, but uh, you, uh, in your presentation, you have to mention that reference that okay. uh, is there any study on this plant uh, in a former case? Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Just to remind all the candidates that the instructions are same of the previous session. You have to stick on to the time schedule provided for presentation. You will be given 6 minutes for making the presentation and 2 minutes for discussion. During the time allotted for discussion, question will be asked by moderators, participants and general audience. And while you are presenting, you will be given a warning bell after 5 minutes and 2 bell after completion of 6 minutes. Next candidate is Hasif, Hasif Nishad from Newman College, Todubura, presenting paper titled Analysis of Selected Lifestyle Diseases During the Year 21-23 in Idiki District, Kerala, India. Uh, 
Uh, good evening to all. Uh, my name is Hafiz Nishat and I'm from uh, Newman College, Torura. My topic is the analysis of selected life flare diseases during the year 2021-2023 in the Hidiki district. Lifestyle disease. Lifestyle disease often are referred to as a chronic disease that are caused by the factors like lifestyle and diet. With a common disease including obesity, hypertension, diabetes, cancer and chronic respiratory diseases. Drugs, unhealthy diet, tobacco smoking, excessive alcohol consumption and no exercise increase the risk of the developing these diseases. The root causes, the hormonal imbalance, inflammatory imbalance, structural imbalance, toxic emotions, toxic chemical exposure, detoxification imbalance, immune imbalance and mitochondrial dysfunctions are the root causes for the lifestyle diseases. And this is a uh, health report by WHO. Uh, it estimated the annual death in India due to the non-communicable diseases. According to the, uh, this report, two persons are uh, died due to diabetes in the annually, and 13 died due to uh, respiratory disease, 7 due to cancer, and 28 due to communicable maternal and perinatal nutritional, and 12 due to other NC uh, NCDs, and 12 due to injuries, and 26 due to uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, two common lifestyle related illness that greatly affect the people's quality of life and present enormous problems to the global healthcare system are uh, diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disorder causing the elevated blood sugar levels due to defects in insulin secretion or action. Type 2 diabetes also known as non-insulin dependent or adult onset diabetes is most common form of worldwide and it is associated with risk factors like obesity, sedentary lifestyle, unhealthy diet habits, and genetics can be managed through lifestyle, lifestyle modifications. The next one is hypertension. Hypertension is a common yet often overlooked health condition affect millions worldwide. It is referred to as a silent killer as it often uh, presents non-symptoms until it damages the white lorenz. The factors contributing to the hypertension are genetics, life choice, lifestyle choices, and underlying health condition, including secondary lifestyles, poor diets, excessive alcohol consumption, smoking, obesity, stress, and aging. <coughs> the methodology uh, for the present study uh, clinic data is collected from the NCD clinic, uh, District Hospital, Torura, Iriki, and the selected year for the data is 2021, 22, and 23. These are the uh, this is the result from January to December 2021. According to the uh, uh, result, the number of patients screened was uh, 10,612 and the number of patients were 6,020 and the number of follow-up cases for the diabetes mellitus was 1,542 and the number of new diabetes cases dictated was 49 and in the case of hypertension, the number of new hypertension cases dictated was 59 and the number of follow-up cases were 1,307. This is a graphical, uh, graphical rep uh, representation of the uh, data of 2020, 2021 and here shows the number of patients, total number of patients in diabetes mellitus cases is 1591 uh, and for the hypertension there was 1,366. Uh, 1, uh, in the case of 2022, uh, the number of patients screened were 1648 and the uh, patients were 6921 and then uh, number of follow up diabetes cases were 1861 and number of new diabetes cases were 90 and the number of hypertension cases dictated was uh, new hypertension dictated was uh, 100, uh, 103 and the follow up cases were 108 uh, 1883 and then total number of diabetes mellitus case in that year was 1951 as for the hypertension, it was 1,986. This is the uh, data from uh, 2023. And the number of patients screened were 15,499. And the number of patients were 7,220. And the number of new diabetes mellitus cases were 63. And the follow-up were 2,245. And the number of new H uh, hypertension cases were 68. And the follow-ups were 2,183. And the total number of diabetes mellitus cases dictated uh, on uh, 2023 is uh, uh, 2,308 and in 2021 it was 1,591. So the, from 1, 000, uh, to 2021 to 2023, 
there were more than 700 increase patients increased in that year and in case of hypertension 2022 uh, uh, 2023 2251 were increased more than 800 patients were increased from 2021 to 2023 in conclusion the surging rates of the hypertension and diabetes mellitus demand urgent attention by tackling sedentary lifestyles poor diets and healthcare access is crucial by prioritizing and prevention and comprehensive management we can curb these diseases fostering healthier communities and better quality of life Thank you. I have one doubt that uh, you have collected uh, your data from uh, hospitals yes. or how many hospitals you have selected? Uh, from the one hospital. District. Only one hospital you have selected for the study and then uh, you have uh, you have taken their data. Yes. Okay, and then uh, you are saying that uh, uh, the study is based on the Idiki district yes. and only one hospital only you have taken for the study that is uh, uh, there. And another thing is that uh, what is the socio-economic factor uh, that cause this lifestyle disease or increase in lifestyle disease in Idiki's dis district? Uh, this, uh, mainly because of the uh, poor health conditions, I know Idiki, Idiki district, uh, poor medical conditions and awareness of the uh, peoples because they have you no know, uh, awareness how bad the conditions uh, are there and uh, mainly because of the more alcohol consumption and things okay thank you thank you hafiz next next i invite nidhi hasan tk from newman college todubura to present the paper presentation an occurrence report and economic importance of lamellidens marginalis from Yagashi Dam, Karnataka, India. Good evening. My name is Nidhi Hassan. I'm from Newman College, Sodobuya. I'm ordered here to stand before you to take a section about my topic, which is an occurrence report and economic importance of lamellidens marginalis from Yagachi Dam, Karnataka. It's a part of my UG project. As we know, molluscs are, molluscs are soft bodied organisms, and coris, cones, conges are among the most beautiful, elegant, delicate, and highly traded group of animals. And some of the images are here, you can see. And the Lamellidens marginalis comes under the bivalvia phylum, are the most successful group of investigating the nature and origin of taxonomic diversity. They are widely distributed in freshwater and ocean. These are about 20,000 living species, and bivalves are most of which are marine, some of species occur in freshwater, but have not colonized in land. The Lamellidans marginalis is a freshwater bivalve in the order of Unionidae of the mollusk. This species is found in freshwater, river, lake and prawns, and they feed on algae and uh, microorganisms like plankton, plankton and bacteria, and they have uh, a bio bioindicator and biological purifier, water purifier, and they have an important role in the food chain of the um, uh, aqua world and uh, aquatic ecosystem. Lamedans marginals has a peculiar life cycle and its sexes are separate but not distinguished easily by external morphology. It is the steady site which is uh, located in Karnataka district, uh, Karnataka state in Asan district, Yagachida, which is a part of Western Guts. And the material and methods. When we uh, visited the field site, there we can see many abundance of these species. And as, as a curiosity, we taken it to the bring back to the lab and for further morphological and taxonomical analysis. From the morphological analysis, with the help of and guidance of the Dr. Saujias, was guided me uh, by morphological analysis using vernier calipers. We calculated the length, height, and width of the species. And when uh, the help of uh, reference and uh, the gate, the systemic status of the species is phylum mollusk, class bivalvia, and uh, order unionidae, and family unionidae, 
genus lamellidans and species marginalis which have a shell character of shell is ovoid valves blackish brown with light brown border and ventral margin ambonotum much elevated and yes okay here you have the morphological parts of the there are the two bivalves two valves are joined by hinge joint and the muscle scar is the and growth lines are uh, seen in the external surface of the shell and the ambo is the just bulged portion and from the analysis of the morphological analysis we can estimate that maybe the average length of the shell is 6.85 cm and uh, width is 3.57 and height is 1 point it's clear that uh, it's having a healthy environment for the life and economic importance this have an economical importance nutritionally medicinally important molex is this species considered as an indigenous source of dietary protein and it have a uh, many uh, medicinal value therapeutic purposes are used for uh, tuberculosis paralysis muscle dystrophy and menstrual disorders and were utilized for manufacture of jewelries and production of commercial limes and small scale industries here we have the global freshwater prior production which is decreasing to the uh, from uh, 2009 to 2008 by installing the nucleus into the shell we can culture the designers plant the uh, pearl from uh, it is only cultivated in kerala i think it's only in kasarkot uh, district there is cultivating the uh, pearl culturing the pearl some of the uh, morphological characters which is a biological purifier of water where the plants are uh, we know that plants are purifying the air by uh, intake of carbon dioxide similarly it is uh, occurring in fresh water and uh, taking intake of the carbon dioxide by making the shell uh, converting into cso3 calcium carbonate it's uh, purifying the water and it have a important role in ecosystem fresh water mussels and we can conclude that a fresh water mussels united day we renowned the ecosystem engineers for their and valuable ecosystem service lamellidans marginalis is an ecological economically nutritionally and medicinally important freshwater bivalve in the all over world but habitat of this freshwater bivalve is under ecological threat due to the different anthropogenic activities like habitat destruction and pesticide contamination however the abundant uh, however it's abundantly present in, in the study area by studying about uh, giving the proper awareness to this society and local peoples we, we know the india was like a, we know the india was a developing country we can uh, give uh, the uh, proper guidance and awareness to the local peoples and the promote their farming sector to the pearl cultivation and we can uh, at a uh, limit we can uh, improve the job uh, scope for and farming scope for this and it have a high aquaculture scope in our locality which because the kerala is also having a land area of western ghats it's also collected from a uh, ka near kaveri bank uh, river area and thank you and i am gre grateful to my great dr saujias and my co-workers fida aradi for who has helped me in this work and the st stephen college who have who have given me a platform for this thank you okay congratulations nidhi uh... Actually, you have done this research uh, during your UG time. Yeah, yeah, I'm a UG student of zoology. Uh, in Karnataka, you are you are no, uh, from do... from Newman College. You have gone there ah, in yes. Karnataka. We'll okay, see. it was nice. Uh, okay, uh, my doubt is that uh, you have said that um, this economically significant uh, organism or animal is uh, harvested and uh, they are cult cultivated there. So no, it's not cultivated. It's naturally occurring. There. Naturally occurring, and then uh, how can you advise the farmers or local people uh, to uh, establish a sustainable harvesting practice? We can. Uh, it is available from the Surat, uh, like Gujarat Surat. It's available the uh, progeny or uh, sh shells culture from there, and we can install the uh, nucleus of this uh, into the into the mus muscles and. in between the muscle sense uh, shell and then we can after 8 uh, months we can get the pearl original pearl from that okay it's uh, also known as cultured pearl so uh, in china japan there are always it is cultivating we can also try because we are in the developing countries and we have water areas pond lakes and so many things thank you thank you nidhi next i invite kartika harish from bcm college kottayam to present the paper title a study on topological indices in graphs
Good evening, one and all. I, Kartika Harish, second MSc student of Department of Mathematics, BCM College, Kottayam, here to present a study on topological indices in graphs. This is a collaborative work with my project supervisor, Dr. John Joy Mullur. This is an overview of my presentation. In this study, we are focusing mainly about the two topological indices such as Albertson Index and Sigma Index. Uh, in this study, we are uh, discussing the Albertson index and sigma index in some special graphs and some derived graphs. The following are some uh, definitions which are used in our study. The first one is the eccentricity. The eccentricity of a vertex is defined as the distance between that vertex to the farthest vertex in that particular graph. In the, uh, the maximum eccentricity is termed as diameter and minimum eccentricity is known as the radius of that graph. The next one is the definition of a jellyfish graph and it is stated as follows. Next one, a helm graph. A helm graph is formed by attaching a pendant vertex, vertex to each of the vertices except the central vertex of that wheel graph. Next one is a lollipop graph. A lollipop graph is obtained by connecting a path to a vertex of a, a complete graph by bridge. Next one is a diamond snake graph and diamond snake graph is uh, defined as follows. Next one is a friendship graph and it's defined as follows. Next, a complement of a graph. A complement of a graph G is usually denoted as G bar and its vertex set is same as that of the original vertex set of the graph. And the only difference is that the vert vertices which are adjacent in the original graph will be not adjacent in that of its complement. Next one is the shadow graph. The shadow graph is a graph obtained by uh, making two copies of a graph and uh, joining the vertices which are adjacent in the uh, main, uh, which are adjacent in the original graph to that of the copy of that graph. Next one is the uh, glue graph. Glue graph is nothing but uh, uh, a graph obtained by joining the eccentricities, uh, by joining the vertices of same eccentricities. Next, a glue graph of a self-centered graph is a complete graph. Next, uh, in the first paper, Michael O. Albertson, the author, uh, first in, first, very first introduced the uh, term Albertson index of a graph. The in the second paper, the author study about the inverse problem for Albertson irregularity index. That is for a uh, pos uh, given positive integer m, uh, they, are, they characterized or they identified some graphs with Albertson index with that positive integer m. Uh, in the th third paper, uh, the author study about the sigma index of graph operations that is with respect to some graph operations like corona, corona product and Cartesian product. Um, the Albertson index is defined as follows. The sigma index is defined as follows. Next, for any regular graph, Albertson index and sigma index will be equal to zero. Next, for the Albertson index of a simple graph will be even. The following are some results that are obtained through our study. The first one, first uh, in the first slide we are uh, discussing about the Albertson index and sigma index of some special graphs. 
first one for a al uh, for a jellyfish graph for a jellyfish graph albertson index will be equal to m square plus n square plus 3m plus 3n and sigma index will be equal to m into m plus 1 the whole square plus n into n plus 1 the whole square plus 2m minus 2 the whole square plus 2n minus 2 the whole square next for a helm graph albertson will be equal to 20 uh, albertson index will be equal to 20 and sigma index will be equal to 50 next for a lollipop graph albertson index and sigma index will be equal to 2n minus 1 for a diamond snake graph, Albert's index will be equal to 8 into n minus 1 and sigma index will be equal to 16 into n minus 1. Next, for a friendship graph, Albert's index will be equal to 4n into n minus 2 and sigma index will be equal to 2n into 2n minus 2 the whole square. Next, for a complement of a path PM with m greater than or equal to 5, the Albert's index and sigma index are the same and it is given as follows. 6n minus 2 if m is equal to 3n plus 2, 6n if m is equal to 3n plus 3, 6n plus 2 if m is equal to 3n plus 4. Next, we are discussing about the Albertson index and sigma index of some derived graphs. First one for a shadow graph of a path, Albertson index will be equal to 16 and sigma index will be equal to 32. Next, for a glue graph of a path, the Albertson index and sigma index will be the same, that is, will be equal to 4. In this study, uh, we, uh, we mainly focused on the Albert's index and sigma index of some special graphs and derived graphs. In future, we are, uh, we are trying to characterize some graphs with same Albert's index and sigma index. And also, we are trying to uh, find out some more uh, Albert's index and uh, sigma index of special graphs and also on some derived graphs and also on, um, also, uh, on, on some networks such as Apollonian networks and also with respect to some graph operations. These are the references I used in my study. Thank you. Jay sir will be asking question. Your presentation is very good. And uh, you said uh, some uh, d nice names of graphs. Okay, whether these are the names introduced by yourself or? No sir. Okay, okay. they are already in the yes. uh, literature. Yes. Okay, okay. So, can you give us some applications of these two indices in real life situations? Ah, uh, in real life situations, uh, it is used. Uh, it is used for chemical. Um, it is used to find some physical quantities of chemical compounds such as uh, melting point, boiling point, etc. Okay. So, for this, uh, whether you consult uh, any uh, chemistry teacher or uh, uh, no, your fellow beings. Okay. Okay. Uh, my uh, my, uh, uh, my my uh, like one of my lecturer. To, uh, is doing this uh, as as his PG, uh, PhD uh, PhD topic. Topic. Okay. Okay. Good. Nice. Sir. Also, you said uh, so many graphs. Uh, so one of the famous graphs is a complete graph. Okay. Yeah. Whether you uh, study about the indices in complete graphs? A complete graphs. It's zero. Uh, it's zero. Albert's index and sigma index will be equal to zero. So, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kartika. Then I invite Ashwadi Samuel from BCM College Kotayam to present the paper titled Power Domination in Some Derived Graphs. Good evening one and all, I am Ashwadi Samuel, second MSc student, BCM College, here to present a study on the topic power domination in some derived graphs and it's a collaborative work with my project supervisor, Dr. John Jai Muller. So this is an overview of my topic. So through this uh, study, the concept of power domination. So this power domination is emerged from a monitoring power problem in the power industries. So every company has to supervise or to satisfy or to monitor their system. So this is defined. 
the state of this system is defined by a set of variables such as that of the voltage loads or the machine at generators so we have to uh, access this with limited um, supplies so we place this phase measurement units so the problem is that we have to access the minimum number of vertices with this so through this paper we discuss the power domination in some derived graphs and also some special graphs and shadow graphs and glue graphs so this is a basic uh, definition eccentricity eccentricity is defined as the maximum distance from a particular vertex to all other vertices and the maximum eccentricity is known as the diameter and the minimum eccentricity is known as the radius of the graph respectively so next we are entering before going to our section we are now going to study what is a dominating set so the concept of domination comes from the five kuhn problem and it is very uh, famous also so what do you mean by this dominating sets a vertex subset s of a graph g is said to be a dominating set if all the vertices in g are either in s or adjacent to at least one vertex in s the minimum cardinality of such a dom set is the domination number and it is denoted by gamma of g so it is just a graphical concepts so what is the application of this domination in our day to day life for example we can say it is help in modeling social networks during the corona period and also it also help in modeling the biological structures how this uh, it is uh, the structure of the rna is modeled by using this domination number so and next are the examples of some uh, definition of some uh, special graphs such as the coconut tree graphs this firecracker graph n barbell graph lollipop graphs uh, banana tree graphs hen graphs the triangular snake graphs and the double triangular graph and this all are some special uh, graphs and now uh, this is a glue graph and a shadow graph this is a type of derived graphs now what is a complement of a graph so we are considering a graph g and uh, the complement g um, bar is defined as when all the vertices of g bar is equal to v of g and also a graph g is said to be a complement of g if all the vertices which are adjacent in g bar should be non adjacent in g that is the basic concept now this is a result connecting uh the domination number the diameter and the order of a graph that is seal of d plus 1 by 2 is always less than or equal to the domination number gamma of g that is always less than or equal to n by 2 now uh, this is the papers that is power domination in uh, graphs i said earlier the first concept of power domination was introduced by t w hines through her book domination in graphs applied to electrical power networks and also the further studies was done by paul dorbock through the uh, book power domination in some product graphs such as the corona products and cartesian products next what do you mean by a power dominating set that is the main concept so a vertex subset s of a graph g is said to be a power dominating set if every vertex or every edge in the system is monitored by s followed by domination and propagation so what is this domination and propagation means this is just the monitoring rules so we can apply a dominate uh, a rule domination from that we are given to adjacent vertices if we can't uh, apply the power of domination there then by propagation rule we can dominate the entire system so i am given an example there c4 so we can consider any of the vertex a so to a c and b are adjacent to the vertices of a so by applying the domination rule a can dominate c and b but now only one of the vertex d is remaining there so by monitoring rule we can apply the rule of propagation so all the uh, vertices are now dominated by this rule so that is the domination rule this is a basic example and the power domination in this graph is just one so we have to use only one vertex now these are the result which is um i uh, i made through my studies so that is the uh, no the for a complete graph pn uh, 
uh, the domination number is always equal to 1 and for a cycle we are considering a cycle and the power domination number is always equal to 1 and now we are considering a universal vertex a graph with universal vertex what is the speciality of a graph with universal vertex so it is adjacent to all other vertices and here the domination number is always equal to 1 and these are the results which I made through my studies and that is the power domination number of a coconut tree graph is always equal to 1 and for an n barbell graph the power domination number is equal to 1 and for a firecracker graph the domination number is always less than or equal to m the number of central vertices similar to the case of a banana tree graph also it is always less than or equal to m then for a hem graph the power domination number is equal to 1. Lollipop graph also, the power domination number is, will be always equal to 1. A triangular snake graph, the power domination number is always equal to 1. And for a uh, double triangular snake graph, uh, the power domination number is always less than or equal to seal of n by 2. For a diamond snake graph, it is always less than or equal to n by 2. For a self-centered graph of a glue graph, it is always equal to 1. And for a, uh, we are considering uh, the path of a glue graph, the power domination number is always equal to 1 and the shadow graph of a path and it is also um, less than or equal to seal of n by 2 and for the complement of a path, the power domination number is always equal to 1. And uh, through this paper, we mainly focused on the power domination on some derived graphs and special graphs. And through my further studies, I would like to establish uh, my studies on some subdivisions of the graphs and line graphs. Thank you. Uh, it's a good presentation. And uh, my question is that uh, whether you have studied in uh, uh, the star graph? Uh, star graph power domination is always equal to 1. So, that is uh, universal vertex is there now. So, okay, we, ha okay, we have uh, we have to consider only one particular vertex. So, it is always equal to 1. one. In your studies, uh, we can see that uh, most of the cases, the power domination number is 1. So, yeah. is there any relevance? Yeah, this particular power domination number, most of the cases, that is equal to 1. So, uh, in uh, first, uh, to illustrate, I am saying about coconut tree graph. Uh, their power domination is 1. So, in a coconut tree graph, the path, we are considering a path and a pendant vortex, number of pendant vortex is attached to this path. So, okay. we have to consider any one of the vertex only in such a case. Okay. So, uh, by uh, continuous application of this domination and propagation, it can dominate the continuous vortices. In such case, we can consider only 1. Okay. So, if the number of pendant vertices is more, then uh, is uh, the power domination number is uh, increasing or decreasing? Uh, it's all depend upon uh, the structure of the graphs. Okay, okay. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ashwadi. Participant, please listen. Those who have signed the admin sheet for noon and afternoon, please inform us now. With this, we are winding up our session. Thank you, our Chair, uh, Dr. Sinsi Joseph and Jay Sir for uh, your valuable time. Thank you, everyone. For your kind attention, we will be having one more session which will go online at 6.30 sharp. So I request you all to kindly join online with the Zoom link provided. Tomorrow, we will have all the sessions online except for the validatory section in the evening which will be offline. Thank you and have a good day.